Good morning. Welcome to the BSI conference, The Digital World, Artificial Intelligence. I am Tim McGar from BSI, the UK's national standards body. I'll be chairing the event this afternoon with my colleague, David Cookow, chairing, chairing the afternoon. BSI has been doing conferences in artificial intelligence for a few years now. And it feels to me like the tone is really changing from moving to the from theory to big announcements to delivery. And recently, you see much more delivery around, say, the UK AI strategy or the continuing development of the EU AI Act, and much more organisations using AI in their products and services or to improve society. For the conference today, we have 20 speakers looking at key topics in artificial intelligence that business, academia, governments, regulators, consumer groups and civil society are tackling today. We'll learn about topics affecting all organisations involved in AI such as diversity and inclusion, safety, ethics and governance, and of course, the, input, the crucial topic of sustainability. We'll learn how to lead, embed and transform an organisation on its AI journey. We'll learn how the government and various sectors are using AI to transform society and drive economic growth. Given the conference today is hosted by the UK National Standards Body, we will also be learning about the forthcoming AI Standards Hub and the latest on standardisation. The biographies of all our speakers are available on the website, so please go there if you want to learn more about them. Next slide, please. So before we get going, a quick bit of housekeeping. Before the first speaker, um, as a reminder, this is a listen-only conference that is being recorded. We would like the day to be as interactive as possible and welcome questions you may have by the Q&A function. To help me and the speakers, please keep your questions as clear and concise as possible. Also, thank you to those of you who submitted your questions ahead of the conference. To pose a question, simply click on the Q&A button in the side panel and post your question. If you experience technical difficulty at any time, please submit your technical issue in the Q&A function, our technical support team will assist you. BSI will be sending a follow-up email after the conference has taken place with a link to the recording and the presentations used today. At the end of the conference, you'll also be automatically sent to a feedback survey to complete. This is a CPD recognised webinar. Should you want one, please request your certificate via the feedback survey following the webinar. Next slide, please. To begin the day, we have two opening keynotes. For the first of our keynotes, we have George Economides, Head of AI and Autonomy, the Department for Transport talking about the vision for the future. George, the floor is yours. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be here to give the first keynote of the day and talk to you a bit about what is the DFT, the Department for Transport vision for the future for AI and autonomy. I joined DFT only a few months ago, and this is a really exciting time for the department. But before I go any further, let me just introduce DFT briefly. As many of you would know, the, the, the department is responsible for the performance of the transport network, including roads, rail, aviation, and maritime. We set a strategic vision, provide guidance, grants, in, introduce a registration, primary and secondary, and have ongoing functions of research, analysis, evaluation. Quite uh, critically, we're accountable to the parliament and the public for how we progress. DFT does not own that alone. It has 23 different agencies, such as the Civil Aviation Authority, Maritime and Coast Agency, National Highways, and 150 different local authorities who manage the actual network. DFT, as many other departments, have a chief scientific advisor, and in 2021, we welcome Professor Sarah Sapros, pictured here. The network of the CSAs supports a party violence who advises the government. Now, this is a critical time for DFT. And in 2022, we took a important decision to introduce a new core competency team on emerging technologies. This is a team to support every different mode on how to work with new technologies and bring into fruition the premise for every different aspect of the network. Through futures work, through 
feeling. So looking and working with our partners, we identify three critical aspects, position, navigation, and timing, communications, and AI and autonomy. The way we do that, it stems directly from the premise of the CSA, in advocacy, assurance, support, and influence. So my role in the department is really to advocate, support, and influence how we move into the future in AI and autonomy holistically, but also to provide assurance to every single mode on how they can do that. In serving the DFT strategic priorities, which are to improve transport the user, increase our global impact, grow and level up the economy and decarbonize transport, as well as improve our own operational excellence. This is a big role and we cannot do this alone. We have three key pillars of activities. First of all, we have to understand what this means for the people of the department. What are the skills, the capabilities, the distribution of skills throughout the UK, but also clarify our purpose. What does it mean for a government department to engage in artificial intelligence? And of course, one of the reasons I'm very excited to be here today, to grow partnerships in order to deliver this together. Every year, the CSA office publishes the areas of research uh, interest, the ARIS, which highlight the key challenges in our understanding moving forward in fulfilling our purpose. This year, for the first time, there will be also a section specifically on artificial intelligence. Normally, the ARI are focused on the strategic priorities mentioned earlier. And what we are trying to achieve is to understand what the research development demonstration do we need to take forward into the immediate future. So why is AI and autonomy such a critical part that DFT has created a specific team just to deal with it? Well, as many of you here today know, the UK has and wishes to maintain a world rating position both in AI and autonomy. And the value to the market, but also the value to the citizens is estimated in billions for any civil service. Artificial intelligence will give us the opportunity to be more effective, more efficient, to provide more timely and customized bespoke services, as well as enhance the capability to do our own. We'll be able to consult more widely, more quickly, more precisely, taking more things into account and be more equitable. For transportation, it's, there is a dual premise. From AI looking at a system and individual component and autonomy for individual vehicles or vessel or assets, we can look to improve the performance and the resilience of transport network, improve the safety in every single aspect mode, and through better performance and through better management, reduce the environmental impacts, both of how transport is delivered now, but also how we build and plan for the future. This is not a far into the future possibility. As you can see from the images, some aspects of transport are already autonomous, such as the DLR or the Mayflower, selling the high seas right now, correcting oceanographic data with no one on board. Other aspects are upcoming fast, such as the autonomous vehicles, championed by the Center for Connected Autonomous Vehicles, which is a agency between DFT and days here pictured in Oxford, or the upcoming autonomy and uh, AI use in aviation here from the uh, demonstration in Coventry. All that, of course, is aligned with the mandate given by the national AI policy in investing in the long term to realize the benefit for the AI ecosystem, to ensure the benefits are distributed equally across the different areas, which is also aligned with our leveling up agenda. And coming back to the role of DFT, ensuring that the governance of AI is efficient. But how do we approach AI and autonomy in the same breath? Well, what we are trying to set up is an AI first approach. Traditionally, we will start with the vehicle or the vessel and progressively automate it going from an eye to a camera or from a manual brake into automatic braking system. But we think there are a lot of questions that will be asked and posed if we start from AI from first principles as a 
piece of software that may or may not partially or completely control hardware. And what is the role of government in that? From classic uh, public policy, we need to look at what we want to support, what benefit will be in society by uh, enabling a certain future, but also what can we not afford to get wrong today. And of course, always going back to strategic priorities of being an excellent department, how can we uh, deliver better efficiency for the DFT functions? Everything we do has to be consistent with the seven normal principles. And already the Committee for Standards in Public Life found challenges in adopting AI for objectivity, accountability, and openness. We, again, as I've said many times, and we'll do again, we cannot do this alone. We are here to learn and collaborate with the leaders in this space, and I'm excited for many of the lectures today from the Alan Turing Institute, the CDI, Tech UK, and others. But what perhaps is a bit different in the, what DFT does, and it goes back to what Tim was saying earlier, we are now coming from a user perspective as well. A lot of the focus so much has been on the technology development, but we want to see how we can not hamstring the technology, but also ensure appropriate and equitable adoption. We have not always gotten this right. You can see in the picture that when the first automobiles were introduced, we always wanted a person to walk ahead of the car just to make sure that nobody was terrified by the high speed. This will not work for AI, and we need to find better modes and processes to accommodate. Now, for many people today, trust in AI will be very bespoke. Many people here have the skills, the capability, the capacity to look at individual applications and understand what is good and what they cannot trust. But for the vast majority of the stakeholders, for the transport sector and others, trust will be institutionalized. They will not examine a specific application and think and whether they can trust this one, but they will trust the process of being put into contact with that application. Which brings us to this concept of rivers of trust. Currently, there are a lot of R&D directions that over time, they will likely converge to established practice or a dominant design, from which we can deduce best practice, guidance, code of practice and standards. And from that, institutions like the DFT will be able to draft policies, strategies, regulation and legislation. Often we find suggestions from R&D directly to legislation, and that is not appropriate for everything. Rather, we need to understand for each application, what is the risk it poses? How widely will the effects be? How equitably will these effects be distributed? And what level of autonomy are we looking into? Is it something that we could be checking every single um, aspect as a port and application? Or is it something transformative that, for example, security teams will no longer even see what they're not shown and therefore trust will be far more demanding. A separate aspect to trust is interesting distrust. And not only do we need to build trust with appropriate rivers, but we also need to ensure we minimize distrust by ongoing governance, processes, and systems. So we have been working internally for various frameworks, putting together a lot of the excellent work done by institutions, many of them here today looking at what are the key measurable ways that we can ensure appropriate governance, integrating them into the existing processes, such as risk assessment, governance boards, procurement, and uh, rigor. We have come up with an initial draft of the cases framework in terms of competent, accountable, sustainable, under which societal sustainability looks at benevolence and fairness, explainable, and safe in a way to make sure that all the right questions are asked and continue to be asked as any AI is adopted. We also need to look at the skills mentioned earlier and to ensure good use of public money and appropriate skill sets. We have breaking that down to various levels. Again, it would be great to see many people today taking that away and developing access to this for many civil servants. What is the basic literacy that any civil servant will need? 
what would a server seven taking the use of this forward need to have in mind and for regulators or innovators people making grants or introducing and suggesting legislation what do they need from a one step removed perspective and finally what there is a lot already is the skills required for developers and collaborators with industry to create these applications going forward we need to understand how these skill sets also links to the data skills curriculum within DFT and across the civil service. And what are the core R&D gaps between getting an idea, the appropriate governance, a river of trust, and the skills until this is put into, um, into operation. And that is before we even consider autonomy. Autonomy has the aspect of space and space and different orders of magnitude. Here, I'm just illustrating that this can be from a subsystem to an autonomous control system, to a whole vehicle, such as a car, the ongoing maintenance, repair, licensing, operation, HMI with the passengers or the driver of the cargo, the direct physical links, digital links, regional, national, international aspects. Each one of these needs a river of trust on its own and to be integrated with others. Because as we know, for AI, there will be the system, the environment, and the input output, all of them changing at the same time. And changing in time as well. What uh, do we need to consider before something is deployed? Why it is deployed? And planning further into the future. Because in for the time scales of government, AI can be developed and deployed very quickly. This becomes even more critical when we start to consider different modes coming together at the same time. For example, having an autonomous drone take off from a vessel, landing on a layer, or an autonomous van delivering people at the same time as a drone picking them up somewhere else. We need to understand what subsystem and autonomous systems can work together in harmony and safety. And just to give a very specific example of that is the Connect Autonomous Plan, or CAP. National Highways has worked for a number of years with TLR, Costain, and a wide industry group to create a roadmap to 2035. And they estimated a benefit to the UK economy of 200 billion because of better operations, safety, and also having export capabilities. This is a true holistic system of AI, cyber physical infrastructure, and autonomous technologies collaborating for something that we come into contact probably daily in our lives, construction sites that can be made quicker, better, and more sustainable. Now, this has been taken forward through the DFT's Transport Research Innovation Board, TRIB, bringing together all the key stakeholder and major innovation funders in the UK. And quite appropriately for today, one of our first steps is to establish a BSI pass with the support of both SICAV, who are leading on the road autonomy, and DFT in my team. So going forward, I would like to welcome you to consider where could AI and autonomy take transport by 2025? We have this ongoing question posed by Sarah Sapros. What are the 25 by 25 key deliverables on people, partnerships, and clarity of purpose that can deliver the benefit to the UK economy, government, and the public? This is something that we have to be together. Thank you for engaging, and I look forward to be working with you. Thank you, thank you, George. If you just turn your um, camera on, and um, if you get if you get back to the last slide, please. So that was very very interesting, and informative um, presentation, um, and I mean, sort of. So coming back to one of the themes that I saw sort of going through the whole of that was thinking about um, people, particularly um, within departments and how you know change doesn't really work, technological change doesn't work without people. So I mean, what do you see the key challenges for, of um, department for transport in terms of taking AI forward? As we, and the same lessons that we take to other organizations going through this change as well. Thank you, Tim. I think the 
first and foremost, we need a culture change. We need to understand how a risk averse organization can evaluate the benefit of AI in different applications, how can, that can be brought into the business case or cases here to make us make that shift into the AI. Second one is examining the skill sets at the different levels, the basic literacy that every civil servant will need to have into performing the task within an AI era. And then understanding from that, what are the demands for a legislator, a regulator, as well as people developing them uh, on the ground and the interplay there. Just to give you a specific example, we were looking uh, recently in some AI systems for security applications and testing required for that. Specifying both the system capacity, the requirements, the metrics, but also the kind of environments that the system needs to be tested in and the kind of input that needs to be tested in and having this clarity and standardization that will enable people that want to take it forward already to do so without putting anyone at risk is a big uh, challenge. And that is exactly where we need the collaboration with industry and academia. And of course, the last one is to understand what is viable for the industry and the public for us to make available. There is a lot of push in DFT to create open data sets and disseminate them. But to do that, there is a cost. And we need to understand what is the data provenance. We need to understand what is the data quality required and how can we do work with agencies and local authorities to make that available to enable the system to grow. Thank you. Uh Probably one question we can take, I think, from uh, this community online. And a reminder of those on, online, please submit your questions. So this question comes from, um, from Dennis O'Keefe. Um, and he's asking, can you please provide us with a practical example of how you are implementing the use of AI at the front end on projects with project stakeholders? And what I think, again, the key point now is, um, and what empirical feedback do you have to share? The one of the things that were tried in DFT in the past was sorting parliamentary questions. And that's something that people can read online. That was actually done in 2018. DFT has been looking into AI and automation for quite a while. And we had a lot of training data, and there is the DFT AI lab, the DFT lab that looked into AI at the time. What we found is that sometimes even 90 or 95 percent could deliver real benefits of precision, but we do need a wider process to read out questions or to address the, any errors or to have ongoing governance. So again, it's not so much about the application. The application can have various levels of maturity and sometimes already deliver the benefits. It's understanding how that application feeds into a wider transformation and change roadmap for DFT and what surrounding processes we need to ensure that it doesn't put anyone into harm. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think that's all we've got time for, unfortunately. I, I think there's a lot more we could, we could definitely ask you. Um, so thank you very much, George. And now we have our, our next, our second opening um, keynote from um, Steph Wright. If you put the slides up, please. Um, so Steph is the head of uh, Scottish AI um, Alliance Support Circle at the Data Lab. And her topic of her presentation is diversity, inclusion in tech and AI leadership. Steph, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tim. Good morning, everyone, and uh, greetings from not so sunny Scotland. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. Give me a sec. Try and get the slides going. Yep, fantastic. So uh, let's start with some stats. 50% of workers in the labor market as a whole are women. In tech, it's half that at 26%. 9% of C-suite leaders in tech companies analyzed were female and 91% were male. Oops, Oops someone's moving my mouse. Uh, tech has a marginally higher proportion of BAME people than the labor market as a whole, 11.8% uh, for all occupations and 15.2% for tech. However, this does not represent the UK population where according to the 2011 census, might be different now obviously since the last census, 20% of people living in the UK are from a BAME background. 
And then in tech, there's an overrepresentation of people under 35 years of age at 42% compared to 40% for the labor market as a whole. And all these stats are from the diversity and inclusion in UK Tech 2021 report from Tech Nation. Uh, so this is some UK context uh, data to start uh, to set the scene. And then moving on to a bit more, you know, many of the problems in addressing the diversity gap in UK tech stem from the dearth of data and lack of robust evidence, which could lead to better placed interventions. Once again, from the diversity and inclusion in UK tech report. So now let's have something not from the Tech Nation report. There are the reports out there. Um, the next few bits are from some research an organization called Diverse and Equal did with Honey Badger, uh, carried out in 2020 into experiences of people of color in tech for uh, the Greater Manchester Responsible Tech Collective. 43% um, of Black, Asian and ethnic minority employees say they have experienced workplace bullying. 43% of Black, Asian and ethnic minority employees felt they were underpaid compared to just 26% of white employees. 71% of Black, Asian and ethnic minority employees felt that promotions weren't fair compared to 35% of white employees. Once again, that's the, the source of the data. And one of the observations from the founder of Diverse and Equal who carried out this report is this. The most challenging discovery for me was the way people of color adapt to negative situations, almost seeing them as a trade-off for being in places where they didn't quite belong. That to me was just a really quite a depressing uh, kind of key takeaway from that report. So now I'm going to move over to some um, data from uh, from across the pond at, in the US, some AI specific statistics on LGBT representation in AI. In a membership survey by Queer and AI in 2020, almost half the respondents said they view the lack of inclusiveness in the field as an obstacle they have faced in becoming a queer practitioner in the AI ML field. More than 40% of members surveyed said they have experienced discrimination or harassment as a queer person at work or school. Around 9.7% have encountered discrimination or harassment on more than five occasions. So this was cited in the Stanford AI Index report in 2021. And I hate to be the person that kind of reads out massive bits of text. Um, but uh, before I go into that, though, I haven't even touched on disability or socioeconomic background. I couldn't easily find any reliable statistics around this, which touches on the point earlier about the dearth of data. There's some data out there around the IT sector as a whole, not much on AI or data, or at least I couldn't easily find it. But back to the AI uh, index report from Stanford, there was this clear observation that I'm going to read out to you. It is, it is a big bit of text. And like I said, I don't like being the person who reads out a big bit of text to you, but I think it's just really important that everyone kind of hears this. Well, AI systems have the potential to dramatically affect society. The people building AI systems are not representative of the people those systems are meant to serve. The AI workforce remains predominantly male and lacking in diversity in both academia and industry, despite many years highlighting the disadvantages and risks this engenders. The lack of diversity in race and ethnicity, gender identity, and sexual orientation not only risks creating an uneven distribution of power in the workforce, but also equally important, reinforces existing inequalities generated by AI systems, reduces the scope of individuals and organizations for whom these systems work, and contributes to unjust outcomes. Um, and another US report from 2019 also said, lack of diversity in the AI field has reached a moment of reckoning, according to new findings, um, at a New York University Research Center, a diversity disaster has contributed to flawed systems that perpetuate gender and racial biases. Um, and the AI field, which is overwhelmingly white and male, is at risk of replicating and perpetuating historical biases and power imbalances. So conclusion from that, this is just not good enough. So hello. <laughs> Um, you're probably wondering who I am, right? Um, tell you a wee bit about myself. I'm Steph Wright. I'm head of the Scottish AI Alliance and based at the Data Lab, which is Scotland's national center, uh, innovation center, sorry, for data and AI. I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today, but just to warn you, I'm not going to be technical in any way. Uh, there are far more qualified people on the program to talk to you about that. I want to talk about people. So you're also wondering, how did I get here? Well, it's a good question. It's a bit of a long story, really. A bridge version goes like this. You know, uh, 
when I was a kid, I wanted to be all sorts of things. Egyptologist, seismologist, writer, vet. And in my teens, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. I know it's very specific, right? Uh, but then, you know, at A-levels, decided, hate chemistry, can't possibly do medicine. Loved physics, so decided to go to uni to do astrophysics. Um, went to uni, did astrophysics, didn't like it. Went and did an arts postgrad, started a PhD in the arts, uh, and also abandoned it. Um, and then uh, I, uh, my career is quite diverse. You know, I worked in film and TV production a while. Went into arts management, uh, going through theatre, dance, film, uh, and then I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to the sciences. Uh, and I went back into kind of um, the academic field, not as an academic mind, but back into the academic field. Worked in genomics, then carbon capture and storage, and now here I am in the world of data and AI. The ultimate takeaway from this was that I was extremely privileged to have all these options open to me. Well, at least it seemed open to me. Uh, discrimination based on my gender and my race was really something on the periphery for me. Obviously doing physics, any of you out there have done physics, really male dominated field, but that was just something you kind of took, you know, as a, yeah, that's, that's just what happens. Um, but really I began a journey into acknowledging the problems of diversity and inclusion when I had a daughter seven years ago. Uh, gender discrimination really came to the fore for me. Um, and then a few years ago, I took my journey a step further. I started reading lots of books. So started off, I think I always credit this as being the start of this, Invisible Women uh, from Caroline Criado Perez. To any of you who haven't read this, please do. I just found it the most you know eye-opening piece of work um around essentially um the, the problems with uh, you know um how uh, non-gender disaggregated data affects uh, you know everything we do um and it also tapped into my inner feminist rage <laughs> at this stage um and then i followed on with the gendered brain uh, what what i can say about that is ah after you read that and then Mother of Invention is the type of book that you read and go, oh my God, everything's just so wrong. Tear down the patriarchy. Then you read Brotopia, tech bros are the worst. And then The End of Bias. This is the book I tell everyone about. It was a really profound read for me. It's a deep dive into bias and its complexities. And then recently I finished reading The Atlas of AI. Learn to look beyond the technology. So. And then I discovered, whoops, whilst I was reading End of Bias, I, I came across the concept of intersectionality. To anyone who hasn't heard of this, um, it's the acknowledgement that everyone has their own unique experiences of discrimination and oppression, and we must consider everything and anything that can marginalize people, gender, race, class, sexual orientation, physical ability, et cetera. An example of this is if someone uh, who is a woman of color got fired unjustly, you can't disentangle whether she got fired because she was a woman or whether she was a person of color. These things are all interconnected. And that's why issues of diversity and inclusion are not a simple thing. That's something like an EDI course and a one-off unconscious bias course or proactive recruitment can easily solve. Although it's a start, and this is where my journey has brought me here to you today, speaking to you. So, conclusion, we must do better. And uh, while I was doing these slides and I was reviewing this morning, I realized I forgot to actually add a slide on why we must do better. So here, I'm just gonna talk about it a bit. Um, I'm gonna use some info um, from the uh, Tech Talent Charter. Uh, it's a not-for-profit bringing together industries and organizations to drive greater inclusion and diversity in technology roles. Essentially, uh, some of the data they provided is companies with more diverse management teams have 19% higher revenues due to innovation. So that's from the Boston Consultant Group. The business case for diversity is clear. Diverse organizations perform better, have higher employee satisfaction and better financial returns and, more in, and are more innovative. So in terms of the better financial returns, for industry, this is what they want to hear. You know, a McKinsey report said the companies with strong gender and ethnic diversities are 15% and 35% respectively more likely to outperform their competitors. It increases innovation and activity. A Deloitte report said uh, found that when employees think their organizations are committed to and supportive of diversity, they feel included and their ability to innovate increases by 83%. 
and it's a more attractive employer brand. P a PwC report found that 54% women and 45% men surveyed said they re they research if a company had DNI policies in place when deciding to accept a position. So we must do better, and there are concrete reasons why we must. Whoops, sorry. Uh, how do we fix this? Well, honestly, yeah. To be totally honest with you. I don't know. Uh, I wish I didn't have to speak at events about diversity and inclusion. It's just not simple. And they're far more qualified than me, uh, far more people qualified than me out there working on this. And I'm so glad they are. But here are some thoughts based on what I've learned on my journey and in my position and all the and what I've learned from all the incredible people I've encountered on the way. So for starters, we need to acknowledge acknowledge that technology is not neutral. Um, technology can't be neutral because it's ultimately created by people and people are not neutral, no matter how much they want to think they are. Um, Tim Cook recently said at an event, technology is a mirror that reflects the ambitions and intentions of the people who use it, the people who build it and the people who regulate it. Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. This is a quote from Melvin Kranzberg, as the first law of technology. If you're not familiar with who Melvin Transberg is, he's one of the founders of the Society of the History of Technology in the US and a longtime editor of his journal, Technology and Culture. I'm also reading a fantastic book at the moment called uh, Technology is Not Neutral, and it's by uh, Stephanie Hare, and it's an introduction to technology ethics. Highly recommend you read it. So here are some ideas. Like I said, this, these are my ideas. Uh, they obviously chime with other people, but it's what I've learned along the way, and I think this is what we can try and do to try and fix this problem. First thing is check your privilege. I know people say this, uh, and people get very offended by this, but it's not about things being made easier for you. It's about how characteristics you can't change haven't made things any harder. So saying that you are you have privilege in some way doesn't mean that things have been plain sailing. It might have in some cases, obviously, but it means that who you are and what you are, what you cannot change, hasn't made things any harder for you. Value lived experience. Just because it's never happened to you doesn't mean it hasn't happened to anyone else. A case in point uh, brought up in one of the books I mentioned was Twitter's failure to act or take a really long time to tackle abuse of women on its platform was because ultimately it was founded by four white men whose experience of the internet, his, their lived experience of the internet is just not that. They don't get abused in the way that women do on the platform. And it just took a really long time for them to acknowledge that, hey, they just built something that's just like perfect uh, vehicle for that. Look around you. This is something I say all the time at these kind of events. If everyone sitting around the table with you looks like you, and whatever you're doing or building will impact people that don't look like you, which is almost always the case, make sure you get them in the room too. And this leads into the design for and with the margins. I recently read a really interesting article in Wired by um, Afsane Rigo, uh, and here's just a wee quote from it. The reality is that making better, safer, less harmful tech requires design based on the lived realities of those who are most marginalized. These edge cases are frequently ignored as being outside the scope of a typical user's likely experiences. Yet these are powerful indicators for understanding the flaws in our technologies. And I'm gonna to add to the thought of designing for the margins is design with the margins. Like I said, with look around you, get people involved, co-design, co-production. Get your user involved. Acknowledge your biases no matter how uncomfortable. How can you tackle bias when you don't even recognize your own? The end of bias, the author, Jessica Nodell, she went on this journey and she had to confront her own history. Um, she's a white woman and, uh, and she's always embraced one side of her family, but the other side of her family, if she looks back, they were slavers. And she had to you know, acknowledge that and realize that you know, she probably has some inbuilt biases based on that. Uh, and you have to confront it and because if you don't if you don't acknowledge your biases you can't do anything about it bring in the unusual suspects this was great advice from Kathy McCulloch who is the director of the children's parliament recently at our Scottish AI summit bring in the unusual suspects 
you will get valuable perspectives and input. We were talking in specifically about getting children involved um, in the development of AI um, and the delivery of strategy and policy. Um, but bring in the unusual suspects. You'll be surprised what kind of perspectives and how useful that is. Don't blame the technology. Exactly this. The technology is a scapegoat. A human has ultimately created that technology. We don't have general AI yet. And even when we do, a human would have created it and will have started it with the values it's given. Um, I recommend reading Mo Gaudet's uh, Scary Smart because um, he kind of talks about the concept of how technology can have the values of its creator. Improve data collection practices. This is almost entirely what Invisible Women is about. It gives so many examples of how non-sex disaggregated data can have consequences. For example, car crash uh, testing. The dummy for car crash testing is based on a normal average male. That's why women, when they get involved in car crashes, are more likely to be seriously injured than men. Um, also things like medical doses. Um, clinical trials are based uh, on males and women have actively different physical makeups to men but the data they use to carry out the trials is all based on men and therefore dosages of medication should be varied according to male and females loads of things in that book safety equipment ppe etc they're all designed for ultimately what is the default human which is male call it out if you can call it out however small your company's latest marketing campaign full of pictures of young white men, call it out. Speaking on a conference or a panel that just full of men, call it out. It's 2022, you know, there's no excuse for it. Champion and provoke, uh, I'm sorry, champion and promote diverse role models. You can't be what you can't see. An old one, but a good one. Ultimately, there is no simple fix but we must keep learning and do better. You'll notice that I haven't actually talked about AI itself. For me, this is because I don't think it's an AI problem. Ultimately, it's a people problem, a societal problem, a workplace culture problem, anything but the tech itself. People create the tech, so we need to fix the people. So I'm getting there, I'm getting in, bear, bear with me. Um, so I'm gonna start with, uh, eh, have another quote. Um, <laughs> it's bizarrely profound, actually, uh, from Tim Cook uh, recently at an event um, in Washington on uh, global uh, uh, privacy policy. Uh, Those of us who create technology and make the rules that govern it have a profound responsibility to the people we serve. Let us embrace that responsibility. Will you join me? Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and since I might have a bit of time, I'm just going to quickly show a meme uh, I quite like. Um, you see versions of this everywhere, uh, but I particularly like this version. Um, equality, equity, reality, liberation. Get rid of the barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steph. Um, if you turn your camera on, that was a brilliant presentation. Um, I would like to ask you lots of questions, but I think I only have time for one. Um, I guess it takes quite, quite a slightly leading question race around AI. So um, I mean, you mentioned about the various issues about the lack of um, diversity in tech, but for me, how do you think it's going to affect the consumer uptake of, of AI, particularly given some of the, some of the terrible stories that are around um, in terms of what AI has been developed so far? Well, I mean, that, that comes to the issue of trust, isn't it? Um, you know, if you don't involve the people you're trying to reach, they're not going to trust what you create because ultimately, like you said, it's the bad stories that hit the headlines. You know, it, it, you might be fishing for like loads of uh, media outlets to publish your great little you know, innovation that's just made a massive difference to loads of people. They don't care. They prefer to hear about the bit where someone's stolen your AI or stolen your face and are using it in a really controversial way. And that's because there's ultimately a lack of trust because they start from a position of lack of trust. The Center for Data Ethics and Innovation had uh, their public attitudes tracker survey um, released ooh, a couple months ago now, I think. And um, yeah, I mean, trust and fear of AI is, is a really big issue. And, and that comes from the fact that, you know, what I said about designing for and with the margins, you need to involve people like ultimately AI applications. Someone said to me recently that working in a field 
where diversity doesn't matter as much because well I, I debate that but because the output doesn't won't negatively impact different groups of people because that 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 technology doesn't do that but ai most definitely does because you can't say ai is only you know designed to affect one tiny group of people because it doesn't you know <laughs> it, it affects everyone so um so yeah i i've gone on off a tangent there but ultimately you know you, you, the, the the issue of trust and fear and it stems from not having an inclusive and diverse approach to it um also you know like I said, you can't be what you can't see, but at the same time, it's also the poster, the poster, I'm gonna say the poster boys because ultimately it is the poster boys, a lot of it for AI and tech, et cetera, are all young, white, privileged males. So, so you know, how, why would you, why would you trust them if you are not a young, white, privileged male? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we have to leave it at that point. I say I would like to carry on the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, very much, Steph. If you no get, the, get the slides back up, please. Bye, everyone. Bye. So for our um, next speaker on transformational leadership in the age of AI, we have Daniel Hume, the CEO of Satalia and Chief AI Officer for WPP. Daniel, the floor is yours. Excellent, thank you. Hopefully you can hear me. I'll say those infamous words. Can I also uh, share my slides? I can, fantastic. Just gonna share my slides. Uh -huh. I'm clicking on the little icon, but it's not giving me the ability to hear. Oh, I can, I've sent you my slides through, so I, I, there we go, exactly. <coughs> fantastic, super. Uh, right, so we've got about 40, 40 minutes. I'm going to talk for about 30, 35. We're going to talk about three things. We're going to get everybody on the same page in terms of what AI is and isn't. There's a huge amount of rhetoric, misunderstanding about what these technologies are, uh, and I'm going to get us all on the same page in terms of what they are and aren't. We're going to talk about innovation, how we can bring people and technology together to do amazing things. And if we've got some time, we'll also talk about the future, how these technologies will impact humanity over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So a little bit about me, um, I uh, wear two hats. Uh, I, my entire academic background over the past 20 years is in AI for my undergraduate, master's, PhD, postdocs. I ran an applied uh, AI master's program in UCL for about five years. Right? I had about 100 students every year going out there applying these emerging technologies to solving problems across a whole range of different industries. And I'm currently entrepreneur in residence for UCL, so I help them take deep technology and figure out how to have a positive impact on the world. I used to say I wear an evil corporate hat. I'm not allowed to say that anymore. I am the CEO of Satalia, which is a company that builds AI solutions for some of the biggest companies in the world. I have done for the past 15 years. Uh, last year, we were acquired by WBP, um, where I take on a role of a global chief AI officer responsible for AI across 120,000 people. So uh, before we get into definitions of AI, what I want to do is take you through this technology stack. This is how I think about data-driven decision-making. And I'm usually make these very interactive. We don't have a huge amount of time today. So I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions and I want you to try and answer those questions in your mind's eye. The first qu question I want to ask everybody is what is data? We hear the word data a lot. I wonder if anybody knows the definition of data. Maybe you're thinking information. Actually, data comes from the Latin word datum, which means given things. It's stuff. It's the fabric of our universe. It's bits and bytes, ones and zeros. It's the, the sound that's going into your ears. It's the light that's going into your eyes. It's not until you give something context does it become information. So if I say to you 210280, this is data. If I say that it's a date of birth or how much money I have in my account or whatever, and it becomes information. Information is data in context. And one of the biggest challenges we have in computer science is taking this messy world of stuff and figuring out what does it actually mean. So uh, let's get you warmed up. What does this probably say? Hopefully you're all saying ABC. What does this probably say? 12, 13, 14, but you can see that the data that's entering your eyes, the stuff in the middle is the same data, but you're giving it a different meaning based on its context. And if I said to you that my laptop is sick, what does that mean to you? My laptop is sick. If you're cool or young, it probably means that it's awesome. If you're old like, and boring like me, it probably means that it's broken. So that data that's going into your eyes, into your ears, can be interpreted in two different ways. And it's very important that we interpret it correctly based on our statistical experience. Uh, if I ask you to read this sentence here and tell me what it means, so I want you to take a moment and read this. So maybe picture in your mind what you think is going on. I assume that most of you are, re are picturing a, a guy, John, reading a letter out loud to a lady called Mary. 
Uh, this actually can be interpreted in many ways. Uh, John could be reading a letter that was sent or addressed to Mary. John read a letter to Mary. John could be reading the alphabet A, B, C, D to Mary. John could be reading the book called The Letter to Mary. John could be reading the letter, the letter of the law to Mary. John could be reading a book called The Letter to Mary. Uh, it could be an instruction, John, read the letter to Mary. This can be interpreted actually in over 13 different ways. And we will all go away with a picture in our mind of what we think is correct. And we're probably wrong. And my goal in this talk is to convince you all that humans are rubbish. That's my goal today. Uh, uh, anyway, um, if I, imagine if I give you a spreadsheet and in the spreadsheet it has three columns. It has a column which is the date, a column which is the temperature on that date, and a column which is the number of ice creams that I sold. So got date, temperature, ice cream sales. What do you do with that information? What do you do with that spreadsheet? Most people will try to find some sort of correlation. Maybe we'll draw a graph. So if you plotted temperature along the x-axis and, and ice cream sales along the y-axis, we would see some sort of trend going upwards. The hotter it gets, the more ice creams that we sell. This is called descriptive analytics. What we're doing is we're organizing information to try to know things about the world, to try to find patterns. We know that as it gets hotter, we can sell more ice creams. And actually Plato has a fantastic definition for knowledge. He said, knowledge is justified true belief. So it's not a fact, but based on our experience, statistical experience, we believe that this is going to happen. Knowledge is justified true belief. And we can all uh, be data scientists now. We can all now put a line through it. Now, this is called predictive analytics. We now have predictive power. So if tomorrow is 22 degrees outside, I can look at my model. I can see how many ice creams I'm going to uh, need uh, sell. Uh, and we can put this into a factory and we can have now our factory manufacturing ice creams based on the, this model. Uh, and, and I guess the goal of data science or, or machine learning is to try to fit some sort of line or plane or hyperplane to to best fit a data set that's really all we're trying to do and anybody that tells you that their uh, machine learning is not biased do not understand machine learning all machine learning is biased they all are a generalization of the world uh, and i will talk about bias later on because i think there's a massive misunderstanding about what what bias actually means in, in this uh, industry um, anyway um we can like I say we get more and more complex algorithms to, to better fit that curve and i would argue that ultimately that's what we're trying to do in data science is get the best fit to, to that data but but knowing something is very different to understanding something so if i asked you why do we sell ice creams when it's hot outside it, it's actually quite a complicated narrative. It, it, it's hot outside in the UK, it's a scarce resource, so we all go outside. And then what happens is we get too hot and we can cool ourselves down in different ways. We can take our clothes off and go back inside or we can buy an ice cream. And ice creams uh, are cold and because of therm thermodynamics, it's refreshing. Now, to expect a, a computer to understand that narrative from this line here is impossible. It doesn't understand about human behavior or, or thermodynamics. So it's really important that we bring together the people that can interpret these uh, patterns with the people that are very good at finding patterns and then this is often missed in industry where people build models they put them into production without really understanding what those models mean uh, because actually your domain experts going to say Daniel your model of the world here is wrong in fact actually it's ex existentially wrong because if tomorrow is the hottest day ever if it's scorching hot what's going to happen is that your, your factory is going to manufacture lots and lots of ice creams but the reality is that you're not going to sell any because it's going to be too hot for people to go outside and buy those ice creams so it's really important we bring the people that have domain knowledge with the people that are very, very good at finding patterns in, in, in data because what I'm trying to suggest is that we're trying to understand the world perfectly if we can understand the world perfectly but then we can make good decisions and decision making is a completely different field in computer science typically human beings are making those decisions and I'm going to try and argue now that human beings are rubbish at making decisions so uh, if you haven't done already I would recommend reading a book by Daniel Kahneman who's a Nobel Prize winning economist um, uh, he uh, makes the book the book is called thinking fast and slow and he argues that we have a fast brain and a slow brain and there are some parallels here in terms of how AIs are built but I'm going to test these brains with you all now I'm going to ask you some maths questions and your job is to answer these maths questions as fast as possible because if you don't answer them faster than somebody else they're going to take your market or whatever so we're going to start out nice and easy uh, and, and we're going to get more and more complicated answer them fast uh, so the first question nice and easy what is two times two hopefully you can all do that it's four okay what is 17 uh, 14 times 768 Okay, I assume that nobody can do that quickly. This one, you used your fast brain. You didn't even need to think about it. This one, you need to go through a process now going to come up with the answer. Now, I'm going to ask you a few more maths questions, slightly different flavor. Answer these questions as quickly as possible. The combined price of a bat and a ball is one pound and 10 pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. How much is the ball? Combined price is one pound and 10 pence. The bat is one pound more than the ball. How much is the ball? Probably most of you are thinking 10 pence. 
don't worry, you're not broken, it's not 10 pence. Uh, the bat is one pound and five pence, the ball is five pence, the combined price is one pound and 10 pence, the bat is one pound, one the ball. This is where you used your fast brain and you probably came to a wrong answer. Now, those of you that got the answer right, I assume that you knew the answer already and cheated. I can give you lots and lots of these examples and you will get them wrong because you're using the wrong part of your brain. All right, imagine these are five staff members. I don't really know, but what we want to do is we want to allocate these staff members to jobs. Now, how many ways can I allocate five people to five jobs? Like, we're looking at one allocation here. I can flip two around to get another allocation. Does anybody remember the exclamation mark that we learned in school? Five factorial, five times four times three times two times. There's 120 possible ways I can allocate five people to five jobs. Now, if I make the problem a bit more complicated, and let's say we've got 15 people, how many ways can I allocate 15 people to 15 jobs? Use your fast brain. Don't say 15 factorial, that's cheating. So I wonder what number you're coming up with, but actually there's over a trillion possible ways that I can allocate 15 people to 15 jobs, 15 times 14 times 13, da, 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 da. One rule to take away with you today, anything more than seven, don't use a human for. Humans are very good at solving problems up to about seven. Beyond that, we're pretty useless. Uh, and actually industry don't have problems of this size. They have problems of this size. So here are 500 staff members. Can you tell me how many ways I can allocate them? No, you can't. It's a big number. It's a number that's got over a thousand digits. And just to put this number into context, this is how many atoms there are in the universe. Once you reach about 60 things that you have to consider, whether that's people allocate, allocating people to jobs or marketing channels or whatever, once you have to with the 60 things, you have more possible combinations than you have atoms in the universe. Humans can solve problems up to about seven. You can hire a good computer scientist that can solve problems up to about 30. Beyond that, you need to have deep, deep specialized expertise in optimization. Uh, just to put this into context, one of our clients is PwC. Uh, they have 5,000 auditors here in the UK that they need to allocate to a demand, 5,000 factorial. Historically, they would have human beings trying to solve that problem, trying to allocate, solve that maths problem. Uh, we can build algorithms that can allocate those people significantly better than any human being and um, do it in four hours instead of 20 people's full-time job. Uh, let's just drum this problem home. Imagine uh, your ice cream van has to deliver ice creams to these 24 points around London. Humans are actually quite good at solving these spatial problems. So after a, a few minutes, maybe we'll draw a nice path around those 24 points to give us uh, a good route. How long will it take a computer to get the shortest route, the one that's gonna save us the most amount of petrol? Under maybe you're thinking seconds or milliseconds. We've played this game already. It's actually 20 billion years. So if you've got 24 times 23 times 22 da, 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 into your calculator, you get this number of routes at the bottom. And if you had a computer that could check a million routes a second, that could calculate a million routes every single second, it would take 20 billion years, longer than the age of the universe, to go through every single possible one and say, this one that I looked at 10 billion years ago, this one's the shortest one. And if I had another point to the map, I now have 25 times 20 billion years, so 5,000 billion years. If I had another point to the map, I now have 26 times 5,000 billion years. These are exponential problems. They get ugly very, very quickly. Human beings are typically trying to solve these problems and they're solving them badly. Again, just to put this into context, one of our clients is Tesco. They're delivering to 200,000 points on a map a day, 200,000 factorial, and you don't have gazillions of years to solve that problem. We have seconds or milliseconds between each customer coming to their website to request slots to optimize those vehicles in the background. So these are very, very hard problems and typically human beings are solving them badly. Um, when I build systems for companies, they usually have these three components. So everybody's getting excited about data. They're all bringing their data together, digital transformation. I think that's, that's not necessarily the right thing to do, but anyway, that's, that's what's happening. And then the, what they're doing is they're putting an analytics layer on top of it and hiring data scientists and machine learning experts to try and find insights and patterns from that data. They're hiring my students. I would actually argue that companies don't have machine learning problems. They don't have data science problems. They have decision problems. Decision making is a completely different field in computer science. It used to be called operations research. It's logic, it's reasoning, it's optimization. I think there are less than 3,000 incredibly strong decision scientists around the globe. It used to, it matured in academia about two decades ago. Everybody's now excited about machine learning and data science. Um, and, and actually companies have been hiring the wrong people i.e. data scientists, to solve the problems that they don't understand. And I'm concerned that over the next five years, there's going to be a bubble because of that misunderstanding. Always start out with a decision and then work backwards. What algorithm do you need to be able to make the decision better? What insights do you need, need to be able to inform the decision? And what data do you need to be able to extract the insights? Um, 
so uh, if I build a system that I give data to and it makes a decision and tomorrow I give it the same data, it makes it the same decision. What I have is automation and automation is amazing because automation can do things traditionally better than human beings, uh, significantly better than human beings. But if you know the definition of stupidity, you know that it's uh, doing the same thing over again and expecting a different answer. By definition, automation is stupid. Not that it's not valuable, but it's not intelligent. Uh, and unfortunately, everybody that currently touches this technology stack is calling themselves an AI company, which is fine because you get more clients and more VC funding, but this is not AI. There are actually two definitions of AI. There's probably more than that, it's about five, but the two popular definitions. The first one is, is, is the most popular, but the weakest, which is getting computers to do things that humans can do. Over the past decade, we've managed to get machines to do things that traditionally were only in the domain of human beings. We get computers to correspond in natural language, to be able to find objects and images. And when we get machines to do things that humans can do, then we assume that that's intelligence because humans are the most intelligent thing we know in the universe. Humans are very good at finding patterns in about four dimensions and we're very good at problem solving problems up to seven. Beyond that, we're pretty useless. Computers can find patterns in thousands of dimensions and they can solve problems with thousands of moving parts. Benchmarking machines against humans is a very silly thing to do. Uh, there's, there's a really good definition of AI that comes from a definition of intelligence. So instead of using human beings as the definition of intelligence, there's this, it's beautiful. It's goal-directed adaptive behavior. Goal-directed in the sense we're trying to achieve an objective. We're trying to route our vehicles to maximize the number of deliveries. We're trying to allocate our staff to match, like, maximize utilization. Behavior is how quickly we can answer that question. Now we've just discovered that some of these questions are infinite in size. They are incredibly complex to solve and being able to solve that question well and fast is very hard. But the key word in this definition is adaptive. Ultimately, what you want to do is build systems that can make decisions, learn about whether those decisions are good or bad, adapt their own understanding of the world so that next time you can make a better decision. If, now, if I was being brutally honest, I haven't seen very many successful complex adaptive systems in production in my life. So I would actually argue that next to nobody is doing AI to this definition. Um, the, the true paradigm of AI are building systems that can safely adapt themselves in production. And there's less, less than a handful of companies in, in, around the world that know how to do this. Um, I don't know if you remember the Microsoft Twitter bot a few years ago. Microsoft launched a bot on Twitter. Lots of teenagers decided to tease this Twitter bot and it became a sexist, racist bot very quickly. That's what happens when you put systems in production that can adapt themselves. They can adapt in ways that you can't predict. Okay, so a little bit of history. This is Socrates before he drinks hemlock. It's one of my favorite paintings. This was AI in the 60s and 70s. What we would do is write down lots of rules and try to infer new knowledge from those rules. So if I say to you, Socrates is a man and all men are mortal, you can infer that Socrates is, is, is mortal. Now, it didn't really scale, it didn't really work. So in the 80s and 90s, a new type of AI came along that's modeled on how biology um, work. So my PhD 18 years ago was trying to model the brain of a bumblebee. Bumblebees have a million neurons. Their brains can fit on the end of a needle. Bumblebees can do amazing things. They navigate 3D worlds. They recognize objects. They talk to each other. So they solve problems. They don't handle windows very well, but ultimately they're very, very smart creatures. And the question was, can you take a million neurons and model it in the machine? 18 years ago, it was impossible. About 12 years ago, there was a new paradigm in this technology now referred to as neural networks or deep learning that um, we can now model hundreds of millions of neurons and we can teach these brains to do things that traditionally human beings can do. This is what people are currently calling AI. It's not AI. These brains are very good at finding patterns in data. They are not very good at making decisions. What you want to do is use these technologies to know that Socrates is a man, know that all men are mortal. Use these technologies to then reason and make decisions to try and achieve ob an objective and then build systems that can adapt themselves safely in production. So, so really, a lot of people just think the machine learning and neural networks is AI. It's not. It's a massive misunderstanding. And it only looks upon a very, very small portion of what AI actually is. Um, anyway, uh, uh, I would argue, this is where it gets a bit weird, that if, if we look at the, the semicircle here is the bounds of human ability, we can probably take any specific task that a human does and we can build a technology that can outperform that, human, uh, that specific task. It's often referred to as narrow AI. I don't like these definitions. I think that they're wholly unuseful, uh, but it's very expensive and, and complex to build individual systems and glue them together. So there's lots of interesting research going into what is called AGI or strong, uh, um, a strong AI, where we can build one brain that can do many things. And actually this is why human beings are very, very special. We are one system and we can do many, many things and we're incredible, uh, incredibly adaptable. But if we take this idea to its end state, the, the hypothesis is that within our lifetime, we are going to build a brain 
smarter than us in every single possible way. This is the last invention that humanity will create. It could be the most glorious thing that happens to us, uh, or it could be the biggest existential threat to humanity. I think it's our biggest existential threat. We'll talk about this later on. Before we build a super intelligence, we're having to build systems that make decisions about our everyday lives, often referred to as ethical AI. I'm going to argue there's no such thing as ethical AI in a minute. Uh, but this, I'm sure you've seen before, is uh, the, tr uh, the trolley problem. I'm in my driverless car. In front of me is a kid. To the right is uh, yeah, two adults and to the left is a cliff. Who does the car kill? When I ask audiences this, you never get a consistent answer. And philosophers for 3,000 years have been arguing about this stuff. And what's exciting now about human history is we're having to build systems that, um, that embody, uh, encompass these types of ethics. I actually heard that we'll have an ethical setting in our car where we say we want to kill grandmas over cats, depending on our own preference, or our, 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 our metaverse avatar will actually be driving the car for us and it will decide who to kill for us. Um, but anyway, um, this is, again, the world of uh, AI ethics. And again, I would controversially argue there is no such thing as AI ethics. Mo AIs, uh, or these technologies, do not create their own intent. Human beings create the intent, whether it's to maximize profit or whatever, the technologies that are there to try to achieve the intent. It's the intent that needs to get scrutinized, and, it, and, and that scrutinization is an ethics problem. It's not an AI ethics problem. Most of the problems that we're dealing with in AI are safety problems. Are we building systems that behave how we want them to behave? Even bias and all of these things that people are currently calling uh, AI ethics actually are safety problems. Um, uh, and again, I'd love to talk more about this. I've got an entire talk on, on AI ethics and safety, but um, uh, to try and convince you. But anyway, I'm going to move on now and talk about innovation. So uh, this is a hierarchy, uh, and uh, this is, I'm sure you don't have any problems like this in your organization. Hierarchies breed certain types of interesting relationships between people, and I would argue that hierarchies are not conducive for adaptation. Remember, adaptation is synonymous with intelligence. The more quickly we can adapt, the more intelligent we are. And uh, I guess over the past um, decade, what we've seen um, is organizations trying to bring in new organizational paradigms, agile and scrum and all this kind of stuff. And the principle behind these paradigms are adaptation, how we, we can quickly innovate to adapt to an ever-changing world. And, and I'm gonna, um, and there's a whole load of trends that are currently happening in how organizations are operating or changing how they operate to move from rigid structures to more um, adaptive structures. This is a subject I'm very, very passionate about. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of this, but I'll touch upon some of these, uh, these items. Um, so uh, again, what I'd like to say is that the, this technology stack that I've just described is actually gonna be a commodity over the next 10 years. We already have access to very cheap compute, all of the data you need is all free. All of the tools you need, the data science tools are all open source. You don't have to pay for them. Somebody will commoditize decision-making and somebody will commoditize self-learning. The battleground for companies is not technology, it's talent. It's how do you attract, retain, motivate, empower talent to innovate. The faster you can innovate, the more adaptable you are, the more intelligent you are. And actually Steve Jobs had a really great definition for innovation. He said, innovation is creativity that ships. And the most important word in that definition is the word that. That is generating ideas and getting to the point where somebody's willing to pay for them. And that process is long and hard and painful. And what I'm interested in is shortening that process so we can get innovations to market as fast as possible. And one of the key ingredients to innovation is motivation. How do you motivate and unlock the creative capacity of employees? There's a very good introductory book on motivation by a guy called Dan Pink. He said there are three things that motivate people, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy is giving people the freedom to do what they want and mastery is giving them the ability to become really good at what they want and purpose is giving them something higher to align themselves with and we'll talk about this more in a minute. So the first challenge that organizations have is how do you attract talent in the first place? The number of CEOs that I know that are trying to build out their own AI team and they are dys dysfunctional in this matrix. They how, how sexy are you, honey, and how interesting are, you, are your challenges? If you're not sexy and you don't have interesting challenges, you're not going to attract talent. If you're sexy and you've got interesting challenges, you'll attract talent and they'll most likely stick. And if you're in the other two quadrants, you'll attract talent and they'll leave after a few years. And that can be more dangerous to your organization than not being able to attract talent at all. Um, but once you have engaged with talent, whether that's working with third parties like Citalia or um, building your own team or buying software off the shelf, you then need to try and create an organizational culture structure for that talent to thrive. And uh, I guess over the past decade, we've seen a flattening of organization, new tools, new technologies, new organizational paradigms allow us to remove middle managers to create these thin, flat companies. I still think that these thin, flat companies are not conducive for innovation. Citalia was about 120 people before we were acquired. We had no fixed managers, no fixed hierarchies, no KPIs. People were free to work where they want, how they want, on whatever they want. Um, and I guess the, the principle was that we were trying to create an operating platform 
for the right organizational structure to emerge according to the innovation that needs to get taken to the market. So if you're a services company, you might need a swarm type structure. If you're a product company, you might need a hierarchy. So instead of having one type of organizational structure, can you create a platform to allow for um, innovations to go to market as fast as possible? And my goal is not just to scale this to 120,000 people in WPP. My goal is to scale this uh, concept to a planet. I actually want to try and create a planet where everybody's free to work where they want, on whatever they want, where they want, how they want, and be fairly remunerated for that contribution. And that will challenge what it means to be a company, and it will even challenge what it means to be a country. We'll talk more about this in, in a bit. Um, one enabler of these types of, of organizations is a concept called organizational network analysis. So we have usually a formal structure, formal hierarchy structure, but then there's an informal structure uh, within our organizations where people go to for advice and feedback and all this kind of stuff. And we can use now our digital footprint that we're creating, the Zoom calls and the emails and the uh, Slack and Teams, we can use that digital uh, uh, footprint to understand people's hopes, dreams, desires, skills, relationships, and we can understand what people are good at, what they're bad at, and allocate those people uh, to opportunities that align with their own um, uh, interests, their own values, and the values of the organization. Uh, now, it does also raise lots of interesting ethical questions. I can identify people in my company who are secret lovers. I can identify people who are going to leave the company before they know they're going to leave the company. So it's how you use the data. It's the intended use of the data that's the, that should come under scrutiny, not the data itself. Um, and uh, so in my organization, we trust that we use the data to empower people and liberate people from these hierarchies. Um, uh, just to give you a crazy thing that we used to do, we used to ask everybody every year to make public recommendations for their salary. So everybody would declare what they want to be paid publicly, and then people would vote on whether those salaries should be reduced or increased or kept the same. And we would use machine learning to determine how many votes one person has for another. So if I've worked very closely with you over the past year, if I'm very knowledgeable about your domain, I will have more votes for your salary than somebody else. So I had interns voting on people's salaries who had a higher weight than me because they were better placed at making that decision. And so, and I think that this principle can be applied to all types of decision making across an organization, whether you're forming the strategy, figuring out what your sales pipeline looks like, giving feedback, working on code. You should be able to identify the best people diverse in, in some cases, group of people to make the best possible decision. In some cases, it might be one person. That one person should have all of the in, uh, votes. In the other extreme, everybody has an equal vote. But the most likely there will be a group of people that are better placed to make those decisions than another group of people and have the right diverse, cognitive diverse, um, perspective to make sure that you're getting the best decision. And again, just to give you an example, it turns out that females tend to undervalue themselves when it comes to their salary. Uh, we had a, a female that made a recommendation for their salary. I won't bore you with this, but out of everybody in the organization, she had the most votes to go away and come back with a bigger salary. She came back with a bigger salary. She still had um, almost all of the vote to, to, to go and increase her salary. So this was a bias that she had where she was undervaluing herself. And then the crowd solved that problem. And, uh, and, and again, I, I believe that we can apply this principle to organizing our companies in these new ways. Um, I won't bore you with this, but digital transformation is getting all our data together. The next step beyond digital transformation is a concept called digital twins, um, which is a world where AI will play. It allows you to run simulations and adapt to a, a change a world more quickly. I won't bore you with that stuff. Let's talk about the future because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, so uh, maybe I haven't convinced you, but uh, I hopefully I've convinced you that there is a massive misunderstanding about these technologies. There's lots of organizations that have started out their journey, and I think they've started out their journey wrong. There's a huge amount of rhetoric, misunderstanding about these technologies out there. Uh, and, and I'm deeply worried that that rhetoric is making people fearful of these technologies. Uh, and it's also um, uh, creating bigotry and, and, and their own biases. But I, I think we should also acknowledge that, that these technologies are incredibly powerful. And those organizations, those governments, those companies that embrace and adopt these technologies correctly are ultimately going to win. If you, if you are able to adapt more quickly than your competitors, it's very, very hard for them to keep up. Uh, and I don't know, it's a bit topical, if you know who said this quote at the top here, um, the nation that leads in AI will be the ruler of the world. This, is, this was Vladimir Putin actually recently. Um, so even he's on board with this idea. Um, so I, I have a concern about winning and I have a concern about the use of these technologies. And I've tried to capture this concern 
in this macro framework. So if any of you have written a business plan or done a, a business degree, degree, you might have heard of this concept called PESTLE. PESTLE is a, is a kind of a macro framework to understand macro trends. I've already alluded to this concept of a singularity. Technologically, techno technology is advancing us exponentially into the future. And it's becoming more and more difficult for us to understand what that future looks like. And, and the singularity is a point in time we can't see beyond. Uh, and what I've tried to do is capture the zeitgeist, the concerns that people have into these six singularities, which I'll run through very, very quickly. So the, the, the political singularity is when we no longer know what is true. So deep fakes, um, uh, chatbots, uh, misinformation bots are now challenging uh, not only the, the fabric of our political foundations, but actually challenging the fabric of our reality. And my concern is that there is a point in time where we cannot authenticate whether a piece of content is true or not. And I don't know what ramifications that will have, but where people lose complete trust in what they're observing is, is, a, is a worry of mine. Um, the economic singularity is actually my favorite singularity. It's coined by a very good friend of mine called Callum Chase. Um, uh, this is uh, where uh, uh, AI is being used not just to remove tasks, but when we have the opportunity to remove whole jobs, we will because cost, uh, we want to remove costs from our organization. And the concern here is that is that we will have and see mass technological unemployment. Um, uh, people will not be able to retrain fast enough to get new jobs because AI will, 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 will um, uh, will we'll solve those problems and then we might see a huge amount of social unrest. Now I controversially argue that we should be actually accelerating automation. Um, AI could potentially remove the friction from the creation and dissemination of goods like energy, healthcare, nutrition, education, shelter. In theory we could bring the cost of those goods down to zero. Imagine being born into a world where people don't have to work to feed themselves. They don't have to work to educate themselves. Uh, that is, all of those needs are met. They're all abundant, giving them economic freedom to then contribute to humanity however they want. Most of the high net worths, the millionaires, the people that have become economically free that I know are not sitting around bored at home. They're trying to use their assets, their wealth to contribute positively to humanity. I believe that we all have an innate desire to try to make the world better for each other and future generations. And I want to unlock as many people over the next 40 years of my life um, as possible to, 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 to innovate. Um, the social singularity is when we cure death. There are scientists that believe there are people alive today that don't have to die. AI enables us to monitor ourselves, to remove damage, to be able to accelerate and advance uh, medicine. And there is a, 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 a concept called the Methuselahity, which is where we are able to not die. And I don't know what impact will that have on society, but there's plenty of science fiction films around this subject. Technological singularity I've already alluded to is when we build a brain smarter than us in every single possible way. It's predicted to happen within a lifetime. My concern is that if we are still fighting each other over GDP, over resources, by the time this thing comes, it will see us as a threat and then remove us from the equation. And I think that would be a shame because I think humans are cool. So uh, my goal over the next 40 years is to figure out how do we get humanity cooperating as a single species. Uh, the environmental singularity you all know about, consumption is putting pressures on our planetary boundaries. By the way, consumption isn't necessarily a bad thing. It means that we are potentially getting goods to people who are then uh, enriching their lives and, and, and all that kind of stuff, but it is putting pressure on our planetary boundaries and we could create a situation where, where we have uncontrollable ecological collapse. I do, again, believe that these technologies can help uh, uh, these organizations achieve their net zero goals and, and mitigate this risk. Finally, the legal singularity is when surveillance becomes ubiquitous. So you might argue that there are companies, there are governments that know so much about you and have the ability to manipulate your behavior. And that is an incredibly powerful position to be in. If you, if you can manipulate people to allow you to accumulate more wealth, more power, that is uh, something that we need to be mitigating again. So I'm just going to close now and talk about purpose. I am not convinced necessarily that governments are going to create this glorious future. I actually think that it might be enterprise. I think that enterprise are realizing that if they don't have an incredibly strong purpose, then they're not going to attract talent, they're not going to attract customers. So, and I, and I think that this collective purpose of all of these enterprises are what could make this future glorious for us. My uh, um, my vision is to try to create a world of abundance. I think that technology can help us with that. I would take create a world where everybody's free, economically free, to contribute to humanity however they wish. It also aligns with WPP's aspirations, and I want to work with as many organizations as possible to do that. So in the last five minutes, maybe I'll open up the questions. Hopefully you're still there and I haven't been talking into the void that has happened before. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, Daniel. Thank you very much. That there's, there's so many ideas there. Um, 
probably, for I think probably time for two or three questions, so please keep sending them in. So one from me to begin with. So one of the things that, there are a lot of things you said there that I hadn't heard before, but um, one of them was around about decision scientists, which is not something I've come across before. And I've, I've spoken to people who are involved in ops research who, who make this make a similar point. So where are these decision scientists and how do companies find them? Because we, like everyone else, have got machine learning experts come in, but not uh, those people. Indeed. Okay. So un unfortunately, if you go on Google now, AI taxonomies or ontologies, all you're going to get to see are machine learning, neural networks, all this kind of stuff. It's a very, very small field in AI. In fact, AI isn't a technology, it's a manifesto. And as I said, that manifesto is building adaptive systems. And one key element of that is decision making. You need to be able to make decisions to be in, then be able to decide whether those decisions are good or bad. They used to be called operations research. And actually, they're still found in Brazil, in the Germanic countries, Austria, Germany, um, Australia. Um, just yeah, go and, go and Google um, operations research labs. They, they will be now rebranded as decision scientists, but they are discrete mathematicians. Most um, most uh, of our data science is statistics, uh, uh, whereas um, optimization is discrete mathematicians. Um, and, uh, and again, they're on, only found in the small pockets around the globe because what happens is that is that, that matured in academia about 20 years ago, and now everybody's got excited about machine learning. But again, machine le companies don't have machine learning problems. They, 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 you can surface more insights, but ultimately it's the human being that's then making decisions. And I hopefully I've argued humans are not going to make good at making those decisions. You can make a massive dent in solving problems um, in the real world if you solve that optimization problem. Uh, and, and that's what Satali is quite unique there because we combine both, both. So they're still found in, in a handful of pockets around the, the world. Um, like I said, university is actually still strong in the, in, the, in the north of England. And actually organizations are waking up to the fact that, the fact that we need to now retrain train a whole new uh, set of people around decision science. So I expect this to come now back into academia. Yeah. So one other thing, you mentioned on safety, I want to use a question that came from the audience earlier on, which is, so put into context from this, so standardization, a big element is the fact that products are safe. So whether it's toys, cars, um, medical devices, they're tested at the point in time. When you bring in AI, AI that doesn't necessarily work because if the AI is changing, is the product safe? So and obviously the standards need to adapt to that and certification and testing, but how do you ensure that something is safe when it's changing? What do you have perspective on that one? That's exactly why you don't see adaptive systems in production because they're incredibly hard to test. You, you, can, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can use these technologies, you can train. The difference between, I guess, machine learning and traditional programming is that in programming, you can you, you, you build your program and you can build test cases. In, in machine learning, you have to teach your program. You can still build test cases. By the way, there's still those, those test harnesses that we have in IT are absolutely applicable to, to AI. But you're absolutely right. When you can have adaptive systems, it makes that testing process much more, much more difficult, which is where explainability and, and other things uh, come in. Um, but um, so, uh, so, so as I mentioned, most of the challenges that we have are safety challenges. Pro AI um, projects don't fail for ethical reasons. They fail because of misinvestment, because they haven't been tested well enough, uh, because they haven't had the right skills, people working on those problems or the mismatch of skills of people in the world. I, I don't think that there needs to be a whole new field of AI safety and AI ethics. We can still leverage ethics governance committees. We can still um, uh, leverage 80% of the tools that you use to test software. And there's a lot of scaremongering, a lot of misunderstanding, really by consultants trying to sell more work to people um, uh, around this stuff, but actually you don't, you don't need to buy that stuff. I don't know if that, if that makes any sense at all. It does, it does. One final question. Um, so one of the things that's just come in, so what do you think is the biggest barrier to enterprises creating this future? Uh, uh, educating leadership, in the future, not, not the singularity. Uh, I think uh, partly educating leadership, but most of the leadership, by the way, that I engage with, they, they, they do have a positive aspiration. Of course, they're under pressure from the markets and they need to make money and all that kind of stuff. But um, and whether purpose is a byproduct of being able to attract talent and customers, I don't really care. But what we can do as employees is hold leadership accountable. I'd like to think that many of us have an opportunity to work for different organizations uh, and, and we have an option to vote with our feet. So we should be holding leadership accountable to achieving that purpose. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was an absolutely brilliant presentation and I hope to, so hope to hear from you again. Thank, Thank you. you very Please much. reach out to me on LinkedIn. Happy to keep the conversation going anytime. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. So for our next um, for the next slot, we have a board view of responsible AI, looking at AI safety, governance, and risk management. So what we're going to do for the next hour is we've got three speakers 
And each of them is going to speak in turn without slide about their perspectives on um, responsible AI, looking at it from very different angles. And then we'll come together for a, for a discussion. So I'll go in the order that uh, speakers are on the screen. So first we have David Leslie, Director of Ethics and Responsible Innovation Research at the Allen Turing Institute. David, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, it's it's really nice uh, to be here, and uh, just to, just to say uh, I'm uh, grateful to to be uh, talking for uh, in in the presence of such uh, illuminating people. So yeah, I wanted to uh, basically talk uh, a bit today about AI safety, governance, and risk management, and responsible AI in the broadest sense by by peering through a kind of practice-based lens that focuses on what we might call the uh, socio-technical AI project life cycle. So it, it, it uh, makes sense then to begin by fleshing out what has become quite familiar to those of us steeped in conversations uh, around responsible AI as this move from principles uh, to practice. So the recent history of AI ethics and governance has been characterized by increasingly vocal calls for a shift from principles to practice. Over the past few years, uh, some have discerned a rapid transition in the field from an initial concentration on high-level principles and uh, techno-solutionist fixes towards a kind of third wave of hard-nosed advocacy and legal action that is focused on practical mechanisms for recti rectifying power imbalances and achieving societal, injust societal justice. Others have emphasized that closing the gap between principles and practice should involve the employment of myriad tools and methods through the various stages of a project's life cycle so that the what of ethical principles can be translated into the how of technical mechanisms. Others still have called for, a strength, for strengthening of the regimes of auditability, traceability, and reviewability, emphasizing the importance of oversight, accountability, and transparency as the key to the effective governance of responsible AI research and innovation. Now, while it must be acknowledged that this intensifying concentration on the nexus between moral concepts and social practice has substantial merits, it is also important to point out that these perspectives have largely fallen short of fully realizing the transformations they identify and enjoin. Uh, those have turned to the incorporation of a patchwork of technical tools and documentation methods into the various stages of the project life cycle have provided an important bird's eye view of recording, auditing, and standards conformity uh, desiderata. They have focused, for instance, on how the document, uh, documentation of the creation, composition, intended uses, maintenance, and other properties of data sets is an important component of uh, recording uh, responsible practices. This is um, the Gabriel et al. Uh, proposal for the data sheets for data sets. Um, others have focused on, on how to encourage transparent model reporting through documentation detailing their performance characteristics, as with uh, the model cards that have been proposed by uh, Mitchell et al. Such a documentation-centered uh, governance strategy, however, has run the risk of remaining too far above and outside of the actual socio-technical processes that are behind innovation practices that, that these um, perspectives endeavor to document. The problem here is not that tools and methods like data sheets, data nutrition labels, data statements, model cards, fact sheets, and so on are of no use as provisional attempts, attempts at closing the gap between principles and practice, but rather that the aerial view that they take is liable to neglect the social, cultural, and cognitive preconditions of the responsible innovation practices that they aspire to advance. Cobbling together a robust toolbox of mechanisms to support the verific verification of claims about AI systems and development process in this latter sense leads in AI ethics and governance to a kind of functional tardiness or lateness uh, of the governance strategies that results. Namely, it, it results or it leads to an emphasis on narrowly targeted methods such as effective assessment, auditability, traceability, and reviewability that show up on the scene a moment too late. Such me uh, methods remain ex post facto and external to the inner workings of sufficiently reflective and responsible modes of technology production and use. 
It is at this latter foundational level of cultural formation, value shaping, and action orientation that a bridging of the gap uh, or the gulf between principles and practice in AI ethics uh, and governance must begin. Beyond the off-the-shelf uh, tools and documentation-centered governance instruments, closing the gap between principles and practice thus requires a transformation of organizational cultures, technical approaches, and individual attitudes from within or inside of the processes and practices of design development and deployment themselves. Achieving this requires uh, researchers, technologists, and innovators to establish and maintain end-to-end -end habits of critical reflection and deliberation across every stage of research uh, or innovation uh, project life cycles. This more basic organizational, technical, and psychological transformation entails that designers and developers of data-driven technologies pay deliberate and continuous attention to the role that values play in both discovery and engineering processes, as well as in considerations of the real world effects that these processes yield. It requires a sustained interdisciplinary effort to consider the multifaceted context of research and innovation, to anticipate potential impacts, to reflect on purposes, positionality, and power, and to engage affected stakeholders inclusively in order to ensure appropriate forms of social license and democratic governance. An approach to building trustworthy AI systems that takes as its starting point a focus on technologically based tools or documentation protocols, like those I've just mentioned, therefore erroneously works from the outside in, all the while the actual change required to bridge the divide between principles and practice must instead originate within research and innovation activities as part of a deeper transformation of organizational environments and added at individual attitudes, standpoints, and dispositions whence those innovation activities themselves derive. So the first and most crucial inroad to this practice-driven and process-based approach to responsible AI innovation is the reconceptualization of the AI innovation workflow as uh, a socio-technical project life cycle. Okay, so what does this mean? So, well, as a start, it means that we have to understand the deployment of AI technologies to be the result of a complex set of interrelated processes. As a general heuristic, these processes can be broken down into stages of project design, model development, and system deployment, each having a subset of activities. For instance, um, project design will involve things like project planning, problem formulation, data extraction, and procurement. Now, there are many ways admittedly of carving up the project life cycle, such as the build, manage, deploy, integrate, and monitor scheme of ML ops or the KDD, CRISDM, or SEMA workflows. Um, while this is true, it's important to keep in mind that all these framings of the project life cycle must remain flexible and responsive to the dynamic and iterative character of AI innovation practices. And they must also be responsive to complexities that are involved in sort of uh, incremental procurements of parts of systems and, and other, um, other methodologies that aren't included in, in the conventional ways of framing the workflow. However, even more importantly than, than thinking about the sort of technical um, processes, even more importantly for the reconceptualization, we need to think about these project stages and activities, not simply as techno-scientific processes that are operationally independent from or even immune from the conditioning dynamics of social environments in which they are embedded. We need additionally to see these processes as fundamentally social processes. And we need to regard the activities which steer these processes as ethically implicated social practices that are duly charged with a responsibility for critical self-reflection about the role that human purposes, values, and interests play at every juncture of discovery, engineering, and design processes. Now, uh, from this science with, with and for society perspective, we can begin to discern that from the earliest stages of the socio-technical project life cycle, human choices and values are integrated into AI, AI project design, model development, and system deployment. At the AI project planning stage, for instance, human judgments need to be made about whether uh, building an algorithmic model is the right approach given available resources, um, 
uh, and data, existing technologies and processes are, that are already in place, the complexity of the use co context involved, and the nature of the policy and social problems that need to be solved. These path determining choices at the project planning stage wield an overriding agenda setting power in, a in AI innovation ecosystems, a power that is all too often hoarded by those who control resources, and that is thus exercised often in ways that are at cross purposes with normative goals of democratic governance, public consent, and social license. At the problem formula, uh, formulation stage um, as well, human evaluations and interests shape the determination of what, what problem the AI technology is trying to solve and what target variables should be implemented within the system. This means that the very acts of devising the statistical problem and of translating goals into measurable proxies can introduce structural biases which may ultimately lead to discriminatory harm. Likewise, at the data pre-processing and feature engineering stage, human decisions about how to group or disaggregate input future features, for instance, how to carve up categories of gender or ethnic groups, or about which inputs features uh, to exclude altogether, for example, leading out deprivation indicators in a predictive model for clinical diagnostics, all of these things can have significant downstream influences on the fairness and equity of a system. Now, these socio-technical pain points uh, direct us, in a sense, towards the end-to-end -to -end uh, incorporation of habits of responsible research and innovation into all um, of uh, the research and innovation activities involved um, in producing AI systems. An RRI perspective provides researchers and innovators with an awareness that all the processes of scientific discovery and problem solving uh, possess the socio-technical aspects and ethical stakes. I'll close then with a quick recitation of uh, an RRI tool called the Karen Act Framework, which aims uh, to, to sort of be an instrument that enables researchers and innovators to continuously sense check the social and ethical implications of their research practices, and that helps them to establish and sustain responsible uh, habits of scientific investigation and reporting. First, the C of the Karen Act. Consider context. Think diligently about the conditions and circumstances surrounding AI innovation projects and their outputs. This involves focusing on the norms, values, and interests that inform the people undertaking the research and innovation and that shape and motivate the reasonable expectations of those who are likely to be impacted by the research and its results. A, anticipate impacts. Reflect on and assess the potential short-term and long-term effects that AI innovation projects may have on impacted individuals and on affected communities and social groups more broadly. The purpose of this kind of anticipatory reflection is to safeguard the sustainability of AI projects across the entire innovation life cycle, to ensure that activities and outputs of AI research and innovation remain socially and environmentally sustainable and support the sustainability of communities they affect. Researchers and technologists must proceed with a continuous responsiveness to the real world uh, impacts that their research results could have. The R, reflect on purposes, positionality, and power. Engage in reflexive practices that scrutinize the way potential perspectival limitations and power imbalances can exercise influence on the equity and integrity of AI innovation projects and on the motivations, interests, and aims that steer them. E, engage inclusively, undertake practices of meaningful outward facing stakeholder engagement and community involvement so that the views and values of individuals and communities impacted by innovation projects can help to shape them. This will bolster an AI project's legitimacy, social li license and democratic governance, as well as ensure that its outputs will possess an appropriate degree of public accountability and transparency. And finally, act. So, uh, I've given you the C-A-R-E of care, now act. Act transparently and responsibly. Marshal the habits of responsible research and innovation cultivated in each of these care processes to produce research and innovation that prioritizes data stewardship and that is robust, reliable, secure, sustainable, accountable, fair, non-discriminatory, and explainable. And that, that's my uh, 15 minutes, so I'll uh, turn back to Tim. Thank you very much, David. Um, so now for our second of the three panel uh, introductions, 
So we have Maria Accente, who is the chair of the Data Analytics and AI Leadership Committee at TechUK, and PwC deals with responsible AI and AI for good lead. Maria, the floor is yours. I think you're on mute, Maria. There should be a little um, icon next to the camera. Yes, hello, so, hello. I Okay, I think I, I'm, I'm muting myself. Can you hear me okay, Tim? Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you to David for such a comprehen comprehensive uh, pointing out the challenges and the opportunity around responsible AI. Uh, I'm not going to, there's not much more for me to add other than a, a little bit of our experience from, from the trenches, from what we have learned in the past five years since uh, we have been working with uh, clients uh, globally uh, on issue issues uh, around responsible AI and uh, what we have learned supporting them and um, us in building AI that not only aligns with uh, organizational goals but is able to deliver um, uh, uh, reliable outcomes but also manage the disruption. Uh, one of the first lessons we have learned, uh, although it sounds uh, counterintuitive and you might ask why do we need to frame AI or define AI is that the first thing needed um, uh, when uh, starting the journey on responsible AI is to understand what exactly do we mean by AI. A lot of our clients will develop a wide variety of technology. Some of them could be labeled as AI, but because the development happens in so many different parts of the organization, sometimes they're difficult for the, to them to grasp where do they draw the boundaries? How do they understand uh, the nature of those technology they build and are labeled as AI so that they can proceed in establishing the right governance and and, and risk mitigation techniques, knowing that uh, there is a, a, a huge difference in between deterministic and non-deterministic technologies like the one um, uh, Daniel spoke uh, spoke previously, um, and how those technologies are embedded or not in uh, 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 different types of, of processes and how critical those processes become for, for businesses. So the first lesson we have learned is the importance of framing, firming what AI is, with corresponding technologies um, and use cases that are currently being developed in each uh, organization per industry and use case and uh, value chain, but also um, how best to frame responsible AI to really account the fact that um, new governance structures are, are required. Um, AI brings uh, significant disruption within, within companies, hence um, the, the, how um, those solutions are managed well beyond uh, the proof of concepts uh, into, um, into a, a large scale uh, a, a adoption is, is really important. The second big lesson we have learned is that um, AI needs to be properly aligned with business processes and and not just with business processes, but more importantly, with the value one organization is set to deliver. Either is increasing efficiency at, uh, at the level of various processes or creating more values via more sources of revenue. It's really important to place AI within the value chain where, where it should be. And when we run a survey uh, a, across uh, different geographies to understand the perception of, of executives uh, on AI's role to enable or to deliver business strategy, uh, we understood that uh, the vast majority of, of them, um, uh, uh, close to 90%, uh, uh, were in fact um, building or thinking of planning uh, of, of building AI in accordance with their strategic objectives acknowledging that it's not just about being able to uh, rapidly innovate, but it's important to uh, keep an eye on the risk and balance the two. In fact, 59% uh, of those executives have told us that when uh, thinking about the opportunities with AI, they always put the risk in place and balance it out. 
the third lessons we have learned is that once we know what AI technology is developed and where, and how it's aligned to deliver a business outcome, it's really important to consider what capabilities organizations have in place to manage a technology as unique as AI. And we're not just talking about engineering capabilities, that we, we have seen how they grow and expand from uh, uh, primarily focused at first of data scientists into um, all sorts of um, other other technical roles from data engineers, machine learning DevOps, uh, machine learning engineers, so have you, into functions that are are now emerging stronger, also as a result of future regulatory uh, regulatory requirements that are coming into having proper uh, functions to allow for um, uh, uh, monitor and audit of those applications, especially when they 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 are uh, going from uh, proof of concepts into production, compliance function that are well prepared to understand future and and upcoming regulatory requirements from so many different geography, especially for the global company, is is going to be quite a bit of a challenge to harmonize those uh, those requirements that are coming not just from European Commission via the AI Act, but um, from the UK, from Asia, from um, various states within the US. Therefore, how do you understand uh, what are the, 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 the key regulatory requirements applicable for each use case and, and being able to embed that in the processes and policies? Also, very importantly, um, having the capacity, internal capacity, to address risk management. We have learned, for example, that um, uh, outside financial services, uh, the risk, man risk management is not um, uh, such a mature uh, 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 domain within organization. Hence, it's really important for, for organizations, small or large, um, uh, to consider their ability to manage risk, knowing that um, Risk, uh, the risk of AI are not only related to the technology itself, um, it's uh, related with uh, process um, risk infrastructure organization, and therefore it, it becomes critical for organization to, to, to make sure that they have the skill in the house, they have the expertise and policies and framework that allows them uh, to mitigate uh, those risks um, holistically, as, as David pointed out. And lastly, but um, uh, uh, not the last, is the ability for them to, to carry ethical assessment, to be able to judge the impact those tools have uh, 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 not on immediate uh, um, uh, horizon of use, but uh, above and beyond that, and understand uh, through the ethical lenses the, the shifting boundaries of responsibility uh, for for organization um, uh, in in regards with big societal problems like a change in job structure and nature, um, but also uh, um, uh, uh, their 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 um, uh, ability to 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 support uh, government and supranational organization in deal with a global level global scale um, issues. Having those capabilities uh, in siloed, uh, however, is not enough. Uh, organizational needs to start breaking those silos and being able to integrate them um, um, in their business uh, as it is, and, and really understand that AI is a technology is not uh, only poised to deliver value and um, create efficiencies within existing processes. This is uh, this is in fact a, 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 a mistake that many of our clients have made to, to think that AI is um, very useful to the level of uh, creating efficiency that that, that it, 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 it's it's so much desire in the current context, but is uh, AI ends, ends up disrupting completely that that process and that disruption needs to be managed that disruption needs to be understood either is um, a disruption at the process level or how uh, the, the job structure and the job nature understanding as David said that ultimately uh, AI and responsible AI uh, brings about a profound transformation within the businesses um, 
uh, uh, it's, it's really important. And while we acknowledge that many of our clients are dealing with a wide variety of, of priorities, and in fact, when we survey um, uh, the CEOs as we, we do every year for the past uh, 24 years, uh, uh, AI was not the priority for the last three years, as, as, as uh, um, um, uh, it, it should. We know that um, um, executive CAI now is, is a powerful enabler for not only allowing them to solve the current priorities in terms of um, um, economic recessions, climate change, uh, uh, or disruption caused by supply chain um, in the last two years, but also being able to grasp other opportunities. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to say in relation to responsible AI at enterprise level is that we we have seen a gradual um, journey towards uh, uh, um, um, a vision of responsible AI. It's not easy to um, uh, apply the principles of responsible AI uh, without causing too much of this disruption. So um, our our clients. Um, um, in most of the cases, have taken a more cautious approach and uh, integrating the disruption that's brought by AI within um, uh, the wider priorities of the firm. So uh, while we're not going to have, we're not going to see big bang, um, uh, 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 big banks or or uh, um, phenomenal um, uh, outcome or results uh, uh, triggered by, trigger by uh, huge transformation programs, what we see is incremental change that will uh, happen over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. For, for our last of the three uh, panelists, so again, sort of bringing her experience to bear, we have Sue McLean, uh, the partner of technology at Baker and McKenzie. Sue, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm not sure if anyone can see me because it's saying I can't share. Oh, here we go. Hopefully it's work. We can definitely hear you, Sue, so that that's the important thing. OK, well, I'll keep going. It's uh, It seems to think I'm already showing my webcam, but um, hopefully I can fix that when we come to the panel. So it's lovely to be here with you today. I'm just going to carry on. Um, I guess in a similar vein to Maria, in, in my role as a lawyer, we're, we're obviously advising clients who are developing, adopting and using AI in their businesses. And I think it's fair to say that we have seen a continued increased focus, uh, certainly over the last five years, um, but with momentum growing of companies who are really concerned about the use of AI and the responsible use of technology generally. And certainly it has become um, a significant business priority for many companies that are not tech companies. You know, it's not just a matter of legal and compliance risk, but a matter of commercial risk when it comes to be seen as a trusted and responsible organization. Um, but what does this mean in practice and what are companies actually doing? And I, and I thought that it might be helpful for me to touch on today what we're seeing from a practical perspective across our clients beyond you know, mere public engagement and um, sort of announcements in the space, but what are people practically doing? So I think the first thing, and and we've touched on this, is 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 the first thing they're doing is is saying, well, well, actually, what AI are we actually using now? Um, you know, over time, businesses, um, particularly large organisations with lots of different um, business units, are buying software and technology all the time. Um, and so for a company to really assess, you know, what, first of all, what do we, what do we mean? What do we define AI as? And then once we've done that, can we identify where we're using it and what we're using it for? Um, and how sophisticated the tools we're using are, um, and in particular, you know, what is the risk profile of those use cases? Um, and obviously partly this is driven by developments like the proposed AI regulation coming out of the EU, but companies wanting to understand very much, are we using any applications of AI that could be considered high risk um, and that we really need to start thinking about more carefully um, the, the issues that, that might be triggered um, in connection with, with those tools? 
so in effect carrying out audits of of ai use um and so i i think in, in some ways you can see it sort of as the new gdpr particularly because of the proposed regulation that's been um, um coming out of the eu companies you know facing higher uh, levels of obligation and liability and risk around um the use of, of this technology so um, and that and that regulation will require companies to know and have appropriate governance in place in respect of their use of AI. So we are starting to see, although that law, you know, still got a long way to go, may end up changing uh, a fair bit because of industry pressure. Um, we are seeing companies trying to get their sort of house in order. Um, and they know not just, you know, it's not just a legal and, and regulatory issue. Customers and other stakeholders will ask, uh, you know, and, and continue to, 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 to push companies to explain how AI forms part of uh, their services and, and, and be sort of transparent and clear about some of the implications of that. So I think it's the other point is obviously it's we're talking about a whole ecosystem here. We'll have some companies who are creating AI. Uh, we'll have a lot of companies who are using AI and, and some that are doing a bit of both. You know, they're developing tools internally, but they're also partnering or acquiring um ai technology from third parties and so the way i see it is when it comes to governance and what most of our clients who are focused on this space are thinking about is at sort of at three different levels there's the principal level the operational level um, and then the contractual level um, and so i thought i'd just take each of those in, in turn so at the principal level um, we are seeing, as sort of Maria um, referred to, you know, organisations have been pretty siloed um, in the past and remain pretty siloed by, by their nature, particularly large multinational organisations. But given the focus on this area, they know they need to try and bring together um, oversight and expertise across the organisation. So we're seeing more and more clients create data and digital teams to bring together the, the range of stakeholders and expertise you need to think about these issues um, at a broader level uh, and to make sure that there is that kind of collaboration and oversight across the organization. We're also seeing, and, and I think probably everyone on the phone has seen so many um, of these announcements around ethical principles, ethical frameworks, charters, um, lots of companies trying to sort of set out their stool of what, what to them is important to be thinking about when it comes to the use of this technology. Personally, I, I don't particularly like the reference to ethical. I think it, it is un, not necessarily helpful given ethics means different things to different people and different organizations, but it is around this sense of uh, being responsible around the use of the technology. And I think as David, you know, discussed, there are really very common themes here. You know, it's it's discussing issues of transparency and fairness and trust and dignity and privacy and freedom and diversity. And, you know, a lot of these principles, it's very hard to, to argue with them. These are common sense principles, not just, you know, can we do this technologically, but are we allowed to do it legally? But going beyond that, should we do it though? What is the impact? If we don't want to cause harm, you know, are we aware of who could be impacted by the use of this tech and any vulnerable groups? And and, and how do we try to navigate um, those kinds of issues? And, and, and ultimately acknowledging that, as we, we heard before, it's not, you know, it's not the tech. Ultimately, it's around the human agency and oversight over how companies use the tech. Um, so I, again, I think we're, we're continuing to see those um, kinds of really high level considerations around the technology. And then for some organizations, but I think this is still, you know, this is still certainly not uniform, but a number of organizations, particularly organizations perhaps that have more likelihood of using high risk type AI solutions, the creations of what are being described as sort of a, ethics boards or advisory committees, whether that's made up of internal people or a mixture of internal or external, um, to help companies consider particularly problematic issues or key issues they need to think about in relation to their use and adoption of AI and development of those ethical principles. 
but I think that's certainly, you know, a lot of companies, some companies kind of rushed to do that and then weren't quite sure how to, to make them fit into the sort of organizational structure. Others are sort of considering it. Um, but ultimately it is around bringing together the right people to make decisions around how to adopt and use this tech. Then, then there's the operational level. Um, and I think that's, as we've heard before, that's the really challenging piece of this. It, it may be difficult to come up with a set of ethical guidelines or principles, but actually the really tough part in a large organization is how to best put those principles into practice, um, how to ensure an effective risk management system around, um, around AI. And so we're seeing you know, a range of, of approaches to this, but ultimately it is around building in responsible technology by design, uh, building it into processes and procedures and training, um, whether that's around uh, data quality, um, documenting how, how explainable the, the AI tool and solution is, and also building in oversight and record keeping requirements. And certainly in organizations where they're using or developing hardware that has embedded AI in it, which comes with, um, you know, more concerns around physical harm. Um, you know, how are we going to deal with product recall and remedies if problems arise, if the AI, um, you know, doesn't do what it, what it was expected to do or it changes or more sort of issues that arise later that we weren't expecting. But I agree with, I think, the thrust of what we're hearing from um, the other speakers in that it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a whole new set of processes and tools. And actually that could be counterproductive in, in, in getting best practice really operationalized in the business. Um, it can be much more straightforward and effective to simply add on AI considerations to what you already have if you have some decent internal governance around innovation uh, projects. Um, and many organizations, including in the regulated space, will have very strict legal and compliance structures already. And it's effectively looking at those and saying, well, what do we need to add or improve to reflect this type of technology uh, compared to all the existing software and other technologies we use in the business? Um, and I think it's also, like we've seen with GDPR, um, it's being able to show the story of how you've really you know, been very mindful of the risks you've identified the risks and you've mitigated the risks. Um, and, you know, if a problem arises or the regulator comes knocking that you can show that you have been thoughtful and sensible and taken the right kind of measures to, to resolve and mitigate any problems that could arise. But I think also like GDPR, it's, it's, and I think this is widely accepted now really, that it's not just, it's not a legal and compliance issue. Right. It's it's in order to be a responsible developer or user of AI, this these principles of good practice really need to be embedded across all the relevant stakeholders from the you know engineers and developers up. Um, it's a sort of mindset and a culture as much as a, as a process or a procedure that's going to make sure that people are being sensible and responsible around the use of, of technology. And then lastly, I wanted to sort of look on the contractual level um, and that's because given given what we're seeing at least you know a lot of companies um, they're not you know every company's a tech company they say these days but you know a lot of companies that it's not their it's not their primary business but they're they're using and acquiring and developing AI um, with third parties and so a lot of companies also looking as looking at their sort of supply chain for technology um, as part of this and understanding where AI comes in um, and looking at how do they make sure that they have the right contractual arrangements in place um, to mitigate any risks that might arise. So looking again at, you know, contract templates, whether you're a customer or, or a supplier to say, you know, does this, is this still fit for purpose? If it's an AI solution, is it a different relationship between us as partners? Are there different issues we need to think about ahead of time to avoid problems down the line and to make sure that what we're developing and creating is as, um, as responsible and compliant as possible. Um, and so <clears throat> this does come into play also when negotiating contracts between vendors and customers. Um, 
and I think it's fair to say up to now, actually, we haven't quite yet seen um, too much change, um, particularly for sort of more straightforward AI, you know, um, or AI described solutions. The focus has tended to be around things like the use of data and intellectual property issues. Um, but of course, um, and especially with more sophisticated AI solutions, there are questions around responsibility and liability. Um, who is responsible for what? Whether it's the inputs, the development of the algorithm, or who monitors um, who monitors the system going forward, and who's liable for decisions made by the solution. Um, but we're not yet seeing particularly, you know, sort of warranties or commitments around compliance with ethical standards or commitments around bias um, explicitly called out. Um, I think, and, and we're also not seeing sort of explicitly um, as commonplace, um, explicit commitments around compliance with certain standards or guidelines. I think we're still in the place where we're more likely to see sort of general compliance with law, general compliance with good industry practice warranties in contracts. But as standards develop um, and law develops in this area um, and companies start using more sophisticated AI, then I certainly expect to see more bespoke provisions coming into contracts around this area. You know, we've 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 seen this, for example, around ESG commitments, a lot of talk, a lot of standards. But actually, it's only kind of now where it's much more mature that we're starting to see sort of standard provisions being seen in contracts as de facto requirements. Um, so I think we'll probably see the same in this space in due course. Uh, and then obviously the last point is that that's that's all kind of the behind the scenes. But obviously, um, companies very focused and really as an extension of of their consumer protection and data protection and compliance, but looking at how how to properly explain some of this stuff to the users if it's a consumer application. How is the data being used? How are the AI solutions being used? How do we explain this to the audience uh, in as clear and transparent a way as possible? Um, which I think is a continued journey that everyone's going on. We've got a lot of experience from GDPR, um, but that's gonna continue to be really important so that we get the, the the, the trust, the trust of the user community as we continue to deploy some of these solutions. And I'll hand Thank back you very to much. Him. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, if we could all turn our cameras on, please, and Sue, you can get, if you can get yours to work as well, it'd be great. Um, so we've got about um, 18 or so minutes to sort of, um, sort of deal with some of the, some of the questions, some of the fantastic um, points that you've all brought up. Um, and one of the first things that sort of strikes me through all um, three of those presentations is the fact that, particularly for larger firms, things like compliance, risk management, governance are generally well embedded. And things like uh, explainability, um, ethics panels for most firms, quite new things to deal with. So I just wanted to get the view from the three of you as to how well organizations are managing the balance of being responsible and using AI and not just stopping projects before they happen because they are too concerned about the outcomes or they can't properly assess them. Um, Maria, do you have a, have a view on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Tim. Um, um, I, it depends very much on the organization. What we have found is that larger organization that will tend to have a stronger focus on compliance and the compliance and risk mitigation um, capabilities they have helped them uh, at least with a part of the uh, issues raised by development and use of AI at least from an engineering perspective of course there are there are issues uh, very much related to um, uh, fairness and bias and explainability but we have seen um, uh, executives becoming more aware and more educated about those issues and being able at least to experiment being able to um, uh, look at uh, starting this journey either by updating their risk uh, a risk and control framework or developing policy. Um, I've been involved in a number of projects helping clients develop uh, AI and digital ethics policy 
um, uh, that uh, in a way not only guarantees that companies will speak and uh, will have a unified language when, when addressing ethical issues, but um, it's a starting point of, of uh, unifying various policies that exist. Companies will have data privacy, information management, and all the other types of policy already in place. So therefore, it's not a matter of reinventing the wheel, it's understanding what exists in the house and being able to use that and build on top of it and only address um, the new issues that AI brings before we even start talking about disruption and transformation and, and, and both Davy and Sue has pointed out, executives tend to be a little bit not just cautious, but when, when, when you bring the world transformation or transformative in any single function is a little bit intimidating because that means we're going to invest a lot before we see any results. We need to wait for those changes to make effect, especially in large organization. So it's a matter of balancing, um, uh, 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 balancing an, uh, an, an assessment of what exists and can be repurposed, can be adapted before we uh, add new additions or uh, we, we start changing how we operate. So do you have a view on that as well? Yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, I don't know. I don't know. The text not letting me let, letting me join you. So I'm sorry, you can't see my face. But um, yeah, I, I think it's right. I think there's the, there's the sort of big picture. There's the, the strategic, uh, particularly for the companies that want to use or develop AI. It's 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 making sure the right stakeholders, I think, are right there at the beginning. Because what we do see, and I don't think this is specific to AI actually, it's true around a lot of use of data type um, applications, is um, people people getting a fair way down the road without having brought in the right stakeholders. And, and so we see some organizations develop technology for, for a long time, actually, you know, for maybe like 12 months. Um, and, and it hasn't kind of found its way into the right governance channels. And then when it does, when they want to move, say, from a really proof of, of concept of a particular technology into more like a pilot stage and start using real life data, the, that the compliance and legal folks go, but 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 what about this and what about this and have you thought about this and how would customers react to this? Um, and and because of the lack of diversity in the team, you know, it's it's been kind of a closed group and they've all been very excited about the opportunities. They haven't really thought about the potential um, adverse um, reaction to the use of that technology in that way, and they and they haven't really understood that although we have no new AI laws yet particularly in, in a lot of jurisdictions, we still have existing law and it's not a vacuum. So I think the key thing is right, right from the beginning, figuring out who should be in my team, um, not to be barriers, but to be actually enablers and also not to waste time because you have to undo stuff later on because you haven't really thought about who the right, you know, had the right people in the room at the design sort of stage. David, anything else you want to add to that discussion? I mean, the, both of those answers are real comprehensive. Uh, I, I might just say, um, if we sort of step back and take the really wide angle kind of view of it, I, I mean, we're it, the the journey. I think is 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 just in a sense beginning now. I, I think that you know, six five six years ago, we still lived in an era of it being acceptable to kind of move fast and break things and. There, there was there there was a sense that it was important um, at both the large corporate but also SME level to consider um, issues of responsible innovation as it related to data driven technologies but it was more of an anarchy of, of lots of frameworks and ethics guidelines and and whatnot um, you know you had initiated in in 2016 you had the the BS 8611 BSI's uh, initial ethics kind of ethics and robotics uh, standard, which was actually ground, groundbreaking in a sense because it, it sort of started a conversation about how we could establish a, a, a richer standards environment so that um, companies both big and small could have a little bit more certainty, right? When it came to determining, just as Sue was saying, determining those principles that actually should should guide practices within operationalizing, you know, responsible innovation as they're it, they're going through procurement and also um, uh, design processes. So I, th I think just to say, I, we are in the more recent years moving towards having a little bit more certainty. There's a thicker kind of conversation in the standards environment about 
this uh, element of trustworthy AI, responsible AI. We know that in, in the US uh, instance, you know, the NIST is doing this, uh, this framework for a kind of uh, responsible uh, research management, risk management. And uh, and here uh, in the the you know the UK and 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 the EU context, we have the AI uh, EU reg, and we have the work of the Council of Europe that's going to try to you know establish some standards. So just to say, I think that we will have more statutory and regulatory certainty, and act and and absolutely have more operationalizable standards in the coming years. Um, and 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 so I think if we if we see ourselves at this point where these things are coming. Uh, in general, I think um, in the UK specifically, we've been in an advantageous position because there, this this has been something um, that ha this conversation has been something that's been um, taken up um, by both large corporations and SMEs. So I think I think we're we're on a we're we're on the way. Uh, we're not we're not we're not mature, but we're on the way. Uh, and. Also, I'd like to request anyone online, please submit your questions as well. I'm going to take one of the questions that came through from actually Steph's session earlier. And I think um, all of you have also touched on this one, but it'd be good to get your perspectives. The question is, whose responsibility is it to make sure AI avoids bias? The contractor developing software, the company buying using AI in the end product, the government, individual consumers choosing which products to use? Um, I mean, where do you think the responsibility sits particularly some of the previous points about um about software changing as well I mean, david do you want to come in on that one first yeah i think um to to sort of reach back and, and grab something sue said i think this idea of kind of responsible innovation by design um is a starting point to think about a kind of end-to-end -end, uh, accountability or end-to-end -end responsibility so we all know that um, these are very these can be very complex processes of designing, developing, and deploying. It may be that part of a system is procured from a vendor. It may be that um, the entire system is procured, and so those who are using it don't have the direct contact with the innovation lifecycle. There are all sorts of um, complexities that surround what we might think of, or what's been called in in the in the academic literature, distributed responsibility. Um, that being said, I think. It is, at the end of the day, from the production side of things, important to um, establish an end-to-end -end, uh, or comprehensive chain of human accountability so that those who are making decisions at any kind of touch point along the way can be um, called to account for the reasoning behind those decisions, the rationale behind the decisions, the ways in which bias mitigation um, was actually operating at, at any at any juncture of procurement or design. And so on the production side, I think that that, that just means having good transparent uh, processes and practices, um, having explicit bias mitigation uh, protocols that are taken up by whoever it is that are dealing with data models or, or, or any type of testing validation uh, and deployment. Um, and then on the, on the enforcement or auditing uh, third party uh, oversight side, we, we, we do need an upskilled um, uh, labor force, both on the regulatory end, but also in terms of, of those who are with are, who have do domain knowledge and, and, and actually can be brought into um, innovation environments uh, to assess whether or not issues of fairness, bias, equity and discrimination have been sufficiently considered. Um, there are there is an, an interdisciplinary expertise that's needed um, that goes beyond I think the production side that needs to be integrated into it. So um, for Maria and Sue, and how far along the line do you think we are to that point where there is that uh, whole chain of responsibility in place? And are, and are, is, it, is it currently an issue, or is it still um, the theoretical stage? It is an issue as we reassess the roles and responsibilities of data scientists and product owners and um, business owners. But while I, I, I like the idea of distributed responsibility, the degree of that responsibility needs to be very well clarified. That's how businesses operate. That, that most businesses um, <laughs> Uh, operate uh, on a high precision, uh, high precision basis because they have a 
very well defined set of yearly objectives they 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 are pushing towards so therefore in that context we need to be very much aware whose responsibility in each specific case and i was reflecting the other day on one of my client projects about ai in hr and the fact that in fact ai in hr it seems to be the hottest um uh, topical debate in the field of AI within the enterprise is because we know um, historically the, the, the HR processes will carry a certain degree of bias from different reasons. So especially when you look at recruitment, the using AI in recruitment, that's probably the hairiest stories is we know that the, the data that was supposed to train those, those algorithms is historically biased. So how do you avoid that and what sort of a technical um, uh, innovation you'll use it to uh, overcome the problem of historical bias in recruitment data and that's not an easy technical fix in, a, in the same time requires a, a lot of business decision to be made right when 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 we're looking at the fact that fairness is a social construct and each each individual each individual use case will have a certain um, uh, fairness that is negotiated among the, the key stakeholders. The next level is down is how do we translate that social construct into a mathematical formula? At the moment, we have about 28 or 29 fairness definition. Which one, which contradict to each other? Which one is the best to choose and who makes the choice? And what are the trade-offs when you make different choices? And this is, again, it's a partnership in between a owner, product owner, business owner, and a data scientist who will understanding intricate technical details that 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 exist about so uh to david's point and kudos to the work uh, uh, his team and and others in research are doing to actually bring that research closest to us in 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 in, in companies and being able to really understand it and apply it you know many of our companies will not afford to have research unit as a big tech company so we rely heavily on the work david and and his fellows are doing in order to pick up the latest trends the newest definition on fairness and how to actually make it work in a context as 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 challenging as let's say hr uh, ai in hr specifically recruitment thank you uh, yeah. and so do you mind if i take a slightly different approach to the, sure. and the question that come in that um because you also mentioned about the fact that there's existing uh, legislation regulation in place and we've had this question come in which is how do you think we could better differentiate between positive and negative bias not all bias is unethical but how do we determine that and obviously i think that relates back well, to yeah, the I, yeah i mean i think that, that that that's that's a really important question and one that always crosses my mind whenever we talk about bias you know there is discrimination that's allowed right um, in in certain applications so um it, it these words are kind of all a bit loaded depending on, on the way we're talking about them but when we're talking about bias we're generally saying that there's an unfair outcome which is based on some inherent adverse bias in the data so i agree with the others in that it's about figuring out as much as possible through each element of the process how do we mitigate for what is un undoubtedly those are going to be these, these these biases in the data set and in the people creating the technology um and so identifying the risk at each at, at each stage is important but then the really important bit is at the end that these systems as much as possible are subject to human oversight so if it's an hr system actually an ai tool is likely to have less bias in it than real people if you designed it properly but there's still a risk of bias so it, it, it's all about training and putting in the right processes for the people that are using that tool to not be um you know to not take it as read that, that there is no bias in the system it's just a tool right it's been designed by people how do we make sure that we we mitigate for any bias that's left in at the end um, and if some, you know, do auditing, do testing and think, well, that looks like the wrong outcome. So if that's the wrong outcome, that's a biased outcome, where, what, how do we then go back and fix it? But also we make decisions that don't just simply rely on what the computer is telling us. We, we, we are thoughtful about the out output. So I think it's, it's important to, to be clear about what we're talking about. But then, yeah, there's different stages of the process. Um, and the human oversight and agency is really important to remember that these are tools it's what we do with them that leads to decision making in, in a lot of cases and we have to be training people to be thoughtful about yeah d 
don't just say computer says this, but say, oh, well, why did they say that? We need to go back to the drawing board because that's not the right outcome. That's that's a harmful outcome for for the particular individuals that would be affected. Just thank you very much. And just, I think just one sort of final question. We're obviously there is existing regulation and law. We're on a certain journey around regulation. We've got the EU AI Act coming. It's working in the states already. Um, we have the AI governance white paper coming. How close do you think we are, all three of you, to actually having at least regulatory certainty around um, the use of responsible AI? And how much further do you think we need to go? Just a, sort of briefly from all three of you. Uh, Maria, would you like to go first, please? Um, thank you. I think that's a very interesting question. And looking at the uh, the insight we are getting uh, from all different regulators via our global network, is definitely regulators have, as most of us have, have upgraded their knowledge about AI. Some have took it a more vertical approach to our regulation, either more horizontal, either a a combination um, uh, and it looks like the UK government go, wants to go in this uh, towards this hybrid approach but speaking from the perspective of companies again um, everyone is starting to prepare for those regulations I, I think the fact we've seen that regulatory requirements the future regulatory requirements very much align so nicely with the key ethical themes is a good news for many companies and we are helping them to understand um, the importance of et having ethical principles and policy in being prepared for regulation and with everything we discussed about bias you know um, and responsibility regulation will take um, a regulation will address some responsibility in those um, holistic biased approach and will say you really have to consider this level of 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 of, of uh, fairness like the four fifth uh, that's being used in, in the us in certain very specific use cases so i think that's a good news is the fact there's much more alignment and the possibility to connect those different dots that we originally think it's just a matter of helping organization to navigate that see how everything connects um, and the fact that we are working all towards the same goal, uh, believe it or not, we all want uh, to have safer uses of technology that actually align with human goals. Therefore, how can we see the role each individual's institutions from regulators, policymakers, standards and everything that we we are doing in our uh, respective organization will contribute to achieving that goal. And if we fail to achieve it, how do we learn and how do we improve next time? And one thing that I wanted to stress, I think we need to start talking more about failure in AI. It's really important for us to embrace it and not be afraid. And and while we say, yes, but those use cases have been terrible for uh, misuses of AI algorithms, we have seen are terrible for a lot of people that have been um, penalized uh, by misuse of technology, I would say definitely, but there's also an opportunity for us to learn that lesson and never do it again. Thank you. Let's think, talk about failure as well, not just uh, not just about successes or avoiding failure, because we need to learn and we need to have the courage to progress for, forward. And the only way to do it is to do it in a safe way. Thank you, Maria. I think that's the, the perfect point to, to end on today. Um, thank you again for all our speakers. So Sue, Maria and uh, David, uh, we're going to have a short break now. So we're back in 12 minutes time at 11.25. Thank you very much. And welcome back to the BSI conference, Digital the World Artificial Intelligence. I'm Tim McGar, um, Sector Lead for Digital for BSI. And we'll now come back to our first of two presentations uh, prior to the next break. So if you get the slides up, please. Yeah. So our first speaker talking about lifting the lid on incorporating AI is Sam Hill. CTO of VP of Technology for Wild Brain. Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tim. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yep. No. Oh, good. You can never quite tell that one. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, welcome. I'm going to talk to you through sort of like the journey to incorporating AI within a variety of different organizations, actually, and talk about the steps needed and then give an example of how we've done that at Wild Brain today. Um, so the journey to AI, it's been one that's been going on for four centuries, I would say, since the first industrial revolution back in the 1800s when the invention of steam trains and mechanization, people have always been trying to find better ways of doing things and technology has 
evolved and revolutionized through electricity, communications came along, computers and mechanization last century. And now all of that is coming together really in the 21st century with digital intelligence, where it's how can we really utilize all of those precursors and sort of automate and improve our world? And it's gonna be fascinating to see where that goes because we're quite early still in the 21st century and it's interesting to see how the technology does develop. So why now? Well, every business seems to have a big AI desire at the moment, it seems. And we do have this big digital intelligence revolution going on. Market data has shown that the demand for businesses for AI and ML technologies has grown really dramatically. But it's predicted to be about 40 billion in 2027. And then the spend on AI um, through auto ML technologies, so that's where you sort of use a platform as a service that can do AI for you, was 600 million last year. And it's gonna go 10 times bigger than that, at least to about 5 billion over the next five years. So loads and loads of potential there from lots of businesses to spend a lot of money to really grow into this space. Um, so what's changed? Why are people looking to do this now? Well, firstly, cloud computing. The ability to access really cheap, scalable, on-demand computing instances. You've got Azure, you've got AWS, you've got Google and others. So the need for using supercomputers to process big data sets and then draw out inferences and all the rest of it has now gone. And those cloud platforms are getting more reliable, more performant and better every day. The um, availability of data is the second thing. So AI and ML, it's kind of impossible to do without data. It's kind of the foundation underpinning of it all. Um, businesses have always had loads of data available, but the ability to get much more data and store it has now vastly improved with lots of big data technologies and the ability to sift through that and find the things that matter. And thirdly, availability of people who can actually understand data. Back in the last century, when I started out working in AI and ML, although it was known as cybernetics for me back then, it was really rather niche. Um, back in 1999, it was estimated as only 2,000 people globally who had the skill sets to work in what we would describe as AI and ML now. And in practice, the job title of data scientist didn't really exist until about 2006. Estimates are about the 65,000 people today globally who've got the right sort of skill sets and data knowledge to be data scientists. And there's about 11,000 who are working today as data scientists. And that number is actually doubling every two years. So that's a good skill set of people out there now who businesses can tap into and utilize and it's ever growing who can really help to understand that data. Oops. So, hi, I'm Sam Hill. Um, I started out in technology way back in 1992, writing computer games for the Amiga. Um, and I've been involved in lots of big organizations, designing solutions and problems to use and maximize the value from data. Currently at Wildbrain, and I'll talk to you a bit more about who Wildbrain are a bit later on. Um, but I lead a team of data scientists, data analysts, engineers, and product people, and we're trying to do some really clever things with data. But before that, my journey's included working at Tesco, Marks and Spencer's, and BBC. However, my interest in AI started last century. Um, I was doing my PhD in this area around creating what, what was called a, well, a virtual body back then, or an artificial agent, where well, the phrasing hadn't really been coined then, um, for human computer action, interaction. Think of it like Alexa, but it's 15 years before Alexa was launched. And it was about utilizing neural networks, which I had to build by hand back then, because there was no technologies out there to do it to try and interpret what people were asking a computer to do and then perform the actions accordingly based on what those people wanted to achieve. Um, it was a focus then, it was about diversity and inclusion, allowing computers where people had disabilities, so mobility particularly, who couldn't necessarily interact with a computer keyboard and mouse, finding a way for them to well, engage into where the world was going at that turn of the century. I learned loads from it, but now pretty much all the technologies I had to hand crank and build by scratch, or off the shelf now. And 21 years later, it's been fascinating to see how that journey's changed. If you want to learn about it though, the papers are still available online, although they are quite out of date, you can hug you. Um, I like this quote now from uh, James Tagg. Artificial intelligence, like an artificial plant, it gives many of the same benefits, but it's not the really thing. And I think it summarizes really where AI is today, but I would go one step further and say, that true AI is all but impossible today. Something I've learned over 21 years working in this space. Marketing love to label everything as smart or AI these days, but in practice, nothing really is. It's as good as the algorithms and models created. 
and it, it can't perform outside of its training set. If you take any smart AI thing that exists today, take a self-driving car, take the logic within it, or a smart heating system, whatever. If you put that into a robot and put that robot in front of a sink and ask it to do the washing up, it can't because that's going outside of the boundaries of its programming and currently it never will. Whereas humans can adapt to those new environments and new problem spaces like no AI technology today can. There's lots and lots of you know, different sets of AI technologies out there and machine learning things that can teach computers to learn new patterns and use neural networks to solve much and many different things, but they're all small parts of the problem. And I'd love us to get to that point where AI does actually exist, but at the moment we're quite a long way from that. And with that bold sort of view presented, as a follow-up, I'd sort of say machine learning though, and that AI subset that is machine learning, really does help and solve modern problems today using models and algorithms. And with training, you can learn and create some really clever stuff and doing stuff that's really good, really achievable. Um, smart devices that are filling up homes everywhere, they can learn our behaviours, they learn our routines. Um, they can adapt accordingly, such as knowing when we enter a room and turning the heating on before we go in, because it knows what time we're likely to go into that room. Or similarly, turning the lights on and off when we're moving about the house. And as our behaviours change over time, then those routines and responses learn and adapt. And this level of AI technology can be really useful for businesses of any size. As various statistics sort of show, if you apply machine learning to a data lake, you can improve the data efficiency by 28%. What I mean by that is you can optimise what the data is, where the data is, you can assess the data quality and understanding of that data and spot trends and outliers far more usefully than um, any human can because of the scale and the volume of that needle in the haystack problem. Computers can more or less solve in analysing ploughing through data and machine learning techniques are very good at sort of mining data sets and similarly data analytics overall that understanding of data becomes 47 percent more effective because you can filter out the noise and the mess around the edge and that really becomes useful for businesses so how can businesses incorporate ai and ml well there's five steps i would say on the journey and let me just take them through them first step is choosing where to aim too often businesses don't really consider the right problems. They don't ask how will doing this actually help? Um, why, why are we going to do this? What's the value returned? How can I get return on the investment? Using AI ML, it's not cheap. Too often it costs more to implement than pro the problem that is solved. I've seen time and time again, the problems are just simply too big. They're kind of aiming for the moon rather than apples. So first thing is really start small with something with value. And here's a set of sort of good examples of different problem areas where you can really make a difference. Anything that is repetitive can really benefit from having ML applied, automate and make decisions from it. Things that have trends and predictable shapes to help them too. Chatbots, they're not great yet, but they can solve predictable problems and allow a level of human-based interaction. I still think my virtual bodies project that I mentioned earlier from 20 years ago, better at uh, actually human computer chat interaction, but still, um, I'm reminiscing there. The cost savings though are big, even from just using a chatbot, because you don't need necessarily a person and the wage costs and the technology costs to go with that to answer commonly asked FAQ type questions. And people can do that in a more natural way through typing and interacting with chat, and you can drop out to a human when you need to, and that can make contact centers far more efficient. Similarly, computers can scale much better than people and solve much more complicated problems. Delivery optimization is a really good one on that along with recommendations engines that uh, e-commerce websites use all the time, and other things like security. So outage prevention, spotting the trends and behaviors when things are operating outside of normality, and same with financial monitoring, monitoring accounts utilization, and that sort of thing. My second step, it's about avoiding those difficult areas. It kind of builds on the first one, but there are things that ML really just doesn't do well, at all, if at all yet. So while it might be a big problem area, creating software, hiring software engineers can be a bit of a challenge. It's not one really today that our AI machine learning can do. Um, they're all creative areas, the creative processes, they require imagination. And AI ML really just doesn't have imagination today. Um, I've seen many, I'm sure you have too, auto copywriting machine learning systems that will create press releases, that will create um, social media posts based on other data sets. And you can spot them a mile away. The content, the output from them, it's not really inspiring and it doesn't captivate audiences. 
in the practice, they often don't lead to sales, which is the point of marketing materials. So whilst AI and ML models can and do do a good um, job of analysing data, um, particularly say in hospitals where they can analyse scans and are very good actually in detecting cancer now, some cases better than humans are, um, I wouldn't necessarily want that same machine learning to be deciding if cancer treatment should be given to a patient or not. And those ethical choices of outcomes perhaps still better sit with people. Step three, once you've found a good problem area, a good target, it's good to decide how you're going to solve it actually and have a plan. Um, there's lots of different ways you can do it, partnerships, using your own people internally, working with consultants, collaborating with others, and you mentioned it earlier, auto ML and other off-the-shelf solutions are really good in that regard. Um, but once you've chosen a way to do it, it's probably best to sp stick with it and see a problem through as it takes time to actually implement and see an outcome you can measure. And if you chop and change or think, oh, it's not working well after a week or so, then you end up actually just spending a lot of money and not getting much out. And don't forget, people really need to be involved as part of measuring any implementation. Step four, and it's so often forgotten this one, um, don't forget to train and retrain the models. It's taking the obvious really, but you can't just train an AML model once. And so many people do that. They get their data sets, they load it into an ML, and it's created a set of outcomes and interpretations from that data. That data though is always continually changing. So you need to continually be training and updating your models. And in fact, it's never finished. Models always have to be continually learning. Data goes out of date so quickly, and those feedback loops are really important to keep machines actually giving valid recommendations, for example, in a shopping search engine. You've got an engine that always suggests people who buy this product buy that product, think of it on, on Amazon. If everyone's always buying the second suggested product from that list and not the first, and you need to feed that data back into the model so it adjusts the priority and the reorder it gives those results out because it needs to learn from its recommendations which ones actually matter to the target. And it always comes good to keep a training set back to validate models after you've tested them with known expected outcomes. Otherwise, how do you know if your models work? And finally, really, do look at the outcomes and see if they actually are helping or hindering the business. Is it actually doing things faster? Is it getting better results? Is it doing things better than people could? And can it then be automated? And if it can't, then learn from it and then move forwards. Um, one of the speakers in the last session mentioned this one, actually in terms of the word failure, but I'll be a bit more generous to just sort of say it's expect to make mistakes, many of them. You can spend months actually cleaning, cleansing data, training models, optimizing it, and then once you've finished all that, you still discover it doesn't actually work or solve the problem, and you end up having to abandon it. Doing this um, journey is not cheap. It's not easy to do well, and yes, there's lots of off-the-shelf auto ML models, you still need people to interpret them, you still need to understand and look at the implementation of them, and it all comes down to the quality of your data. Here's an example from my past, back in when I worked at Tesco. So Tesco, it uses an awful lot of machine learning models to automate a huge number of different activities, delivery route planning for the delivery vans, the several hundred thousand drop points for those, I think one of the earlier speakers mentioned that. Um, and actually the more trickier problem that Tesco has within the online shopping space is finding the most efficient order to pick items for a customer from the supermarket floor. You've probably all seen those little trolleys going around with their six, uh, 12 trays on them and the pickers fighting almost it feels like with the customers to grab products off the shelf. They don't just go randomly around the shop floor. It's actually sort of like that classic traveling problem, but it's in multiple dimensions because it has to consider weight, volumes, item locations, um, who, which customers order sort of um, groups of products together. It's a really hard problem to solve and machine learning is done and used and utilized at Tesco for that. But early iterations that I've sort of implemented when I was there were big failures. And it wasn't due to computing power or the ability to create the algorithms to do the problems. It's actually down to poor quality data. We explain the photos. The first one probably speaks for itself. All the other items in those trays are frozen except for the toilet roll, and toilet rolls have been misclassified as a frozen item, which perhaps is useful after a spicy curry, not that useful for people when they're shopping in their deliveries. Um, and the second one, you know, the person is holding their head in despair, um, each tray, for context, can hold 15 kilograms of weight. Um, there was a data error that led to a single apple was being classified as weighing 12 kilograms, as opposed to about 12 grams. I think 120 grams. 
So the picker was sent to go and just pick six apples and place one in each tray for a different customer's order because of the weight challenge and how it's um, split that out. And spotting data like errors like this, you can laugh about them, but it's not as easy as you might think because other retail systems wouldn't necessarily have problems from those data. And it's only when the people get involved and you get that feedback loop of this product is misclassified, that you can actually do it. You can build ML models to actually spot outliers and data sets. We still need people to evaluate and fix those. So incorporating AI and Wildbrain, let me give you a very brief case study in the journey we've been doing at Wildbrain. And I'll start off with the probably most important slide of all, who is Wildbrain? Because you've probably not heard of us, but we're a multinational, we're big independent, stock market listed kids entertainment and brands company. We're actually headquartered over in Canada, um, in Toronto. Um, but here's some statistics about us. Um, one in three kids globally watch our content on the various platforms that we're on. Um, and we have an awful lot of content, we've got over 8,000 hours of content in the library and 500 different brands and they're the characters and things like that. So, and we produce, I think about 20 different series and shows every year from our 1,100 animators who work over in Vancouver. So it's a big company that produces content, a bit like Disney, but a bit smaller and more targeted in what it does, you can see. Um, and if I showed you a selection of our brands, you probably recognize a few of those. And the kids do too. And the kids watching these brands generates over 4 billion content views every month. So that's views of telling us which programs, which shows, which country, what they watched. And to give a bit of context to that, and the broadcasting journey more widely, children's and kids and adults too, but kids are slightly ahead of the curve, behavior is really changing. Like many industries, massive transitional journey has how people adapt and utilize technology. It's really changing how we do things. Not that long ago, everyone would sit down and watch what was known as linear TV. That is, you turn the TV on and you watch whatever the schedule was, you watch BBC One at seven o'clock and you know which programs it was and that's kind of how people watched. And that still does happen, but it's in dramatic decline, particularly in the children's space. Um, and examples of SBOD, that's an example of that would be Netflix and AVOD would be YouTube, just to give it a clarity to what those two others are. And that's where the audience has switched and the audience in fact now is in complete control. People choose what to watch on TV, they choose when they watch it, and in reality, kids, with the exception of CBBS in the UK, just don't watch linear TV. They'll grab any device, phone, a mobile um, tablet, um, computer, the TV with the integrated players in it, and they just create their own schedule. And they often watch the same shows on repeat. And they've got their favorites and choices, and they like to sort of choose what they watch and how they watch it, which is all great. Our challenge at Wildbrain is, and it's a bit of a moon-sized problem, this one, understanding who is our audience. And the obvious answer from what I just said is kids, but it's not that simple. We want to know who they really are. And by that, I mean, how do we inspire them? How do we create new content that resonates with them and is relevant to them and helps their, as our catchphrase is, imagination to run the world. And to do that, we actually do still need to learn who they are, which is much harder than you might think. Um, you may not have heard of this, but COPPA, or the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule, has been around for about 20 years. Um, it's a US law, but because of the US market and the nature of the businesses, it applies globally, and it makes it completely illegal, rightly, I would say, to track and monitor anyone under the age of 13. So that rules all children out. So you can't um, look at what they're doing, what they're watching, how they're behaving, and certainly can't know who any of them are. Um, YouTube broke this not that long ago, a few years ago, and was fined 170 million for tracking children's viewing habits. And YouTube themselves made lots of changes to prevent that from happening again. So we can't, as in, in the traditional world, like on an e-commerce website, we're kind of cookies and other things that are tracking people across websites like Facebook do and seeing what they like and building out a picture of who they are from those behaviors. We're just not legally allowed to do that. So we've got a challenge then as a business. How do we know who our audience is without ever actually knowing who our audience is? And it sounds like an impossible problem to solve, doesn't it? Well, I think we're quite lucky. We've got Inspector Gadget. He's one of our brands. And we've gone with GoGo Gadget Machine Learning. What we want to do is see who's watching, as Inspector Gadget is doing here in this picture, the other side of the screen. And the way of solving this is actually by using 
artificial intelligence, machine learning, and looking at all of the available data sets we have and seeing what patterns and shapes we can learn from that data, see what the trends are, see what the common characteristics are, see what people are doing really from the data itself. For example, we have 8,000 hours of content. We know what all that content is, frame by frame, and we've got machine learning software that we models we use that can scan through that content and then tell us exactly what's going on with different weightings and understandings around who it is and probably who the content is interesting to and what they find interesting. And we know which episodes are watched and how many viewers each episode has and which parts of each episode people watch. And we've got patent pending technologies that we can use to combine that and build up network maps. So there's one in the top right corner here um, of our content. And that can map out how it's viewed, what age we think of viewing that, and the relationships between different parts of our content, different episodes, which ones are watched, which ones aren't watched, and how does that all relate together. And using that and combining it, we can start to build out and understand our audience and their profile. And we don't ever need to know them individually. Um, instead, we can just actually start to infer and using machine learning to sort of say, right, well, people watch this episode, do they watch this episode? What's the similarities between those? Is it similar characters? Is it similar events? Is it similar behaviours? Do those, does that audience group then like the same sort of things? But doing this is difficult. I mentioned 800 hours of content. It may not sound like much, but there's 24 frames in every second. So if you multiply that out, there's 700 million frames of content we have to progress through. And we're building more and more all the time. And our viewing data sets, we're getting 4 million new viewing data points every month of which programs, which episodes people are watching. And we've been doing this for seven years. So we've got 400 billion data points of viewing information to combine with 700 million frames of content. Those are actually big data sets. So how do you fit, filter through those and find out the right answers is a real tricky problem and it's costly to do too. So my recommendation from this learning is start on a smaller problem than this one. Don't aim for the moon necessarily. But our challenge from this is really how do we utilize that data, that understanding what our audience is doing to then create the right content in the future. And that's our goal, that's why we're doing this. And the better we can learn to understand our audience, the better next set of episodes we can create that the audience will enjoy watching and will resonate with them. But it does bring out some big challenges as well. And it's how best to utilize that output from machine learning. And the biggest risk is echo chambers. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you understand what people are watching and you look at the trends of what characters are in, in the most popular episodes, machine learning algorithms can end up just creating echoes of well, if this character is popular, create more content with that character. And you end up with similar outcomes more and more likely to occur. You end up with a positive feedback loop. Um, and therefore, the machine learning might just interpret the most watched content on the network is that of features boys and cars, because that's what the data is saying. Therefore, our audience only likes boys and cars. And therefore, our next show we make should just feature boys and cars, because that matches with our audience. And this is where we have to put a people lens over the top. I know that people are much more diverse than that and do like lots of different things. So people still have to be massively part of the process. Machine learning can only be one part of any solution. Another example would be that machine learning could say that audiences don't watch cartoons where characters have glasses. Disney's an example of this one where until Encanto recently, they hadn't had a single main character who ever wore glasses. And was that because people didn't relate to characters wearing glasses or was it because there wasn't any content where characters wear glasses and therefore you couldn't spot that actually those characters do resonate with the audiences and perhaps if more characters wore glasses then they might be popular and Kanto has been remarkably popular. Is it because the characters wearing glasses or is it because it's a good film? Different question to answer perhaps. But this is where you do need to consider the diversity and inclusivity more widely and how does that work and avoid those echo chambers. So in summary, set out a vision, choose the right apples, choose the right set of problems where you can utilize it, sort out your data. Don't try to use machine learning today if your data is a mess and you know it's a mess, you're just gonna end up in a right mess, <laughs> or tears really. Um, choose an approach, choose the right approach that works for you and your organization and assemble the right team to work with. 
And finally, think about the outcomes, look at the data. Do you believe it? Do you trust it? Apply a human lens to anything. Don't let machines just go and make big choices. Big choices can be wrong if you just automate everything. Um, that's it. Thank you. Um, I've been Sam Hill from Wellbrain. If there's any questions with Tim, um, I'm quite happy to answer them. And I hope you found this uh, interesting. If you want to get in touch, please do. Sam, thank you very much for that. And um, there's lots of uh, the brands there that I know very well, um, given my children, um, and enjoy as well. So we've got about um, 40 minutes. So um, please um, send through some questions. The first one's come through, which I don't actually un understand myself, which is, do you like cinnamon? Do I like cinnamon? Yes. I don't know. I, I'm not sure if that's a show or, to, or, or I've missed it, but um, we'll, we'll leave that one aside. Um, so one of the things that sort of struck me is around, you know, we talked about earlier in the last session a bit about regulation and how this existing set of regulations coming through on AI and what's coming down the line. And it sounds like you, know, you obviously dealt with that um, regulation already and found a good way of, of, of um, dealing with it. So, I mean, I think it's two two sort of questions. Firstly, how do you see the regulation changing? Because um, there's the online safety bill coming through um, in the UK, and I think there's the equivalent. I think it's a DSA in the EU. So there's obviously you know there's the US regulation, but is that is there is there more things that came into done? And also, what can um, those many sectors who are going to be dealing with AR regulation, whether that's around you know, medical devices or facial recognition, how should they be approaching um, forthcoming regulation and trying to deal with it? That's a good, complicated, long question. Um, <laughs> I'll probably, probably break it down first. I mean, um, so how how can they learn from your experience? I think our experience is uh, interesting because World Bank was a bit flawed by the changes that were made by um, YouTube, actually, because when the um, fine hit YouTube, YouTube is our biggest platform for viewers, YouTube sort of wound back completely lots of the data sets they were able to provide about viewing habits because of them having to adjust their own platform to be copper compliant. So we weren't non copper compliant at that extent. In terms of we never knew who any of our audience was, we're always one step removed. We don't control any of the viewing platforms. We're not like BBC with iPlayer where they know their audience. We don't know who our audience is at all because we all of our content goes out on third parties. So we're always one step removed from the audience. Um, so that's made it a lot easier for us to be compliant in that way. Uh, in terms of the learning around that though, it's look at the data you actually need. Ask yourself, why do we need this data? What's the outcome we're going to be using it for? How is it going to help move our business forward? And if it's not necessary or critical to the operation of the business or vital, probably worth not having that data in your systems anyway or using things in a slightly different way and um, and just start simplifying out the data you have and the data sets you work with into what matters and um, the online safety bill is going to have some interesting implications i think um it depends what level it comes down to but particularly around sort of restricting access to content and the different forms of digital validation there could be all sorts of interesting implications around that and I think what's going to be interesting is more seeing how that changes the behavior of people who consume content rather than necessarily the impact of the people who work on the systems behind the scenes. Will people be prepared to have those digital IDs follow them around the internet and be tracked in different ways? I think there's some ethical challenges that come the other way around where the internet historically has been always anonymous. People have tried to track people and use cookies to follow people around the internet but essentially if you want to be anonymous you can be. If most websites require you to submit some form of digital ID before they let you in the door, then that becomes a quite a different proposition from a consumer perspective. And how businesses balance the two would be very interesting to see. Yeah, I've seen that in other areas whereby sometimes it's where businesses have two contradictory sets of legislation regulations, sometimes standards provides a best practice way through um, because they don't want to do. I mean, the other thing I was interested in about you sort of talking about um, sort of positive feedback loops. I mean, so you work in the creative sector, and you know, how do you get that balance right between taking the data that's coming through about what the audience wants, 
and ensuring that the creative people have enough freedom to develop um, content that actually inspires that audience and keeps bringing back. So how do you get that balance right between creativity and data to get a positive outcome? By making creative primary. If we only, if we could, technology almost exists where we could use the data of like which characters are watch, being watched the most at the moment, what's the scenes that people like most, and we could interpret that data and we could automatically edit together episodes and system and content that just matched almost exactly what people were watching today. So you sort of, from an advertising revenue perspective, that'd probably be great because you'd be matching exactly what the audience is after. Um, but then you rapidly end up in an echo chamber of people do want to see different things. They want that diversity of content. They, yes, kids do like watching the same programs on repeats quite a lot, but they do also then get bored of that and will watch something else. It's how do you find that something else that also resonates with them? And that's where computers don't have imagination. That's why you still need the creatives, the people in that process. The data can help understand, right, if we've got loads of cartoons that have got people going swimming in it and they're always the episodes that get skipped, probably let's not go and create another episode with characters going swimming because that's not resonating with the audience. But so you can still use the data to help inspire and learn right, well, what, what things matter, but you still need the creatives to sit that layer above and come up with the good stories, the good ideas, the good new characters as well that can inspire that, that audience in the next level and go, oh, that's a good idea, that's new, that's nice. So, so I was just thinking about in terms of the data you have access to and to, to help you. So to what extent do you, is the data you'd like to have to help you? For example, you know, what your content, I'm not sure if your content is available on, on, on YouTube, what it's, what it's shown before and after or within other sort of um, uh, on-demand channels, what it's, how easy it's to find um, your content for different audiences. So obviously for different platforms, what each person sees a different thing. So, how much? What other data would you like to, to help to help you on your sort of journey? We'd like as much data as we can get. Different platforms give us different data. Some platforms will just tell us how many people watch an episode. Some platforms don't even tell us that. Actually, um, YouTube is pretty good, so we know what episode they watched before and what episode they watched after. So you can then start to build out that picture of going up. So they watched episode two and then they watched episode four of the series. So why did they skip episode three? And you can then start to explore why that is and is it what the trends that can relate to that? Is that common across other bits of content? So as many data points as we can get, it's kind of the simple answer for that. But not having our own player does actually make it harder for us to get that data too. Uh, and in terms of actually, because um, you, you set a great set of uh, approach that companies should take. Um, I mean, do you, from, from within, within your particular sector, and how far along the journey do you think organisations are in terms of using um, artificial intelligence? Because I, I find that there's a huge mix in terms of firms that are really deploying it across the businesses and firms not touching at all. I mean. Do you, do you see yourselves as being a leader in the sector or do you think everyone else is following you? What's your kind of views on that? Um, I think we're fairly much a leader in the sector. Um, it's not been something that necessarily broadcasters have considered in the past of really wanting to, I mean, everyone wants to know about their audience. There's been platforms and technologies, radar and things like that in the UK for a very long time about trying to tell you what audience viewing numbers look like. And then people have always tried to interpret those. So, but within the industry, in terms of using AI and machine learning to start to understand that data, we're pretty unique in that space. But it doesn't mean to say others won't be wanting to do that too, and probably have started to do that as well. But I think the, the challenge with that comes from have you got access to enough data to actually really do it? Because you need the spread as well. And in, in terms of, in terms, so another thing that probably taking from a different angle around sort of safety. Um, so safety is talked about in many different ways. In particular, I particularly mentioned earlier on the fact that from a standardization perspective, um, there's a huge amounts, of, huge amounts of standardization that sits around products. So crash helmets, car seats, cars, medical devices, toys, all of them strong um, sort of safety, standards around them 
Um, I mean, from your perspective, I mean, do do you think that the right um, safety standards are in place for um, children online, given it's, it's quite an, an early early stage? And also, you know, what can other industries learn from from you? Because they are going from here's a product, it goes on the market, it's safe to a world where that is much more changing. How do you keep how do you keep safety as part of a um, your culture when your content and channels are changing, which most industries don't face? Safety for kids content is a really interesting one because we've got a whole team that actually focuses on that. And it's not about our content, it's about fake versions of our content. And it's not just us mm -hmm. as a brand. There's a lot of it you see in sort of like Peppa Pig's a good example where particularly on YouTube, anyone can publish content to YouTube and they will spot the, the trending searches. A lot of people search for Peppa Pig. If they can get their video in there that's a parody of Peppa Pig that might involve Peppa Pig getting hurt or things like that, which would break the brand ethics of what that character is about. Um, and the same can apply to us with the Teletubbies, a very safe uh, preschool property. Some people do try to reuse those characters in their own parody versions of it. So we have a whole team that's just about that brand enforcement that's spotting and relying on the platforms as well, particularly the open publishing ones like Instagram and TikTok and others. When when brand brand harming content gets published, how quickly can you get it down? So to avoid it's not about brand damage for us as a business, it's actually about brand damage for the kids who love the Teddy Tubbies. You then suddenly see them having a fight in a fake video that someone's published on there to try and make a few quick pounds or something like that because they you know, they can pollute the algorithms so some standards some control some safeguarding around that level of brand protection it's not about stopping people being able to publish their own creative content yeah please do and it's how those industries work and how those platforms really thrive but don't do it with other people's brands and their properties and at the moment, it's more we need to spot it and get it taken down rather than safeguarding the other way around of it, just is prevented from appearing in the first place. Yeah, so it's interesting from, from sort of my experience as a parent, if you, on certain online gaming platforms, you see the same thing there as well, where um, so one of the brands you just mentioned um, being, sort of being, being appropriated, and, you know, potentially that is going to expand with the metaverse, and uh, that's another problem potentially machine learning can, can help with as well because it doesn't sound like it's been dealt with at the moment. Hmm. No, um, we're heavily into Roblox as well, so kids gaming and again yeah. part of the reason we're on there is because the kids are there but the other reason on there is around you know, exposing our brands in a safe way onto those platforms because if we can make sure it's us that's putting our brands on there we can do it aligned with our brand ethics and what those characters are about and you know, hopefully have the better control over that experience. But, how you safeguard children from harmful content really is a tricky area. And the platforms do try, to be fair. Mm. It's one of the reasons CBBS as a, a channel in the UK is still very, very popular. It's a safe one that parents can put the kids in front of, where they know the content is vetted, it's truthful, it's real. And there's still those risks with other platforms that yeah, good quality content from ourselves and others like us is there, but it can get interspersed with possibly more harmful content for kids too. Yeah, I, I know this from my experience as well. Uh, I th we're up, up to our, our time, unfortunately. Thank you very much for that. And I will, um, thank you, Sam. And I will continue to enjoy your content um, for a long time, I think. Thank so you. thank I you very much. I think my crashed as well, but um, apologies for that. We, we can see you, but it's been, been static for a little bit. But... <laughs> so sorry for that, but anyway, thank you, everyone. Thank you. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so for our next speaker, we're talking about the journey of an organization to AI maturity. We have, we have Ivana Bartoletti, the Global Data Protection Data Privacy Officer from Wipro, and the founder of Women Leading in AI Network. Ivana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And um, it's really great to, to be with you today. And uh, um, absolutely fantastic to um, be able to um, discuss with you uh, the um, 
what I have learned uh, over the last few years as the um, what it means to um, be in a in a journey um, to maturity as um, as an organization. Mm. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to um, define um, what I believe is um, is the um, is maturity. What it means. Um, and it's true that organizations at the moment, and not just in the EU, but across the, um, in, in, in the UK, um, are a different stage of maturity. Um, um, and this is really important to, re to, to recognize, but at the same time, um, it is important, I believe, to um, have an understanding of what maturity means and what is the road to, to get there. And um, um, so let me start with um, next slide, please. Yeah. So I just wanted to start by saying how over the last few years um, we have seen some absolutely best coming from artificial intelligence and uh, and automated decision systems. But I've all, we've also seen some quite um, alarming things that have happened um, that have brought companies over the spot in the, in the spotlight. Um, around the use of technologies and uh, some people talked about how there's been a real sort of backlash and to, from 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 and, and especially how uh, people are viewing the use of technologies and this is really important i think and uh, that's why i wanted to put this slide here is because when we talk about the journey to ai maturity what we're really talking about is a journey to trust um, trust is a very complex world, word in, in, in this way, but what we are really talking about is, is for um, uh, organizations um, across all different areas and streams of the business, as well as the users, the general public, and those who are impacted by the AI systems that the company either deploys or purchases, um, then I think um, it, it's really important that um, um, uh, people and consumers, clients, over the last few years, we have seen some examples of that I have to an extent um, put people, um, uh, made people very much aware of um, and um, uh, on artificial intelligence and the capabilities and 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 also not just the opportunities but also the great risks that AI brings with it. So I wanted to really uh, start with this because what I wanted to say is that to me a journey to maturity for an organization is the journey that is very trust rooted into the concept of trust. How can an organization um, deploy or develop artificial intelligence in a way that employees, different areas of the business, consumers, clients can trust the way that the organization develops and deploys these technologies. This is really, really important, especially at the time where consumers are demanding more transparency around products. They are um, very much aware and they are becoming increasingly aware of the potential risks that come alongside the amazing benefits that artificial intelligence can bring to organizations and to, and to our societies. So these are some of the examples of the things that we, we have seen over recent years. So we've seen recruiting systems being under fire because we're um, excluding, excluding workers. We have seen um, issues around artificial intelligence to an extent um, um, replicating, automating what are existing inequalities that exist in society right now. All these things, they haven't given these systems a good name, although it's really, really important that uh, we focus on the great opportunities. And this is why for organizations to develop a strong competitive edge, they really have to bring together sound governance, um, ethical Ivani, you seem to have dropped out again. Values, ethical principles alongside um, the um, alongside innovation. And so, sorry, next slide. Next slide, please. Can you hear me? Yes. I think it's up now. Oh, thank you. So, um, oh, sorry. So, next, yes, 
I'm so sorry, I don't really understand what's going on. If, um, I had um, um so um so the um the journey to AI maturity and uh, so having given you the the first point that I really wanted to bear in mind, which is the fact that you know how this journey has to be underpinned in the concept uh, um, of, of trust. I wanted to move on to what does it mean? What is the journey to maturity? And in particular, what are the different stages that organizations go through until they uh, transform their business? So there is an, an initial stage, and I think a lot of organizations are in this stage right now, which is around the exploration of artificial intelligence. So that's at the time where um, there is a little bit of research um, uh, a, a little bit of research done by um, by um, data scientists. Um, data is at the moment of the, this initial stage contained within a, a experimentation the experimentation in, in environment. Um, and but the, nevertheless, this is a, still a time where the um, where um, the um, uh, privacy by design or regulation by design or all of this is is important in order to get it right from the onset. Anyway, so this is a more sort of explorative state, and a lot of uh, organisations are in uh, in this stage right now. Uh, then there is a second stage where. Um, the companies start that I'm seeing it, that is where companies start to use artificial intelligence in places that do not directly affect customers. For example, we're talking about reconciling invoices, a lot of back end operations, so a lot of things that do not directly affect the customers, but are really um, are really useful for the product activity, the streamlining of your of operations of, across the organizations. Um, this is where decisions reviewers, there's a little bit more governance that is often introduced and, um, and, uh, and, and the organizations start to think about why the complexity is around the use of the systems. Then there is another stage which is around augmentation, which is that where uh, companies start to use AI in existing processes in the business that interact with both customers and internal users. So I'm thinking, for example, in the recruitment process, talent acquisition. Um, and this is where it's the stage where we start normally to talk about enterprise journey. And then we move on to the transforming the businesses. And this is where the sort of maturity comes, which is companies create new processes that are only available uh, because of artificial intelligence. Uh, so for example, um, the, the, the journey that, that Uber has undertaken, where now, for example, they decide prices is and, and what the driver is, what the driver is, and they're able to do this because of the um, capabilities offered by the uh, AI driven systems. So um, this is a full enterprise journey, an enterprise endeavor that involves all internal stakeholders. So in, in a nutshell, this is the journey to, to maturity. Um, and, and this is, and that really goes from exploration to transforming using um, artificial intelligence. Um, sorry, next slide. Um, okay. So what is that makes artificial intelligence difficult? and to an extent for companies and, and, and unique. So what is so unique about artificial intelligence that when it comes to the journey to AI maturity, it makes it complicated for organizations. The reason why I wanted to focus on this is then because I wanted to offer some possible solutions in relation to, um, in relation to, 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 to these potential challenges so that listeners can think about their governance structures and, um, um, and so that they can build their, their sort of journey um, in, in AI implementation. So the first point is that the risks of artificial intelligence are dynamic, right? So machine learning algorithms learn from data, adjusting the input weightings, um, models that are low risk yesterday can become low high risk tomorrow including, for example, whether or not a, a, a particular system is fair. This is really, really important because organizations always struggle with building in, in the new risk 
that artificial intelligence is bringing to the organization within the existing risk governance construct. And that might be complex because obviously um, the, the, the risks in AI, they are constantly evolving. Um, and um, and this is one of the issues that we bear in mind that, that, that sometimes is, uh, makes the, um, for example, the approach of the um, European Commission to the to AI governance, um, which is very much focused on the governance around high risk artificial intelligence. That's where it brings some complexities. And this is exactly around the issues of, of um, how high our risk may be a very sort of fast evolving concept. The second issue is that artificial intelligence systems are complex. Take, for example, one issue, which is the issue of fairness in, in the systems. Um, there are different lenses, um, not just legal, not just technical. When it comes fairness is big, it's been a big topic in this field for, for a long time now. And again, this is where fairness is, is yes, I mean it's got technical solutions, very different technical solutions, sometimes and, and not one of, of this technical solution is compatible with the other one. Nevertheless, fairness is also a very important concept under the law, where there is non-discrimination legislation, where there is privacy and data protection. So it, it requires a an approach which is not coming from one area only. And also the other area of complexity is AI systems might be difficult to, to interpret. And this is not an easy thing because there is a stringent requirement that seems to be emerging across different areas of, of in, in, in different parts of the world around transparency, meaningful transparency, interrogating algorithms, for example, in, in uh, um, when it comes to automated decisions that may have an impact on the life of individuals. So again, uh, for example, in an employment context, talent acquisition, so whether we use artificial intelligence or and big data analytics for predictive um, choices or, 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 or similar. The other issue is that they are operating in an evolving legal, legal landscape. Um, uh, and this is really important to bear in mind. Um, the reason why I'm saying this is because um, in um, um, all around the world, whether it's through privacy and data protection law, whether it's through consumer legislation, whether it's through um, liability, um, existing legal tools are increasingly taken into account the um, complexities that artificial intelligence is bringing through. Take, for example, algorithmic pricing um, and the fact that different people see a different price based on different factors and, and how a new requirement, of, uh, in there is a requirement of transparency um, and, and, and to, regarding all that. Um, we live in a in sort of a world where we um, operate well beyond our borders. And so obviously legislation, for example, in Europe, like the European AI Act, will undoubtedly have an impact on in the UK. And it's really important so to take into consideration the global picture around the implement the sort of the legal landscape around artificial intelligence. The other, the other area that makes artificial intelligence complicated is that too often technology rate teams lack diversity. And lack of diversity is a very important issue because artificial intelligence has a transformative impact to our workplace, in our workplaces, as well as on our customers and clients um, and users and, and citizens when it's in, in public sector. And um, an issue of bias is, is one of the major risks that really has a big impact on how artificial intelligence can gain the trust of, of, of users and therefore um, contribute even more to the growth of our societies. Um, the issue of diversity in technology teams is big because it is often that lack of diversity that hinders the possibility to identify potential unintended consequences, potential bias, and potential socio-economical impact of the systems that we put in place. Next slide, please. So 
how do we overcome this complexity to enable organizations to progress with their journey towards AI maturity? So to me, there are different different areas and, and different uh, steps. And I just wanted to uh, list a few. So the first one is around the um, creation of an AI model inventory, which is uh, an inventory that really is, is able to provide a single source for sort of first, second and third line of defense. The other one is around skills and diversity. So to ensure that there are capabilities technical capabilities embedded across different teams. Um, AI is, is a, um, an endeavor that belongs to the entire company. Um, and the more and more we require skills that are not operating in the silos. Um, the relationship, for example, between a legal team and the data scientist and engineering team is a relationship that is really very important because teams that often speak the same language, that really need to be able to communicate and work together at the design stage. Then policies and standards. So what are the standardized policies that the organization establishes to govern the development, testing, deployment, and monitoring of AI systems, um, and um, the automation of processes internally. So how do we establish automated controls and processes? They, for example, we're talking about ethics assessment, sign-offs, testing, clear measures to ensure there is auditability of the steps that have been undertaken and accountability. The other big element is how we build in interpretability and transparency. They should be built into and embedded into the systems to minimize, for example, pair bias and promote trust in AI. But how do we build the interpretability of the system and transparency that is absolutely important, not just towards the end user, but it's also very important when it comes, for example, to the technical documentation that in the European AI Act is a layer of, of transparency that is not available, of course, to the, to, to the end user, but is available, for example, from the producer of the AI to the company that purchases the AI system. And that means that is a technical documentation that, um, that really, um, is need to be able to describe how transparency and interpretability has been built into the system. And then the establishment of KPIs and, and ethics indicators. So what are the monitoring systems that we establish? I mean, how does a company judge the success and, and that they're having at implementing AI? Next slide, please. So in a nutshell, these are the key questions that every company needs to be able to ask themselves. Who is accountable? How are, when are AI risks identified and mitigated? Do all team, all members of teams and undertaking this activity have success, success, sufficient technical understanding? What metrics should executive leadership monitor? And how can we leverage and modify existing functions and governance structures to manage AI risks? So those are the key questions that I think is really important that organizations um, identify and are able to answer, to answer uh, uh, moving forward. Next slide, please. So there are different um, elements of governance and different layers of government governance that I think need to be taken into account. So one is around data governance, right? Very, very important. And data is a key issue that needs to address in from the beginning when the organization starts their journey and how they want, especially if they want to move to a mature state. And this is really about data quality. What is the governance around preparing the right, the right data sheets for the data set? So what is, what do we, um, what do we um, mean really in relation to um, 
how do we create the right governance around data? Then there is governance around the model, the, sort of the, the I model. And this is all around model governance, model risk, model validation. So for example, how is a particular system reviewed? What is the model validation processes that we have in place? Is this internal? Do we have external validators? Um, especially to understand you know, how the system is robust, explainable, fair, and secure and safer from a security standpoint. And there is governance from a legal and regulatory uh, standpoint, which is privacy by design, regulation across different fields that need to be taken into account at every stage of AI deployment. And as we said earlier, this regulatory landscape is changing quite a lot. Therefore, the ability of integrating this level of governance together with the other layers into the existing governance construct and structures is really, really important to future-proof the AI systems that we're going to put into the market or we're going to use. Then we have third-party governance, which is um, checks for potential, for example, fairness consideration and, um, and contractual terms that need to be um, reviewed and, and um, to ensure that there are explainability and privacy guarantees. And then there is the IT governance, and that relates to the security and the safety of a system. AI is also introducing problems in terms of security and safety, new challenges that need to be taken into consideration. So really important to ensure that um, it's, um, all this is taken into account. And then the governance around the monitoring, how do we and who is evaluating and monitoring the AI system moving forward? Next slide, please. So I wanted to show you this slide because I just wanted to, um, there is a lot of discussions around, for example, um, the governance of AI and, and all of that, but I just wanted to quickly show you how um, these principles, they seem to be, um, Align, they, they seem to be in alignment around these principles. Um, they seem to be um, um, present in um, global and regional um, institutions as, as um, who that are um, working on governance of AI. And in addition to that, um, they seem to be very much underpinning a lot of sort of work around standardization. And these are around technical attributes, social technical attributes, and guiding principles contributing to trustworthiness. So it's worth keeping that into consideration to ensure that um, in the fast and rapidly evolving landscape, we are able to um, factor in these principles in governance that organizations decide, you know, decide to establish around AI. I also wanted to briefly say that there's been a lot of case law especially around automated decision systems, around, um, around um, relying on automated tools um, in across various areas. Um, and there is a really good documentation by the Future Privacy Forum that looks at how privacy legislation has been um, leveraged over the last few years to uphold some of the some individual rights um in 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 the age of, of ai basically these for example uh, things like um the use of, of automated systems for price discrimination uh priority for for example um the allocation of slots and um booking um um shift in the case of, of um um delivery companies um that is Courts have been deeming, for example, unfair because they didn't recognize the different the, the reasons why an, an employee may want to cancel a shift at the very last minute, or um, a, um, a very recent case happened in the Netherlands where a lot of citizens were discriminated against and accused of fraudly um, paying fraud in, in benefit system. That was erroneous and led to 26,000 people um, ending up in, in 
quite dramatic situations, including suicide. Um, a very bad case that has been in newspapers all around the world and, and has been clearly undermined the role of, 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 um, of uh, the use of AI and automated decisions in the administrative state whereby it's necessary, <laughs> where it, it would indeed be necessary, but cases like this are extremely dangerous. Um, so that was a problem also data accuracy. Um, and there was a problem where um, the, the system was making decisions and, and um, acting in a different way where there was a double nationality recorded, although that not, and, and um, uh, so citizens with double nationalities so or immigrants were punished, although uh, there was no um, evidence of, of wrongdoing. Next slide, please. And in my last few minutes, I just wanted to focus on um, one element around uh, the maturity journey, which is around bias in decision making. And if we can just scroll down, please, conscious of the time, I just wanted to focus on a couple of things. If you scroll down, please. Yeah, I just wanted to focus on this. I just wanted to give you an example of how um, in the journey to maturity of an organization, for example, the issue of fairness, which is one of the key complex, the key most complex issues in, in that companies are facing at the moment, um, can be navigated from a governance standpoint. Um, so these are some of the steps that I've, I've always thought that are really, really important. So um, one is, is the definition of fairness that defines the value of the organization. This is where to me, it's really important that organizations deploy a, and develop AI in a way in a way that aligns to the organizational values, um, approaches, and vision. And I always say to organization, um, do not choose an AI product because the AI product is glamorous. Choose it or because it's there to solve a problem. Um, because this is um, this is the way forward. This is really important. Um, the role of governance, for example, around DPIAs and the deliberative approaches about the deployment of AI, knowing the timeline for the interventions, which is not just a uh, when the process when the system is there to be developed or sorry to be deployed. So, for example, we're using a system to screen CVs, or if we are a large organization, we're using a system to match individual capabilities with a particular project. Um, this is where it's really important that we look at the timeline for fairness intervention from the pre-processing to the post-processing. Um, familiarizing with importance and limited, limited devices in techniques. So not all technological problems can be solved mathematically or technologically. Some problems have got a different nature and need to be understood as such. Um, use tools, the biasing tools as accelerators, not replacements. There are a lot of tools that can be used, but they have to be um, really working together, humans and in general. The best uses that I'm seeing of, of accelerator and, tool and tools are where um, humans and the machines can really cooperate. And the other thing is really important, I think, is the reward via spotting. We've seen a lot of cases over the last few years where in technology, um, we have seen a lot of trying to, um, trying to um, uh, really not uh, give you know, much space to, um, to any form of, of, of of um, dissent, um, but I think it's really, really important that organizations encourage bias spotting and encourage employees to work in, and operate in, in an environment of this kind. Um, last slide. So, um, I um, just if you, I'd be delighted to take questions on this topic, and I just wanted to basically conclude by saying. Um, that the journey of AI maturity is certainly not an easy one. Companies have to navigate a lot of complexities. Um, companies have to uh, operate in a, in a territory which is um, changing and changing rapidly. 
Um, but it's also a journey that has a lot of potential, especially when organizations start thinking about how they can, you know, how they can really transform with artificial intelligence. But to do that, to get to that point, um, it's really important to understand that this journey is a corporate endeavor one. Um, innovating, transforming with AI is not just a team, it's not just one area, um, but it really works if it's a, a corporate journey that brings every single function of the business together. Um, where where um, skills are shared, um, where we have more and more expertise that is shared across the company, where we're able to stop working in silos, where technical knowledge and non-technical knowledge is not limited to specific teams, but where we're able to all learn from each other and develop a common language and a common understanding about some of the main issues around AI. Um, if AI is developed and deployed like this, I think it can be a fantastic competitive edge, not just for companies, but also for the country at a time where this is more sort of needed and um, and necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana, Thank for, you, showing Ivana your, for showing your sort of huge depth of expertise there. I'm having some sort of feedback on the sound, but I'll carry on anyway. I hope it's all right for you, Ivana. Um, so we've had a few questions come through. Um, we've only got about six or so minutes. So the first one I've got is, how do you prepare entire organization's workforce and change the mindset of, of um, in a transforming business? So do you, are there any recommendations you have for a workforce transformation frameworks or any different approaches you could um, uh, refer the audience to? Yeah, I think this is really, really important. I mean, there is a there are a lot of organizations that work on the employee side, which is really good. They're prepared. Um and and there's also a lot of good work that on that trade unions are doing in this space. I think it's really important to make sure that we make you know, we make everyone feel that it's part of this journey. Um that um of course then I mean employees might feel, oh, you know. The organization wants to transform with AI means jobs losses or redundancies. That's not the point. The point is that um, machine and humans working together, they can really enhance the way that we do business, the way that we do decisions, the way that we treat patients, the way that we identify disorders or diseases way before they manifest. That cooperation is essential. So. Um, making everyone feel part of the journey is is crucial and that can be done by um one of the things i've seen more successful is when organizations do um uh, sort of cross-functional work teams on working on on this process where they're able to sort of break the silos and uh, and involve um employees at sort of in the definition of, of um in, in the define the definition of uh, um, of criteria and parameters around the sort of success of uh, of artificial intelligence and what um, what KPIs are introduced and they part they feel part of the decision making process. Yeah, and on that point, I was very impressed with your sort of um, combination of KPIs and sort of key um, ethical indicators earlier on as well. Yeah. Um, so another question we have, which came through came through actually one of the other um, earlier sessions, but I think fits very well with you. It is, um, are there any gaps, loopholes in how companies are anonymizing personal data and how they collect their databases for modeling, which, you know, and also the potential cro crossover of that for regulation? Um, I think, you know, we're sort of in an age where, you know, the, the, the methods of collecting and um, anonymizing data are known, but will the, will the AI change what's going to happen? And, and how are you sort of uh, dealing with that whole, that whole issue? Yeah, so I think um, I think we are at the moment where AI needs, I mean, still needs a lot of personal data, you know, a lot of data. And sometimes, you know, this data is personal. And of course, when it comes to personal data, now you're dealing with a lot of, you know, the privacy legislation. Nevertheless, um, the, you know, you you can um, um, sort of anonymization and, and data masking and, and the pseudonymization, they are techniques that uh, reduce risks and they are important 
um, there is a lot of privacy enhancing technologies that are are being de developed. Um, they're still they're sometimes they're still very expensive from both a um, a sort of um, a financial, but also from a um, consumption perspective. I'm thinking about on, on morphic encryption, or um, I'm thinking about uh, differential privacy. Nevertheless, you know these are becoming more and more important. So I think what I'm trying to say is that um, I think organisations should be looking at all these possibilities um, of how they can leverage privacy enhancing tech yeah. to um, make the most of the data that they have. Um, that doesn't mean that they can use and collect all sorts of data because they can just, you know, but, um, uh, do operations in them. But what I mean is that it's really important to 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 make the most of this. And um, and there are a lot of initiatives around uh, sort of privacy engineering and coding from sort of uh, that are emerging that are, is really worth looking into. And uh, just that point, I'd also make a little plug. We've got a conference, um, free conference on the. 7th of June on privacy as well, which also covers uh, PETs as well. Yeah. So just, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So I was gonna take one more question. So it's not just me who's been fascinated by the, the concepts of uh, key ethics indicators. So we've had someone else come in who's, set, who's asked about what's your um, suggestion to build um, key ethics indicators? Yeah, so I think it's, um, I think, I mean, ethics is not an easy topic and, um, and sometimes it's, it's a very sort of, um, it's very difficult to pin down, you know, but um, I think um, I think organizations need to um, um, need to understand you know, what are the key tenets, you know, what are the key principles that they want to adhere to. Some of, a lot of the stuff from the AI, uh, AI does not exist in isolation, obviously, right? AI is, is subject to um, the law, is subject to the law around fairness, around transparency, it's access rights, informational rights, um, um, explainability. I mean, there is a lot in there which is already enshrined in existing legislation um, and also um, liability and, and all of that. Um, to me, um, it's really important to understand from an ethical standpoint, it's really about um, how what an organization feel around the social technique, the social economical impact of AI. Um, so what is the impact of AI on individuals, on communities? What is the individual impact? What is the impact of AI on um, fundamental rights of people? So every organ I mean organizations can develop the, the, the key sort of the ethics indicators according to sort of um, as an exercise, of, as a collective exercise of, of, of a company, um, as, as, I, as I showed you, you know, there is an alignment of key principles. There are ethical principles that, that a lot of companies, organizations, uh, are, uh, they seem to be agreed on when it comes to what it means for AI to be trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So um, develop these indicators and measuring how the company um, is aligning to them what are the milestones in terms of introducing this concept in the design, um, monitoring them, involving external, um, for example, organizations or, or those who are going to be impacted by the systems in, in, in taking part of the process. Um, all those could form part of, of what an organization decides you know, that their indicators are. What I'm trying to say is that uh, these indicators are important because they would um, show how much a company is taking uh, AI seriously, not just in terms of the positives, but also in terms of the risks. And by doing by doing so, I think it can really um, reassure the public, the customers, and and that um, um, and therefore have a very strong competitive edge in, in the market. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think that's all we've got time for today, unfortunately. Uh, Ivana, thank you very much for that. Really. Um, great presentation, really showing us your, your depth of knowledge and experience in this topic. Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome back. Um, hopefully, you are all suitably refreshed and ready for an enlightening afternoon of great speakers and discussions on a very broad range of topics and themes. Um, as you can hear, I'm not Tim McGar. Um, Tim has steered us elegantly through this morning's um, very enlightening sessions, and I'm going to hopefully steer us with a gentle hand on the tiller through the next uh, couple of hours. 
So my name is David Cookow. Um, I'm the Associate Director here at uh, BSI and my team, along with uh, Tim, are responsible for our um, digital sector and digital activities. So um, our next hour is going to be covering the future impact of AI, artificial intelligence. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our chair for the next hour, and I will hand over to Sanjay Khanna, who is a partner and now partners, and he's going to set the scene and welcome our speakers and hopefully steer us through a quick Q&A, which will be at the end of the session. So just a quick reminder, if you could submit your questions using the Q&A panel um, within the um, chat box on the right hand side of the screen, please keep them coming. Um, we want these sessions to be as interactive as we possibly can. So Sanjay is a strategic advisor and foresight expert. Um, he was also previously a futurist. Um, I'm sure he probably still is, um, but um, Sanjay, hopefully you're there and I can hand over the control to you. Thank you uh, very much for that, uh, David. Um, I am indeed here. I'm just going to adjust uh, my back my background here. Just one moment, and there we go. Um, so it's lovely to be here. And uh, David, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. As David said, uh, I'm Sanjay Kanna. Um, as a strategic advisor and foresight expert, and yes, a futurist. Uh, I help organizations explore our era of converging crises in order to both strengthen strategy and build resilience. Since the pandemic's outset, and mostly virtually, I've given talks to audiences at more than 20 organizations in 50 countries worldwide about the potential impacts of five converging crises. These are geopolitical fragmentation, socioeconomic reordering, population health, climate change and technological acceleration within which AI uh, firmly sits. Um, I typically highlight scenario planning as a powerful method for exploring plausible futures and strategic responses to unprecedented change. Uh, unprecedented change. As session chair today on the future impact of AI, I will ask our distinguished panelists, Detlaf Nock of BT and Juan, Mateos Garcia of Nesta to share their views on implications of AI in business and society during the next three to five years. Over this middling time horizon, the COVID-19 pandemic is anticipated to pose additional risks and threats to global and national economies. AI is evolving alongside rising food and energy inflation, consumers reduced purchasing power, more entrenched income and wealth inequality, and worsening climate change impacts. In this context, some organizations believe that unique strategic partnerships will be needed to tackle major challenges related to AI with unprecedented interprofessional and interdisciplinary collaboration. After our panelists introduce themselves, we will explore three themes. The first theme is strategic uses of AI in the current economic and organizational context. The second theme is strategic and operational risks of AI in the current economic and societal context. And then finally, the third theme, scenario planning, partnerships, and takeaways. Uh, as part of uh, preparing for the session, I've asked our panelists to offer you, our audience, at least a few insights that might potentially challenge conventional orthodoxy on AI and disrupt planning in cases where existing assumptions may reduce chances of success. So now, please let me introduce our panelists, uh, Detlaf Nock of BT. Uh, Detlaf is the head of AI and data science research in the Applied Research Unit at BT, where he leads a team of 30 international researchers. Detlaf, please feel free to introduce yourself uh, and say a little bit about your role, and then uh, we'll have uh, Juan come on board. Okay, thank you very much. Um... Sanjay, yeah, um, my name is Detlef Nauk. I uh, work in BT for the last 
22 years. My background is computer science and um, machine learning and uh, focus on machine learning and data science. Before I joined BT, I had a 10-year university career and then decided to move into industry. Uh, in my current role at BT, I'm running the AI and data science research program. So BT has, has a large research program. We have about um, 200 plus uh, scientists, researchers working uh, across a number of topics. We are based um, just out of Ipswich in Suffolk in a large R&D facility. And uh, the uh, nature of my program is to uh, look at what sort of uh, solutions in AI, machine learning, data science can we apply in the business, what um, kind of developments can we see that we uh, should act on, and then design an, uh, a research program accordingly and work with the business on uh, identifying new challenges and problems that uh, we can apply our research to, but also and um, downstream the research results into the business and uh, work with the teams that take over from us. Um, the program that we have looks across all uh, types of different AI. So we're looking, for example, at uh, natural language processing. We're looking at things like federated learning. We're looking at autonomics, which is kind of self-healing, self-learning systems. We are uh, looking also, we have a large uh, area that we call AI safety that looks at um, uh, responsible AI, ethical AI, but also how we can prevent um, the misuse of AI or the attack on AI systems. Um, we use um, things like anomaly detection in our own networks to identify um, what potentially can indicate faults so we can uh, intervene and, and stop in time. That, that's, um, that's fascinating. And I guess a lot of your role is about really um, translating uh, the, the the applied research to uh, to the business of of BT while dealing with some of the big research questions um, uh, on responsible AI and some other areas. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So it's this translation job, and then um, we have a large uh, strategic research program that looks into the future. We work with academics. We have collaborations across the globe uh, to pick up on uh, kind of the uh, cutting edge work and uh, use the foresight of our academic partners in the program. That's wonderful. And now um, let me introduce uh, Juan uh, Mateos Garcia. Uh, Juan, can you uh, join the stage, please? Hello. Um... There, there you are. Oh. So uh, yeah, my name is Juan Mateos Garcia, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, I'm an economist. Uh, I've got eight years of experience working in the area of um, data science, machine learning, and I guess uh, some aspects of AI. Um, and I've been doing this in Nesta, which is the UK Innovation Foundation. Nesta was started in 1998, uh, and it has an endowment of 400 million pounds. Uh, which it uses to tackle societal challenges. And, and currently Nesta focuses on three areas. Uh, first area is a better start, uh, which is uh, where we are working to reduce the attainment gap uh, for those children who are more disadvantaged in their five first year of life. We have a mission called a healthy life, which is uh, around increasing the number of years lived in health uh, and with a very strong focus on tackling uh, the obesity crisis. Uh, and we have a mission called Sustainable Future, which is about contributing to achieving net zero targets and specifically through uh, decarbonizing homes. So in each of these mi missions, uh, Nesta does projects in collaboration with organizations in the front line, it could be a local authority, it could be a regulator, it could be a business, uh, and we deploy our innovation capabilities uh, in, in those collaborations and, and one of the capabilities data analytics. Uh, I lead the data analytics practice. This is a team of 25 people, including data developers, data scientists, people who uh, do data visualization and develop products. Uh, and our goal is to apply data science, machine learning to tackle this, uh, help tackle these societal challenges. Just to give you a couple of examples of things we do, 
one example would be in the context uh, of uh, a fair start, the mission around education. Um, we have been working with uh, York City Council uh, to analyze their data in order to identify uh, groups which are not accessing early year services uh, so that the council has awareness of those gaps and is able to address them through targeted interventions. Or in the, con or in the context of a sustainable future, we have been doing a lot of uh, predictive analysis work to identify households that um, might uh, be a uh, good, good um, target for the adoption of heat pumps, which is a much more envir environmentally sustainable type of home heating technology than uh, traditional boilers. So it's a very different context, I guess, uh, from all other areas in which uh, AI is deployed, in the sense that uh, our sectors um, very often have uh, small data sets, very fragmented data. Very often you have to create your data. Uh, we are looking at very complex outcomes. Uh, it's not whether someone um, is engaging in social media or is clicking on an ad. We are looking at uh, uh, what happens to a child, like in terms of their educational outcomes, or um, you know whether we achieve net zero targets. Uh, and also, very often, we are working to um, inform high stakes decisions where the cost of uh, algorithmic mistakes could be very high. So we have to be very careful with the kind of modeling approaches we use and, and ethic process, ethics process uh, we implement in all of our projects to, to maximize or minimize the risk of uh, unsafe or unfair outcomes. That, that that's um that's intriguing and there's an interesting overlap between you and, and Detlef in terms of responsible use of algorithms um how to design uh, models of course Detlef's work is more focused on efficiency but there's a broader societal uh impact of uh of, of networks and the use of ai within uh telecommunications networks etc that actually could uh, cross over and have uh, implications for some of the people um, you're trying to uh, support with the, the nest the, the themes again, which are uh, the, the mission driven focus on a fairer start for children, healthy life for all and a sustainable future where the economy works better for people and, and planet. And, um, you know, Nesta aims to achieve these ambitious goals, uh, you know, it, it says in its um, statements by combining its assets of people, data, money and culture in new ways. And you're the data piece of that. Can you say a little bit about the, um, the the data part and how you look at the assets that Nesta has to uh, address the strategic uses of AI uh, in the current economic and organizational context? Yeah, so I think like um, actually Nesta's model is, I guess Nesta is quite unique as an institution in the sense that um, we are collaborating in ecosystems that we want to transform and the data that we use exists in those ecosystems. It's not so much data that is internal to Nesta. So what this means is that uh, a lot of our work consists of, um, for example, in the case of, um, I'll just use an example for a healthy life, just to diversify the missions I talk about, is try to understand what are the, the data gaps in, in um, the system uh, uh, that uh, of organizations whose behaviors lead to um, inf inform different healthy uh, like eating habits and, and might lead to obesity, and it's about almost like trying to identify what is the data that exists that is um, open and we can use. What are the proprietary data sets that we might want to access or try to convince organizations to open? And what, and what are the completely new data sets we might want to create by um, collecting data from the web, collecting data from social media, or even using more, um, I guess, collective intelligence style methods like crowdsourcing with different groups. Uh, and I, I guess one of the things that's very important for us is as much as possible to make sure that all of that data about our mission ecosystems that we create is then uh, released in, in an open way so that it's not just us who analyze it, but other organizations as well. Fascinating. Um, Detlef, uh, from, from uh, in your role, what are, what are the strategic uses of AI in your current economic and organizational context? And do feel free to pick up on any common themes that uh, Juan may have uh, uh, raised as well. Yeah, 
Thank you. The, I mean, VT is a, a typical large scale um, telco. So the challenges that we have is uh, we need to operate a nationwide network. Uh, we offer communication services uh, globally and we have uh, a huge internal operation to manage and uh, large scale customer service interfaces. And this largely informs the type of AI and um, data work that we do. So the uh, typical applications and we're working in, in the AI space for over 20 years and uh, so the, the motivation was mainly to uh, make our internal operations uh, better, uh, perform faster and, and uh, with less interruptions. So you, you see in, in a company like BT typical applications around uh, optimization of resource allocations, so for example management of um, mobile workforce and uh, you, you see applications around uh, understanding telemetry coming out of the network to see th is that in any uh, form indicative of uh, faults or indicative of uh, cyber attacks. So these are the, the kind of typical applications that we have been looking at uh, for a long time. Now we are starting to look into uh, new areas as well. So the, the kind of first service that, that we launched that uh, touches the customer would be our um, uh, product called BT Call Protect, which is a kind of a spam call filter. And there we use an anomaly detection to identify spam callers, which are then manually verified by experts. They go on a, on a list so that if somebody from this list calls, then this goes to a junk mailbox. And uh, but we're looking at uh, kind of uh, other services that we can potentially offer. And so in, in that sense, we are now um, looking at how do we design these kind of systems uh, responsibly, ethically, and uh, with a very high quality standard. Obviously, if they reach out to touch customers, we don't want them to fail. We want them to be fair and unbiased. And this sets off a kind of a large scale program around AI governance. How do you do something like this in a large organization where you have many departments that do their own thing? Right? So you, you kind of have to make sure that you look at all the kind of um, uh, ways that AI can come into the company. It's not just the AI we build ourselves where we have very tight control over, but you find teams that buy AI in maybe as part of applications. And then the challenge is how do we make sure that uh, we, we check that this has been built to the same kind of standards that we want to apply to our own standards. And so this is where we see challenges going forward. And uh, we, we are still in this kind of overhyped phase of AI where AI is largely seen as can do everything is just positive. And, uh, uh, obviously, over the last uh, years, we have seen the uh, discussions around uh, bias in AI and um, AI being applied to, <clears throat> to, to people and then uh, failing on, uh, on bias and fairness kind of criteria. So th this is kind of something that is known, but um, uh, other areas are, uh, I call it AI snake oil. So you, you, you get AI vendors that offer solutions that pretend to do something and but they actually don't do what they advertise. And how do you recognize that this is the case? How do you um, find out that you should stay away from these sort of applications? And this is where we see um, kind of standards missing and uh, kind of best practice missing. One large aspect of my program was always to turn AI into a proper engineering practice and uh, go away from the kind of cottage industry where you see the individual machine learning engineer or data scientist to build something so that we come to a kind of a, a proper engineering practice that follows best practice and standards as they are available. And this is what we are, um, have implemented now. So it's still a journey because even if you go into the professional cloud environments, you don't find all the components that you need to, to run AI end-to-end um, -end professionally. You still have to improvise and um, build your own solutions. So this is the kind of context in, in, in which we're moving and the kind of challenges that, that I'll see is um, kind of just getting this best practice engineering done 
and also getting the, the kind of insight into what is it in AI that actually works and uh, that can be deployed safely. Um, and in that regard, has the pandemic raised certain issues higher up in your strategic priorities and diminished others or recalibrated others? And if, if so, what, what might you be able to share um, about what, what's moved up in, in your strategic priorities as far as applying that to the business? Yeah, I mean, um, we have seen over the pandemic how important it is to keep our broadband services up and running. So there's a, um, a large focus on uh, supporting that. The, um, the company is currently going through a digital transformation anyway, which uh, sees um, data being moved into the cloud and applications moving into the cloud, which will make us more flexible in, in, in the way we can use our data and uh, apply AI machine learning. The, the other um, things that we have seen from uh, within my research team is um, the applications that support uh, kind of remote working or um, things like um, remote communication. So for example, you see um, these kind of applications that um, do video interviews and interpret the results uh, through AI systems. And they do things like, or pretend to do things like emotion recognition and um, uh, speech understanding. But if you look behind that, you see uh, it's not really working and it's uh, um, seen as highly critical and biased. And so we, we see um, an increased uh, kind of necessity to inform uh, the whole business about AI applications we should better stay away from. And uh, how do we understand that what is offered um, in an easy way so we can con convey it to people working in procurement or in, in non-technical areas that this is not something they should touch because the way the way the vendors describe it, obviously, it, it sounds like the best thing since sliced bread. Right? So you, you can just look at video interviews and you find your ideal candidate and this is just not the case so um, this is an obvious kind of application and a lot of researchers have looked at it there was even a, um, a program on the bbc about it recently so this comes into the, the kind of in the public mindset that this is something that you should better stay away from but there are other applications that um, uh, will creep up and um, we need this sort of awareness and develop this awareness in especially non-technical people. So you're, you're also an internal debunker with your team to, to, to help the organization. Um, Juan, picking up on that, um, what leadership barriers exist uh, in terms of taking advantage of the work that you and your team do? Because there are different elements from communicating to your executive leadership and making sure that what you're doing translates well at that decision-making level, but uh, also within uh, government and with uh, business leaders in terms of getting resources to do more of what you feel you need to do. So uh, what, what are some of the leadership challenges that you see in uh, that are barriers? Yeah, so I guess maybe uh, before uh, answering that question, it's useful to give you a bit of the context of what AI looks like in Nesta, just to almost like set, set, set a, a bit of a context for my description of the challenges. Um, and I guess maybe my starting point here is that, and, and maybe this is something that's a bit, it's, it's a funny thing for me to say, given that I am in an AI conference, is that I feel that in some ways, um, if, if we define AI as the, industrial, in the industrialized model of big data, big models, automation of decision-making, um, Actually, we don't do a lot of AI at Nesta, but if we talk about AI uh, in a different way, and it's about the use of data science and machine learning methods to generate insights that can inform better decisions that translate into social impact, then we do AI. And I guess maybe I think of it as maybe as craft AI or artisanal AI as compared to industrialized AI. Um, and the way this looks like is that, um, because as I said before, we need to go into these sectors and discover the data and discover insights in the data and how those insights can be used to inform decisions. It's a very long process. It's a, it's a process of working with partners like a local authority, 
use participatory methods um, to identify the, the challenges they face um, and then build models and tools um, that that address those needs using the data or perhaps data from the outside and very often this is going to be not about automation or removing people from decision making system it's about giving them more information but always keeping them in the loop and i guess a lot of the work we do then means that it's not just data science and machine learning disciplines it's also working together with designers working together with people who are uh, um, um, able to run experiments and with people who have a lot of domain knowledge about the sectors where we work uh, because without that you end up probably trying to solve the wrong problem um, and, and basically what this means also is that very often in these projects like imagine the challenge of uh, closing the attainment gap be between um, uh, those who are most disadvantaged and everyone else uh, there's not going to be a one shot like a silver bullet which is going to tackle that problem uh, basically you have lots of different interventions that are part of a system that hopefully drives impact and helps you to achieve that challenge in our case by 2030 um, what does this mean in terms of leadership what kind of leadership do you need to have in order to be able to work with us in that way it feels that a lot of it is going to be about patience it's not going to be a collaboration that is going to bring immediate benefits. Uh, for example, the partnerships that we have developed with local authorities in our uh, Fair Start mission are between three and five years. So it's quite a long term thing to commit to. You also need to um, have high tolerance for uncertainty. We are not going to a local authority and saying we are going to solve this problem for you. Um, we're saying we're going to work together to identify areas where there are challenges and also develop solutions together. Um, there's also needs to be tolerance for failure. It might be that things don't work out, especially because in many cases we are combining different disciplines. And, and finally, there needs to be like this desire to accept that ultimately it is going to be the job of our partner and its leaders to embed what we do and the solutions into what, what they do. And in a way, it's going to be about their own developing data analytics capability and machine learning and AI capability to own those solutions and, and continue applying them and hopefully improving them over time. So, uh, so yeah, you, you need to be willing to go on a bit of a journey of transformation and, and discovery uh, and collaboration in order to um, benefit from this approach. But we feel it's the only one that's going to deliver the, the results we need in these in this social impact areas where we work. Um, Detlef, in terms of what Juan has said, what, what, what resonates with you? You're, you're in a business where the translation to efficiency, you're really trying to speed that up. And uh, Juan's talking about social impact. Is, do, do you see any overlaps between the research that, that you're doing and some of the areas that might be of concern in Juan's uh, social impact work? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, in, in terms of social impact, the uh, areas that we're looking very closely at is uh, kind of how do we guarantee fairness of models? And um, so the, the other area is always, uh, is AI the right thing, right? So should we uh, apply AI in a particular business case? And uh, so if we decide yes, then the question next is how do we make sure it's fair? And uh, or uh, in more, Generally, how do we make sure it actually works? And um, so this then goes back to the kind of engineering back, uh, best practice and, and follow uh, the right kind of guidelines. The, um, the, the other areas is um, kind of um, educating uh, the people working with AI because uh, um, Everybody has an opinion about AI, right? So it's one of these areas that uh, everybody has seen in the movies and uh, or, or read in, 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 in the news. So there's a lot of kind of uh, attitude and opinion that, that you come across. And um, so cutting through this uh, kind of noise is, is not easy. And the vendors, obviously, they don't have an interest in, in doing that. They uh, still ride the, the hype wave. and. Um, so uh, for, for any kind of, of business that wants to ap apply AI, the kind of the senior leadership has to cut 
through this kind of uh, noise. Um, the issue is that um, leaders who, who are not trained in AI themselves uh, might fall foul of the, the, the kind of hype that they are exposed to. So it's, um, it's then a second level challenge. So I, I'd say that uh, every organization that looks at, at AI needs to go on an education journey and really understand what is this technology and what can it do, what can it not do, and where are all the caveats. So this is uh, the, the kind of the challenge that I see. Yeah, so there's, <clears throat> there's a <clears throat> level of challenge in leadership, both in terms of the three to five year arc that Juan's talking about where you need a commitment and they're going to be, it's going to be a bit of a transformation journey, even in identifying wh where AI is, is useful and where it's not and where some other data modeling approaches need to be used or data science needs to be used in a different way. And uh, in your case, that learning has to happen in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, executive understanding of AI and, um, and their ability to work with you to also guide you in the directions that management wants to go, but they need to be properly informed in order to do that. Which brings us to the second theme of our session today, which is the strategic and operational risks of AI in the current economic and societal context. And I'll start with you, Jan, which strategic and operational risks of AI are of greatest concern to you? And then Detlef can, can pick up on that. Yeah, so I feel like there is, I feel that obviously fairness, uh, and especially with, the, I mean, in, in all domains, but I, I'd say that in domains, many of the social impact domains where we work is particularly salient, the issue of bias in data uh, generating uh, and for outcomes is a big concern. But I feel that there's a lot of awareness of, of that issue. And even, for example, in, in, even in, in civil service and, and even at the local authority level, you find people who are aware of the issues and are thinking hard about mitigating them with the data they have. So I feel that at least in that area, there's awareness. I feel that the issue is that even, and it really brings us back to the, the very nice way in which that left articulated the issue before, which is you might have the fairest model, but if it's deployed, uh, to solve the wrong problem, then it's not going to create a lot of value. You could have a very fair model and a model that equalizes error rates across all groups and still be incredibly exploitative and harmful. Um, and I think then the question becomes, what is the system being implemented to do and who is it going to benefit? And I feel that in the context of um, deployment of AI systems in, in social impact sectors, one of my biggest concerns is the obsession with using AI to make things more cost effective and automate. Um, automate in education, automate in how uh, early year system works, automate in health, you automate. We know the government has been talking about cutting 90,000 civil service jobs. To which extent there's a perception that they can do that because AI is somehow going to be picking up the slack. And I feel that that kind of uh, behavior is something that um, is ultimately going to make systems like public public uh, systems um, and systems for the delivery of public services much more fragile. And it's going to be making those systems much more exploitative and dehumanized um, because very often what this is going to be removing is humans from the loop and the flexibility to respond to new situations and the, and the, and the ability to display empathy and respect the dignity of those who are participating in the system and very often don't have a choice to exit the system. Um, uh, and obviously within all of that, ultimately there's the concern that um, you are starting to build uh, complete black box, which are generating almost like a Kafkaesque situation for the people who are part of the system. Um, I think like a, 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 an issue here uh, that again really, really connects with the point that Detlef made about AI snake oil is the extent to which all of this happens uh, in, with the public sector becoming more reliant on contractors and organizations from the outside who implement black box systems. And very often those systems are opaque, 
because of IP reasons, because the uh, private contractor doesn't want to show how it works because they see that as their secret sauce. Uh, and in a way, what this means is that the public sector becomes hollowed out and it loses the capability to be able to do this work and to be critical about this work, which I think is so important. Uh, and ultimately, all of these things become entrenched and very difficult to change in the way in which we see these days the obviously the atrocious IT systems that we have in the public sector that were laid out decades ago. And now we just add a new layer of flaky AI on top of that, which becomes very difficult to get away from. So I guess that's my concern is, is, is basically use of AI to improve, to make processes more efficient rather than thinking about how you transform systems to improve the outcomes for the people who take part in them. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things that both you and Detlef appear to have in common is this idea that it's um, better to build a strong foundation um, and uh, start architecting on top of that than it is to deal with a, a poorly built structure and try to retrofit and uh, fix and remove the wiring and get behind the walls and all that sort of stuff that you're kind of implying needs to be done when uh, you, you're building uh, systems on top of already opaque systems or already poorly thought through systems. What I'm hearing from both of you, you know, across the session so far is this idea there needs to be more de 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 deliberation and investment in actual um, learning and that patience that you mentioned um, to, to learn things, to invest that time so you can then move more quickly um, later with a stronger uh, foundation. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the things I'm hearing from uh, both of you. And in that regard, uh, this sort of picks up maybe, uh, I'll hand it over to Detlef, picking up on one of your comments, uh, Juan, which appears to touch on this idea of complexity. You know, is the degree of complexity of IT operations and systems and ambitions increases? Is there enough of the right kind of talent to implement responsible AI, machine learning, data science? Uh, do you want to start there, Detlef, and, and then I'll move it back to Juan? Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of what Juan says resonates a lot with me. So um, I'll pick up on this, but first um, to address your question. Uh, the lack of talent is something that we, um, that we feel very much. So it's very um, hard to recruit people with the kind of, right kind of background. Uh, the, uh, that's something that we're doing. We, we pay a lot of attention to make sure that we get diverse teams so that we um, have uh, uh, opinions from different backgrounds. And uh, I think this is especially important in an area like AI. And, um, but it is a big challenge. And um, so we, we can't wait for the um, kind of education to close. Even say if the government pumps a lot of uh, support into this area, it takes three to five years before that bears fruit. So we are looking at educating our own people. And so we have internal programs to upskill uh, our own people through training, which is uh, something that uh, uh, is preferable anyway, because you, you, you want uh, to make sure that the people who already understand the business understand the new technologies that are coming their way and that will influence the way the business works. The um, other areas that are uh, important and I'd like to pick up on is kind of um, one mentioned transparency, black box models. So transparency and trust is the other Part of that that's that's really important and what i think we are seeing already is the commoditization of ai so basically mm -hmm. buying ready-made modules that supposedly can do stuff and where like one uh, pointed out you can't see into it you don't know what's going on in there it's proprietary they don't they don't tell you and you get uh, models that have been built um with massive amounts of compute, like uh, what's called now foundation models, the kind of um, speech recognizers, um, the uh, language models that are built by, by the large tech company uh, companies. You can't afford to, to rebuild these models. And they're trained on like the whole uh, body of Wikipedia. And they pick up all sorts of uh, biased language in there and inappropriate language that you don't want to expose to your employees and your customers. So 
it's um, kind of important that we retain the capability to build these kind of models ourselves mm. with the right kind of um, background data that you want to, to use. So for example, for us as a service provider, then if we want to use um, chatbots to communicate with customers, this needs to be trained on the kind of language that we use when we speak to our customers and not on Wikipedia. So we're looking at how do you build something like this based on real conversations and uh, not on some kind of random body of text that you find somewhere. And also how do you keep these models small and efficient so you don't um, uh, increase your carbon footprint. That's mm. the, the other important thing for us going forward is the energy management uh, of AI. So we are on a um, journey to be carbon neutral for, for the company, but uh, we can't um, kind of jeopardize this by scaling up on AI that uh, burns a lot of compute and, and, and power at the same time. So we're looking at um, how do we keep our AI models small and slick and energy efficient. And um, the, if you do this, you, you get a much better understanding of what it is that you're building. So kind of, if you try to keep it efficient and small, transparency and, and trust comes with it because you, you get a much better understanding of what it is you're building. But there's definitely a, a challenge and, uh, and the risk of buying commoditized AI that we don't understand and that uh, will surprise us when we actually deploy it. Fascinating. Uh, Juan, you want to pick up on the on the on the talent piece, and and then maybe you can transition from the talent question to to talk about leadership barriers to mitigating the greatest risks of AI that you've already uh, highlighted, and whether they're the same or different than, than what you said earlier. And then uh, and then uh, Detlev can speak to the leadership barriers there. Great. So I think in terms of talent, um, I think maybe like in the case of Nesta. We have, a, we have a bit of a self-selection issue in the sense that the people who apply to become data scientists in Nesta have already decided that they, they want to work in a social impact organization um, and maybe are many less interested in, in purely commercial applications um, or say working on ads or working on finance and things like that. So I think like I, we have found that the people who come to us are super interested in responsible AI. It's not like something you need to convince them to do or convince them that they need to be important and take into account ethics. This is something that they come with and they so many so many of them lead on. Uh, and I feel also that because um, we work in so many different areas and with so many different types of data sets, you know, we, we tend to have people who are a bit more all-rounders, maybe like data science generalists, rather than people who are incredibly specialized in a single technique or a single like uh, type of model. And what that means is that this makes them quite versatile. Um, and I guess they able to operate in these complex domains where you might need to use different methods and work with different data, but actually you're also going to be needing to work with domain experts and also with people with other disciplines which I think is something that's critical for just being able to parse that complexity uh, and identify the problems and develop solutions um, that are going to make things better rather than making them worse. So I feel like in that sense, Nesta is lucky that that we get get that 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 kind of people and we're able to, I guess they're they're able to hit the ground running in terms of the areas where we work and and the way we need to work in those areas. I think, like in terms of the um, the chat, the, the going going into the leadership conversation, um, I think I, a lot of what I said before applies to this. In the sense that impatient leaders will look to we look for incremental innovations and look to exploit rather than explore, and they will focus on the cost efficiencies and the cost savings because that's the most obvious thing you can be doing. With, with machine learning um, and algorithmic decision making. So it's almost like for someone to say, no, how, how do we transform this system and how do we improve it um, and use AI for innovation, not just for uh, improving efficiency. That's already going to require that patience. Um, I think something else that I would add here, that again, um, 
really connects with something that Detlef said before about um, uh, it's almost like this idea of, of um, leaders needing to involve, almost like um, um, engage with AI in a more critical and intelligent way rather than being naive about it is, is yeah, just have people who don't think of AI or data science as, as magic and of data scientists and machine learning, machine learning people as wizards because uh, um, I think like when people think of what we do in that way, it's a recipe for expecting things to happen fast, uh, which is not a recipe for being able to diagnose the issues in a system and tack tackle them in the way I've been describing. And also it's going to be generating impatience in terms of what's possible within a set amount of time, which reduces the space to do work carefully, responsibly, and in a way that uh, brings best practice in the way that that Lev was describing. Um, it's a recipe for moving fast and breaking things. That you, and, and that's something that you can't be doing in the kind of sectors where I work, because what you're breaking is people's livelihoods. And there's a risk that um, leaders almost like ignore that in their desire to get things implemented and, and launched and deployed. Okay, that, that's it's very uh, comprehensive and complementary to to Detlef's comments. And it turns out that both of you have been so interesting that we're sort of down to the last um, twelve minutes of of the session. And and uh, so I'll give you you know each a chance to um, you know very briefly, maybe just one minute each, and then we can bring in some questions because some questions are popping up um, from the audience. But uh, in terms of a, a takeaway from this uh, session um, and you know, thinking about ways to kind of look ahead over the next one to three years, what or one to, uh, sorry, one to five years, what 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 takeaway would you like to leave with the audience today, Juan? And I know there are a number; it's fairly co uh, complex. Um, so I guess like there's maybe two things I would flag, and like the first one is my is basically I have this centrist that take on AI, which is that it's not a panacea; it's not going to solve everything, but it's not a disaster either, and we need to avoid factionalism and find the areas where it can be applied um, and, and, and do that carefully. Um, I feel that all sectors stand to be transformed by AI uh, in this way, but there's not going to be a single model of doing AI, like an industrialized model that we see in the tech industry, and there might be other models um, in, in other sectors, like the one where I work, that also need to be acknowledged and we need to think about how we enable them by creating the right types of data, developing the right kinds of models and techniques. Like for example, for us, it's very important um, things like causal machine learning and causal AI uh, and training people in the right way. Uh, and actually just mindful that I just said only a minute, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, Detlef, uh, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll pick up on the leadership aspect. Um, I think uh, for, for leaders, it's import important to realize that Kind of we're coming to the end of the pattern recognition era in, in AI, and we're starting a new area of distributed AI. Even though a lot of companies haven't jumped on the bandwagon yet, that means that we will see a proliferation of uh, AI capabilities and all sorts of devices working on this kind of pattern recognition principle, what we have seen in terms of images, language, um, all sorts of things, which um, carries these risks of bias and, and, and fairness. And so um, I think we are at the point where, where leaders need to challenge their own AI people in the organization. Have you mm. checked this is running uh, ethically and actually does what it says? Do you know that it is working as intended? And so think of it in the way that if you have a dodgy plane that only stays up in the air because you have a very skilled pilot, would you actually install an autopilot in something like this? And uh, so understand the whole context in which you're going to use AI and what it is supposed to be doing and think in terms of human in the loop. So not, not replacing people, but taking aspects of their jobs that are uh, menial that AI maybe can do so they can concentrate on, on the important bits. And looking into the future uh, with the age of distributed AI, I mean, what we are going to see with the proliferation of AI in, in organizations is AI systems collaborating with AI systems and 
nobody has really looked into this space and to understand what's going to happen now. So how do we make sure that these uh, AI systems collaborate in a way that they work towards a common goal, not fight against each other, have their own sort of um, intentions and not pull into the same direction. This is a new challenge that we're going to face. And that's where I'll put in a plug for scenario planning as one method that can be used along with design thinking and the other sort of tools and methods that uh, Juan and you were both sort of familiar with. But for, for the audience, uh, the idea of scenarios is to bring together the multiple stakeholders affected by some issue and then look at plausible scenarios one, three, five, ten years out and then to come back to the current strategy and try to um, uh, make sure it's framed properly to be resilient against uh, plausible worlds that, that might emerge. Um, and so I'll, I'll sort of conclude with that and then draw in the first question for, um, uh, for Detlef uh, on quantum machine learning. Is quantum machine learning already applied in the market or is it still ongoing research? No, uh, quantum computing is still ongoing research. So we, we have seen, um, in, uh, like reports on uh, some company like Google, for example, uh, uh, cracking the quantum supremacy problem, but um, quantum computing in itself is not uh, uh, operational yet. And um, the, the kind of problems that we can tackle with it uh, initially will be kind of small, but yeah, quantum machine learning is potentially something in the future, but it's not really something that you can apply right now. And uh, thank you, Detlef. And, and for Juan, there's a question. Um, how, if ever, do you see public-private partnerships working as effective AI governance practices? Um, so it, okay, so I guess there's two ways to interpret that question. And one of them is more about collaboration within the, between the private sector and the public sector to do the kind of work I was describing. Um, and I think there are lots of opportunities to do it. I think it just needs to be done in a way that avoids the creation of the sorts of black boxes I was describing before. And then there needs to be openness, openness and transparency and as much as possible open source uh, so that and also capability in government and, and public sector to be able to assess what they are what they are buying from the private sector when they bring uh, a machine learning system in and that actually it's a similar problem to the situation that that Lev was describing with the foundation models you know if you're going to build a sys up a, a chatbot or like a text generation system or image generation system that uses you know like a model from open AI or people like that, how how can you evaluate it to make sure it's going to, uh, I guess, address your use case and avoid uh, unexpected uh, outcomes and, 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 and this kind of thing. So, so yeah, uh, and then thinking about governance, uh, I guess, and maybe this is more around the governance of AI uh, and all of the conversations that have been happening about whether we need regulation or whether we need more uh, ethical frameworks uh, and who should be regulating. Uh, I feel that again, in such a fast moving field, you need to have collaboration between different players, including the public sector uh, and the private sector. Um, um, because at the end of the day, in some ways, the, the way it's working these days is that the private sector is much more up to date with what the state of the art with the technologies. So, without their participation, any attempt of regulation is going to be almost like obsolete by default. At the same time, what's also clear is that, you know, this perception that somehow you could rely on the public sector to self-regulate through ethical codes and and this kind of and, and AI principles of which we have seen a proliferation is also naive and, and you actually need to have both things um, in place and a lot of collaboration. Um, I think in this context, obviously, it will be quite, quite interesting to see what happens with the most, I guess, activist type of regulation for AI that we have seen, which is the European AI Act and the role that that plays and how it interacts with the way the private sector does things to govern AI. Yeah, and, and maybe that picks up a little bit on um, Detlef's comment on uh, diversity and how important that is within his team uh, to look at these issues. And there's also been the rise of um, concerned technologists setting up 
um, their own institutes like uh, Tim Ritt, uh, uh, Gebru, formerly of uh, Google. Um, and, uh, you know, that left you see opportunities there for kind of partnerships with concerned technologists who are actually very knowledgeable and, and can contribute uh, strongly to the, the governance um, approaches. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, we have a large academic uh, collaborative program and uh, we value this very much, this input of uh, people with um, different backgrounds, different kind of uh, work areas they're working in, different parts of the world. And uh, I think this is, this is really important. And um, um, I think the collaboration between um, kind of um, commercial, government and um, um, academia, these kind of, of sectors should collaborate more in, in uh, understanding where can we use AI and in what forms uh, should we use AI and how do we control it. So, well, it also uh, seems as if you might have a, a nice uh, potential collaboration with uh, Juan at, at Nesta now. Um, that you've <laughs> kicked off this conversation. Hopefully this panel can uh, help instigate some actual collaborations towards some of these goals. I'll, I'll give you the final question uh, from, from the audience uh, and then we'll, we're, we're done. Um, the question is, uh, digital scenarios are booming over the uh, internet. AI will, um, will help to, to discover new uh, areas in the metaverse. Uh, so what are AI's main impacts in the virtual world? The impact, yeah, well, it's um, anywhere where you have data, uh, AI will be applied. In, in virtual environments, it's even easier because uh, you, you don't need the kind of physical effect of the AI system. And, um, but uh, you have the same challenges and, and problem spaces that you need to look at. And um, so it's... Um, Yes, you will see it probably even more. And if you look at, for example, um, gaming, AI has been loose, used in gaming for, for many, many years. And um, this is very much uh, related to virtual environments and, and metaverse and so on. So I uh, would expect a lot of AI very quickly to be applied in this space. But it will come with the same sort of caveats and problems that you see in the real world. Well, thank you, Detlef, and thank you, uh, Juan. I, I know I very much enjoyed uh, the rich interaction between the two of you um, and, uh, and in this conversation, and I hope we're able to continue it offline. Uh, I'm grateful thanks to BSI for uh, convening this panel and for uh, inviting me to, to chair this session. And uh, with that, uh, I want to thank the audience for their listening and for their participation and hand it over to our host, David uh, Kaka of uh, BSI. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being an excellent chair. Cheers. Juan Detlev, Cheers. Um, thank you so much. And a particular thank you to you, Sanjay, for steering a wonderful debate and conversation. Um, debunking snake oil was, was one of the things I picked up from that. But thank you very much indeed. You're most welcome, David, and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we move on at pace. A um, bit of a shifting gear here, um, a topic very close to my heart. Um, when Phil and I talked about prepping for this session, um, we changed tact a little bit because I felt that Phil had some really interesting um, insights and thoughts on re-examining standardization for AI. What does the kind of future look like for standards in AI? And, how do we respond um, to the kind of new demands uh, that will be applied on standardization and, and regulation? What are the strategies we need to kind of consider going forward? Um, just a quick reminder, please submit your questions um, as we go through, and then I will hopefully try and pose as many as I can to, to Phil at the end of his um, presentation. So Phil Dawson, um, is AI policy lead at Swartz Reisner Institute for Technology and Society. Um, he is a lawyer um, and public policy advisor. Um, so, and I think will be joining us from Canada. Um, so, welcome, Phil. Hopefully, you're there, and I will hand over you to you the control, and um, I'll join you at the end. 
Um, I am, I should say good afternoon. It's morning here in Montreal, Canada. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you to BSI and the conference organizers for having me today. I must say that this is a conference I would very much have enjoyed attending in person. I have lived and studied in London. I have many good friends and colleagues there, and this is such a, just such a fantastic group of speakers from some key organizations in the UK standardization ecosystem and really globally. So I'm hoping we'll be able to catch up some other time, virtually perhaps, and, and maybe soon in person. Um, thank you for the int introduction, David. It's a pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of the Schwartz Reason Institute. I want to say a little bit more about SRI, as we have a strong focus in our policy research and programming on regulatory innovation, looking at new ways of using law, regulation, policy, and critically, standards, certification, and technologies as ways to help operationalize these instruments and help governments and firms keep pace with the speed, complexity, and unique challenges of regulating AI. It's an increasingly dynamic time in the world of AI policy, uh, ever more so over the last four years. And many people who have been attending this conference have likely been following closely. For those of you who are a little newer, the phases of development and work have looked a little bit like this. We've had a principles phase uh, with the most significant effort probably coming from the OECD. We've had ethical frameworks being developed by companies. We've had guidelines being developed from the European Commission through a high-level expert group. And of course, more recently, we've had proposed regulations uh, in the EU, uh, draft bills in the US, uh, discussions in the UK and elsewhere, which of course has expedited national interest and progress on standardization. And so if, if the AI policy observers uh, uh, are now shifting their focus a little bit, I would, I would argue uh, in some ways, uh, or at least it might appear, appear that way, a shift from looking at regulation even, even as we had those discussions, to understanding how standards fit in. But if, like many people here, have been paying a little bit closer attention, standardization has actually been part of the effort uh, the entire time. And in many cases, it has directly informed these initiatives. So why this sudden uptick in attention, which is something that I perceive, uh, I think it's true, why the sudden uptick in attention by government, industry, civil society, academia, they really across the spectrum of stakeholders? Because I think we're seeing a series of new demands on the AI standards ecosystem. These are not new demands for any one technology, but I think for AI, they are kind of new. Innovation and commercialization. There's a, a greater need and interest all the time to realize the benefits of AI. This one is not particularly new, but I would say it's, it's heightened uh, uh, on, on a monthly basis. As capabilities develop and new opportunities evolve, uh, standardization uh, has, a, has a huge role to play in, 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 in creating a solid foundation on which innovation can take place. We've had regulatory frameworks that directly in incentivize conformity with harmonized standards. We've had also the rise of an AI assurance market, auditing and certification initiatives. And we've also had uh, some discussions on about whether or not, if we are going to um, confer so much of a, so, uh, such, a, such a significant space for standardization, whether or not the, the traditional processes are democratic enough, whether or not they're inclusive enough, whether or not they are accessible. So there's been a, a heightened um, focus of attention from civil society and the public, and rightly so. And of course, global trade and interoperability um, in the context of potentially diverging regulatory regimes and some of the lessons we've learned from personal data protection and cross-border data flows uh, post GDPR uh, have signaled to all of us that some form of cooperation or alignment on standardization or harmonization would be desirable. And then there are other geopolitical and foreign policy considerations which 
which we won't get into today. So in short, there have been multiple sources of pressure, and I would argue new pressure, significant pressure, coming from the market, coming from regulators who are, who are, who are trying to make the best use of the policy instruments at their disposal and realizing their standard, standards and soft law instruments um, are a flexible, uh, a flexible tool. We have uh, sources of pressure from public, legit public legitimacy pr perspective and, and credibility of the standardization ecosystem um, in, in the role that it might play for AI. We have e economic competitiveness and, and geopolitical here. It's just repeated here for good measure. <laughs> so it, it, going back to the outside and the insider's view, you know, depending on where you sat, if you if you if you're kind of an insider, you might have thought that you know you've been watching a a train wreck in slow motion, and and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but just to say that you know these 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 sources of pressure and and the uh, the the weight of the pressure has been building up in a sense slowly over a number of years, and whether you know the standard ecosystem is the train move, moving very fast or the bridge that is supporting the AI policy uh, caboose uh, or locomotive, then uh, you know I, I think I thought this was an interesting way to to, to convey the strain uh, that we're I think we're experiencing. So let's look at the current state in Philip Dawson's opinion of the AI standards ecosystem, and I think you know David mentioned. Uh, a little bit about my bio, but I've had the pleasure of uh, co-chairing uh, a national standards effort in Canada on data governance that touched on a little bit of AI. So I, I had a, a really um, nice overview of what is going on in Canada and internationally for the last number of years uh, from a AI standards ecosystem perspective. So of course, largely voluntary processes. Traditionally industry-led, driven by market priorities, not necessarily broad public policy outcomes. Sometimes, uh, sometimes though, for sure. Mixed levels of openness and accessibility. There's international coordination that occurs among some standard bodies. And I would say there's a growing desire for cooperation between states, particularly in the last year. We can note some significant initiatives such as the US-EU Trade and Tech Council. Uh, there was a recently announced a uh, bilateral uh, or partnership between uh, NIST in the United States and Standards Council of Canada. You might have seen that last week. So there is there is more and more coordination happening. But I think you know this is the current this is what the current environment looks like. And these are and, and this is these are the dynamics that we are working with as we try to respond to the the pressures at hand. So that's where we are. Well, where do we want to go? Um, and, and we'll try and keep this little focused because we go in, we could go in so many directions. So what is a mature or what is a maturing technical standards environment look like? Uh, well, this is pulled from the Center for Data Ethics and Innovations, uh, some of the, some of the uh, accompanying materials that was re that were released uh, in December with the AI Assurance Roadmap. Um, this is just you know basics for many people attending today, but the four kind of types of technical standards that can be supportive of uh, AI innovation and, and some regulatory objectives, foundational standards, process standards. I think you know, progress has been made on some of these for a number of years um, at the international level, at the national level as well. Um, the, ones that the ones that take a little bit more time um, and uh, a little bit more resources, a little bit more coordination, uh, are the measurement standards and performance standards we'll need. So, for instance, how to measure bias, what levels of bias are acceptable in a particular domain. If we can ever get to a determining what those thresholds should be in the, uh, in the exponential number, number of use cases uh, that will emerge. This, these are critical areas. They're, they're resource intensive, and I think that we'll, they will require strategic investments and coordination. So when at Schwartz Reason Institute, when we're discussing regulatory innovation uh, or design of regulatory systems uh, or building regulatory markets, uh, to quote a paper from Jillian Hadfield, our chair, who co-authored with Jack Clark, 
well known um, uh, to people attending this conference. How do we ask ourselves, how do we accelerate the pace and quality of our efforts? How do we build this market? How do we leverage standards to build this market? And how do we do so uh, to meet our objectives in a timely manner? Well, one way of doing this is to look at lessons from other models. There, there, are not every mod, not there are not a lot of models out there that are that lend themselves very easily to AI. These are two that I've heard of: cybersecurity, most commonly. But I'm going to talk a little bit today about some lessons from the standard the standardization world um, of the unmanned aircraft systems world, the drone world, and in part this is because I, I worked as a drone standards and policy lead at the International Civil Aviation Organization, the UN specialized agency that regulates uh, that develops standards for aviation, and 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 uh, and I had a front row seat to some of the uh, interesting and innovative initiatives and programs that uh, civil aviation authorities in the UK, uh, the US, in Europe, in Canada, in the 192 UN member states, how they went about trying to accelerate the pace and quality of efforts to develop performance standards for drones that would enable commercialization and help build a new regulatory system for unmanned aircraft systems. So some similarities, uh, but why, why are we talking about this? Well, there was a, the unmanned aircraft systems or drones uh, work on a risk-based categorization of operations. So, you know, kind of similar to some of the discussions that are emerging on AI, the, 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 the you know, high, medium, low, different, different jurisdictions call them different things, complex operations, simple operations. But the point was the more complex or so the higher the risk, the more obligation. Uh, that would that would come, uh, or the stronger a safety case would be, uh, would have to be to to permit the operations. And commercialization and licensing or certification was dependent on standardization and progress in standardization in a number of areas. Traffic management systems sound familiar. Uh, detected avoid capabilities could how. What was the level of performance for, for a drone being able to detect an object while flying and avoid it? The C2 link, the command and control link, um, how, how, how resilient uh, was the data link between the controller and the drone in different types of weather? Separation standards, how do you measure uh, what is an acceptable separation standard for drones compared to, to traditional aircraft? So, there, there, there were on and on, remote re uh, ID, uh, registration, there are a number of areas that were identified as key components, whether as process standards or performance standards, uh, that where progress would have to be made to enable operations. And uh, the increased demand for innovative ways of developing measurement and performance standards forced the hand of policymakers and led to some very innovative approaches. Uh, and this slide looks like a repeat, so we'll skip it. Okay, so I mentioned, you know, the US, UK, Canada, the EU, all had similar programs. These were multi-year, large-scale strategic pilot programs. They feature consortia of regulators at the national, local levels, or local level as applicable, industry, standard bodies, academia, and there was opportunities for public engagement. What they did was they identified um, and then tested priority drone operations according to the level of maturity of the operations and, and, and different regulatory, commercial, or public uh, potential that these operations offered. And then they collected data to inform the development of technical performance standards. So the industry had an opportunity in the supervised context, and we're talking a lot about sandboxes for AI, had an opportunity to test drone delivery or flight over people, over the built environment, um, or flight beyond visual line of sight, collect feedback from regulators and collect their own data to, to help develop technical performance standards and hopefully strengthen safety cases and build, uh, build um, uh, data sets to, to inform these performance standards. What this did actually is also catalyze the growth of companies developing technologies for, for traffic management or some of the capabilities uh, that I mentioned before, uh, 
and and and, and I know that having followed uh, some of the discussions in the UK, that this is of interest. Uh, how do we cultivate a uh, an environment or catalyze the growth of companies that can supply supportive regulatory or assurance services? In this case, it worked quite well for drones. Some caveats, okay? It's not a perfect example. I, I recognize that. AI has already been commercialized and is in use everywhere. Uh, this is not the case for drones. Uh, there, there was a, uh, there was a, all complex or high risk operations, uh, had to be, had to obtain a waiver from existing rules. Uh, so this created a huge blockage, uh, to commercialization. Um, and this doesn't exist for AI, right? The, uh, and so this may dampen the perception of a need for coordinated resource intensive and strategic efforts, but I don't think it should. Another important caveat, drone and stakeholder incentives and objectives are far more aligned and clear. They're centered on safety. Uh, I think we all know that a stakeholder perspectives in the AI world uh, are, are, are different uh, or diverging. I think we will see that change a little bit in the coming years as, uh, as, as industry and civil society perspectives in some ways are already converging a little bit. Um, in some ways, because industry is waking up to the reality uh, uh, and imperatives of what we call trustworthy or responsible AI, both from a business case perspective, but also from a, uh, a, a societal uh, and certainly reputational perspective. So the main point from this comparison is there is a strategic way of going about building technical standards. It's been done in other industries. This is not a surprise to some people. Uh, listening uh, today or attending attending today, but I think it, it bears repeating that strategic procurement and innovation programs centered on testing and standardization can move the needle. So what might this look like in, in the AI context? Uh, I invite you to think outside the box a little bit with me. Uh, I don't know if this is feasible. I don't know exactly how it might work. But let's let's dream a little. So a prototype of an AI testing hub. These are some these are some thoughts. Some of some of these I think you're in the UK in particular you're already moving ahead with some of the pieces. So th this could be established through partnership between industry, standards bodies, academic labs. Uh, I note the BSI Alan Turing partnership that was just formed in January. Program could have a similar program where we identify AI capabilities that would benefit from standardization and test and collect data on them in a systematic way. Uh, could run pilots that apply aud emerging auditing and certification frameworks. Priorities could be set democratically by AI councils that are already in place to enhance legitimacy and enable some level of coordination between government and the public uh, and civil society. I think it could also help catalyze growth of AI startups and companies developing assurance and audit auditing technologies, which I know is something that is a priority, at least in some of the documentation we've seen come out of the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation and, and uh, the National AI Strategy here in the UK. And this type of testing hub could be embedded into other pu uh, public procurement of AI, innovation R&D spending programs uh, as a, as a uh, a um, stopgap for certification or auditing uh, as the as those uh, as those mechanisms mature. I have just a little bit of time, so I'm going to go a little a little faster. Oh, so there you know some complementary policy adjustments would support uh, the creation of AI uh, testing hub. You would want to include uh, address the inclusion and accessibility uh, criticisms. And here are some of the ways that people are thinking about this. Tax credits for SMEs to enable them to participate. Some funding for civil society academic groups. And maybe tailored support for companies developing AI assurance technologies, recognizing the key role they will play in actually helping to operationalize legal principles, uh, trustworthy AI best practices at scale. Um, and, and then uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody, and I, we can share, share the slides, but there are some ideas for enhancing regulatory coordination that I also think um, uh, these, the, the creation of these testing hubs globally uh, in partnership even would help. So, as I said, uh, thank you for dreaming with me a little bit. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but it might just be crazy enough to work. Thank you very much. Bill, thank you so much indeed. Um, I would normally at this point ask you to put your camera on, but we might stress the technology, um, given, given your, your distance and the challenge we had at the beginning. But I'm going to I'm going to ask you because we're a little bit over time, but I'm going to I'm going to kind of pose one question, I guess, to you. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of your thinking. So so you're preaching to the converted or the convicted, whichever way you look at it. Um, what I believe you're proposing is, is some sort of standardization sandbox, sort of similar to what we see within the kind of regulatory environment where we kind of see this regu regulation or regulatory sandbox within financial services. Um, this is going to take quite a cultural change. Um, are, are there kind of areas, one or two areas, just in your, your mind, which could be quick wins for this? Um, things that we could focus on to, to test, to get this theory sort of move more from sort of an I crazy idea into something that's more of reality. J just some thoughts from you on that. Thanks, David. And I I'm, I'm, can't explain, but I'm not able to open my webcam. So uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I assure you, I look perfectly normal and, and uninteresting, <laughs> but I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still happy. Uh, I'm, I'm still apologize because it'd be nice to, to connect a little bit that way. Um, great question. Some easy wins. Oof. I don't know. Easy wins. I think easy places to start, I think. Um, would be looking at some of the so-called high-risk applications that are being discussed in regulations. Uh, and yes, we're developed, we have risk management, we have process standards underway at various levels uh, in the standardization world at ISO. We have the AI management system standard. NIST is working on a risk management framework uh, uh, and so on. Um, so I think in, in some senses, I think progress on those process standards, let's say, is in hand. What we'd like to see, I think, from these testing hubs, which, which um, is, is a focus more on the performance standards that we, we are in the measurement standards. Um, and I think, you know, a natural place to start might be on bias measurement. I think it'll be more challenging to come to uh, stand, standardized outcomes for bias in, uh, you know, the plethora of domains that, that uh, that would be relevant, but I think bias measurement uh, in in particular industries, and we think of the ones that are often noted in the kind of high risk, high impact applications, or in financial services, in healthcare, um, and recruitment, and human and and uh, and human resources related decision. You know, some of some of the some of those fields. Um, I think a systematic program of testing in these verticals. Uh, could go a long way um, and, and and help uh, at least inform companies' best practices on on on, on how to measure bias. Um, look, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I've worked in policy, uh, I'm, and I'm I'm no expert in statistical methods. Uh, but the folks that I spend time with at SRI and other places who are technical experts, you know. Are, are quite clear. This is pretty complicated. Uh, how you choose to measure bias outcomes. Uh, it, 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 you know, some type of guidance and then ultimately some, some standardization um, would be extremely beneficial. And I think priorities would be in, in areas where AI is already being used uh, ubiquitously and where, uh, you know, people's, people's rights or or, um, or 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 health and well-being are engaged. Um, so I think you know, and I think there's there's good reasons to look to the list of so-called high-risk uh, or high-impact um, applications. Phil, thank you so much indeed. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, 
but this does warrant a much longer discussion. I don't think we've, we've done it justice in, in the half an hour that we had. So maybe, or well, certainly you and I will pick up on this offline and, and maybe we should do a, a longer session, uh, perhaps in a, in a few months time, if, if that's okay with you. But thank you so much indeed. It's really enlightening and um, have a good rest of your day. Thank you very much, David. Thanks to everyone. And uh, yeah, I would love to pick up with anybody uh, on this topic. And uh, thanks, thanks for, for, for having me today. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. Thanks indeed. OK. So we're moving on. Um, I am delighted to, to welcome our next speaker. I've, I've seen Anna speak before and she's um, is a great speaker and very passionate along with all the other speakers that we've had. Um, so Anna Philander is gonna to talk to us about AI, an enabler or disenabler for achieving SDGs. Um, as it says on the slide, Anna is um, founder and president, she can correct me if I get this wrong, Anch AI, and please do Anna correct me if I've got this wrong. And Anna is one of um, Sweden's leading experts on the effective effects of digitalization on organizations, society and economy. I'm looking forward to this. Anna, over to you. Good afternoon. Um, for those of you who are on this morning, I am um, Tim McGar, the sector lead for BSI. Um, so now we're going to go on to our uh, next session, which is around the uh, AI Standards Hub. Um, so this will be chaired by myself and shortly we'll have um, Florian speak, then myself and Stuart Kitney, who's the head of department for data science at MPL, and I will have a discussion. So our first um, and, only, and only presenter in the session is Florian Osman, the head of AI governance and regulatory innovation of the public policy program in the Allen Turing Institute. Florian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. So as Tim mentioned, I will take the next 10 minutes or so to give a brief introduction to the AI Standards Hub, um, which is a new initiative, relatively new initiative that some of you may have heard about, um, but not everyone will. Um, and so I'll, I'll start sort of at the outset by uh, providing a quick summary of the background uh, for, the, for the Standards Hub. I'll touch on the mission that the hub is trying to achieve, the motivation behind it, um, and then I'll talk about the different areas of activity that we envisage for the hub. Um, and that will then sort of provide the basis for, for our discussion uh, later on. So in terms of background uh, for the AI Standards Hub, the AI Standards Hub has its roots in the national AI strategy that the UK government published last autumn. It's one of the commitments, one of the short-term commitments uh, set out in the AI strategy. And uh, January earlier this year then saw the announcement that the hub will be um, set up um, as a pilot phase uh, led by the Alan Turing Institute and in close collaboration with the British Standards Institution and the National Physical Laboratory. All three of our organizations are also working closely and will continue to work closely with the digital standards um, team in DCMS and the Office for Artificial Intelligence. So far, um, our work has been largely behind the scenes, but we have been doing uh, a lot of initial uh, sort of targeted engagement and, and research work to inform the strategy for the hub um, and inform the thematic priorities. And I'll say a bit more about that um, later on. But um, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's, that's the background. Um, it's an initiative we're very excited about and um, one that will take fuller shape and take on a more public facing uh, form uh, very soon. And I hope uh, a lot of you listening to us today will join us on, on that journey. The hub at its core is, is, is all about building a community around AI standardization. And so we hope that many of you will join us on, on the journey of building that community. In terms of the uh, mission for the Standards Hub, um, at a high level, the mission for the Hub is to make a contribution to advancing responsible AI in the UK, specifically by unlocking the role that standards can play, both as a governance mechanism, as well as an innovation mechanism. A governance mechanism um, 
is is quite clear and i think we we will hear more about that um during later sessions in the conference today um we'll hear about the work that the center for data ethics and innovation for example has been doing around ai assurance and the, the role that standards can play as a governance tool um, in that context it's also clear that standards have an important role to play as an innovation mechanism um, that will be sort of well familiar to to any of you who are already familiar with standards um, for those of you who are less familiar with standards um, the, the process of developing standards for example can play an important role in uh, knowledge sharing uh, sharing knowledge about best practices and standards can of course also play an important role in facilitating international trade for example um, and and uh, spurring the adoption of technology in, in, in various other ways. So that's the, the high level objective is to unlock the potential of standards and think about the role that standards can play within the AI ecosystem. But then more specifically, there will be a strong focus and that's really at the, at the core of the initiative to empower stakeholders across various stakeholder groups to uh, become active within the AI standardization landscape. And that uh, includes um, empowering stakeholders to become actively involved in participating in the development of standards, as well as uh, being able to make informed use of standards or, or become an informed consumer of standards once they, once they have been, been published. And uh, in thinking about that, that stakeholder empowerment function, um, there's a central tenant for the hub to adopt a multi-stakeholder perspective. So to think about the needs and interests of uh, stakeholders in industry, as well as uh, stakeholders in uh, government, uh, regulators, civil society, consumer groups, uh, as well as academic researchers. Think about the role that each of these groups uh, have to play in developing and using standards and, and the needs they face in becoming in, in being able to, to become more active in the space. Now, a few short words about the scope of the hub, um, or put differently, what we mean by standards in this space. Again, this will be very familiar to any anyone uh, listening who is already familiar with standardization as a field. Um, some of you may be less familiar. And so just to clarify that the focus of the hub will be on standards, those standards that are developed by recognized standards development organizations, especially SDOs at the international level. And so some examples um, that, that will be familiar to many of those SDOs include uh, the International Standards Organization, ISO, IEC, SENS, ADELEC, ETSI, um, or IEEE, for example. Now, those standards contrast, for example, with regulatory standards and professional standards. Um, we're interested, of course, as part of the hub to explore connections to those other types of standards, but the focus will be on standards developed in SDOs. Standards developed by SDOs have a long history, and that's of course reflected in the long history of BSI and the, you know, the, 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 the omnipresence of standards in many areas of life. And recent years have seen growing efforts across these organizations to develop international standards for AI as a new and emerging technology. So that's the focus, um, and that increased that those growing efforts are the starting point for the motivation for, for the Standards Hub. More specifically, thinking about the motivation, why, 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 do, we need, you know, why do we need the Hub? Uh, why, why do we think the work that, that we're pursuing can make, an, in, uh, sort of a, make a contribution to, to um, advancing uh, responsible AI adoption? There are three factors um, that I'd like to briefly highlight. The first one is a number of trends that point towards uh, the increased importance of standards in relation to AI uh, as a technology, both as a governance mechanism, as I mentioned, but also as an innovation mechanism. Now, those trends include various um, signals and policy positions um, that we've seen in the UK. Uh, so the UK government has signaled an increased attention around the role that standards can play as part of a broader technology governance uh, toolbox that's reflected in the discussion of standards in the national AI strategy, but also the government's plan for digital regulation. And so it also reflected in the uh, AI assurance roadmap um, that the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation published, and that we will hear more about uh, later this afternoon. So those are very important developments at the national level, but then at the international level, they're equally 
important developments that also contribute to the increased importance of standards for AI. The most prominent example probably is the EU AI Act, which um, many of you will have heard about that's currently in the making. And uh, the EU AI Act is structured in a way that will leave a lot of details um, in terms of the compliance requirements that um, AI systems will be expected to meet. We leave a lot of those requirements um, to the, the content of standards that will have to be developed at the European level. As a second motivational factor, there's the fact that AI standardization touches on the interest of many stakeholders. Now that's generally true for standardization in any area, but um, arguably um, there's a pronounced salience of this multi-stakeholder aspect in the case of AI. If you think about the various you know, issues and questions that arise around trustworthy AI, ethical AI, responsible AI, um, and we've heard about many of those throughout the conference. Um, those, those issues highlight the importance of consumer voices, for example, civil society perspectives and regulatory perspectives, perhaps more so in, in, in AI than in some other technology contexts. And then finally, there's the fact that recent years have seen a rapidly expanding range of standards that are already being developed for AI. So the space is rapidly evolving and it can be quite difficult for stakeholders who are interested in the space to keep track of relevant developments. In particular for those stakeholders who are less familiar with standardization as a field, it can be quite difficult to identify which are the standards that are being developed that are most relevant to me as a business, for example, as a startup, perhaps which are the standards that I should try to uh, seek to shape, which standards are less relevant to me. And so that increased complexity is, is a third motivation um, for setting up the AI standards hub. Now, a few words on the areas of activities that, that we envisage for the standards hub. So how, how is the AI standards hub going to pursue its mission? There are four main pillars of activity that we have set out to pursue. All of those will be reflected in the website that we're currently developing. Um, and the next uh, big step uh, is going to be for the Standards Hub website to be published in the coming months. Um, all of those four pillars will be re reflected on the website, but in addition, there'll be important um, in-person activities, um, especially around the community pillar and the education pillar. But I'll briefly go through, through each of those pillars. So the first pillar is the AI Standards Observatory. That will take the form of a database on the website, um, a database that tracks standards that are under development as well as standards that have been published and it will allow users of the website to filter that database according to various criteria and to search identify those standards that are most relevant um, for their purposes the second pillar is around connecting and community building in that area the hub will pursue various activities to bring stakeholders together in some cases stakeholders within the same group um, but also stakeholders across different groups to enable conversations around what do priorities for AI standardization in the UK look like, what are um, possible strategies for seeking to shape standards development internationally, and so on and so forth. And some of those activities will take place online. There'll be an online discussion forum and ways for connecting um, online. Uh, in addition to that, we'll have in-person activities um, that will have a community building character. The third pillar will be focused on education, training and professional development. So that will include e-learning materials, but also in-person training events. Those may be focused on the one hand on education and training around processes of standardization. So how um, do I get involved in developing standards, for example? What's the process for getting certified if I'm using a standard and related questions? And then secondly, education and training around best practices for AI. So what are the, the kind, what's the kind of knowledge um, that's needed to be able to draft a standard, um, say a standard for bias mitigation in AI systems? What are the best practices that should, should be reflected in that standard? And then finally, there's a pillar focused on research and analysis. This is where the hub will uh, seek to inform the direction um, of AI standardization in the UK and internationally by looking at gaps in the in AI standardization landscape, identifying areas of standardization that are particularly important for the UK economy, 
um, and more generally thinking about trends and, and priorities. So that's in a nutshell um, the, the program, uh, the mission and how we intend to pursue it. Um, in, in a few brief words, um, I'll, I'll say a bit about you know, what we've been up to over the last few months and what the next steps will look like. So we've been quite busy, um, as mentioned, um, you know, behind the scenes um, to some extent, the, developing the website, of course, is a, is a major endeavor and that is making good progress. Um, a next big step will be, as I mentioned, to, to publish that website. But we've also been doing a solid amount of um, research and engagement um, to inform the strategy of the AI Standards Hub. And that, that has included various roundtable events um, that, that have sought input from different stakeholder groups, all the different groups that I mentioned earlier that, that, that are relevant um, to the Hub's mission. So engagement with, with industry, um, which has included both established companies, but also startups and smaller companies, engagement with regulators, engagement with civil society and consumer groups, um, and academic researchers. Um, and engagement uh, with those groups has focused on two areas. On the one hand, understanding user needs. So what are the, um, you know, what are the challenges that different groups face in either engaging with standards development or using standards? Um, and then secondly, identifying thematic priorities. So what, what are the areas of standardization um, in the AI space uh, that, that are particularly salient and that the hub should be focused on? And so that's been, that's been sort of a, an ongoing, part of that research is still ongoing and we'll present, present the results of that um, in, in due course. Um, but that's the process we're going through um, and that will inform the, the strategy um, that, that we'll publish alongside the website when it goes live, um, that will we'll set out you know, a program of activities that's reflected in the website, but as I mentioned, also goes beyond the website um, will involve working groups and, and other forms of, of engagement um, around different thematic areas um, and around different standardization priorities. So this is where, I, where I'll end. Um, the, the very last slide includes a link. Um, so we've, we've published a, and some of you may have seen this already, we've published a sign-up form. Um, we've, we already know the URL that the Standards Hub website will have, which is aistandardshub.org. If you Go to that URL. Um, you will find a form that will allow you to sign up for updates. Um, so, you know, once the website goes live, you will get a notification. We'll also, you know, potentially reach out to you with with some surveys to further inform the strategy if you're interested in participating in that kind of exercise. And the survey also provides an opportunity to uh, share any input or feedback that you would like to share with us. So, if there are any particular areas of interest, any particular questions that are burning. Um, on your mind as you think about AI standardization and how the hub might help um, in you know advancing the space, um, please please um, make use of the form for that purpose and share any thoughts that you have um, through that channel. And we'll be you know we'll, we'll look forward to to receiving that and processing that as we refine the strategy for the next few months. So I hope um, you know that gives a sort of a, a, a rough idea of, of what we are intending to do. And I also hope that you'll join us on the journey um, and that we'll get to see each other um, before too long um, in, in you know, some one or the other of, of the Hub's activities. Thank you, Florin. Um, and hopefully the URL will also be published um, out to you all very soon. So just before we go into this, I think it's worth mentioning a bit about BSI, we've not discussed that today. So. We're the UK national standards body and we provide the UK voice into European standards through SENELEC and international standards primarily through ISO and IEC. But as Florian mentioned, the sort of scope of the, um, the hub goes well beyond just that standardization into many other relevant topics. Um, and also the themes that Florian touched on around um, regulation, but also governance have come up a lot today and related topics of um, compliance and risk management. So I think there should, for those of you who've been on for most of the day, you should see what, what the relevance of this is. Um, so I think sort of starting from um, from this, um, in terms of the, for both Stuart and Florian, where do you see 
the audience this being? I mean, we're talking it from a UK initiative, but clearly some of these things are international and, and all our organizations are internationally focused. So if you could just give some, give some thoughts about how you see the scope of the, the hub growing outwards. Um, Stuart, do you want to go first? Yeah, very happy to. So thank you, Tim. And I'd just really quickly give a brief explanation of what the National Physical Laboratory is. So we're, we're a measurement standards organisation, as some people may be aware, and, and where we get the opportunity to contribute to the standards or we'll have input is, is very much around the pre-normative research that feeds into standards development. So from our perspective, um, we do support SMEs across the UK with a national measurement infrastructure so where I see the AI standards are playing a key role is just unwinding and simplifying some of the complexity that is beginning to develop around AI standards. So I think it's got a role to play both nationally in supporting all organisations from SMEs to, to multinationals, but then being part of an international community that looks to really generate the benefits and maximise the benefits that can be achieved through um, AI standards and regulation uh, through through innovation that Florian really clearly articulated in the presentation. So I, I think there's I think the standards hub is very exciting. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for the UK to really take leadership here with what we're we're trying to do with the standards hub. But I think it feeds in more broadly to an international arena and how the UK can really take a leadership role here. Lawrence? Yeah, I think perhaps, perhaps just to add to that, so I, I, I completely agree, and I think the you know the short answer, Tim, to your question is that it's both audiences um, that you know that 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 are relevant and that are our target. So, if we think about the the mission. On the one hand, clearly there is the aim to um, build a community around AI standardization within the UK and think about the UK's AI ecosystem and making connections also to the UK's you know work on AI governance and and making sure that work on standards aligned aligned with that. But then at the same time, it's you know obvious that most relevant standards that we're currently seeing are developed at the international level. Um, that in order you know to be successful in um, developing effective standards, um, work will need to happen internationally. Um, and uh, you know so there's a strong case you know from the outset to think about working collaboratively across countries internationally, to make sure that priorities are aligned um, and that you know, yeah, that forces are joined in in pursuit of of a common common goal, rather than pursuing separate initiatives um, that that don't end up connecting and meeting in the in the same spot. And and in terms of the you know some of the uh, functionalities, for example, that we think about the website, the website of course will be open to anyone um, internationally, and and we do think that and hope that for example the the standards database will be a valuable resource for anyone really, um, because it will be an international database. Yeah, I, one of the things that is very interesting, we now work, as I think all our work involves bringing together different stakeholder groups, and you mentioned some of them, I mentioned some earlier on, so uh, civil society, um, you know, consumers, businesses, government regulators, and as always in, in the work we do, those people come with different views. I was wondering if Florian, you could sort of bring sort of some of the insights we got from the roundtables to the group and, and, and where different groups see different things. I mean, in particular, I'm thinking about some of the conversations we had between the smaller firms and the larger firms and how they see the different perspectives around the kind of work we're doing. Yes, yes, uh, absolutely. So I think you know we've got we, we got an, a richness of, of of sort of insights from those roundtables, and um, in many ways I think they sort of support some of our initial assumptions and sort of the hypothesis you know behind the hub in terms of the importance of thinking about each stakeholder groups and the fact that there are unique challenges and and unique interests in for for each group. So. You know what, what's been quite clear, for example, in comparing larger companies and smaller companies, especially startups, is the fact that there's often you know, there's a, a big difference in awareness, for example, around the role the role of standards. Um, larger companies, of course, you can't completely generalize, but as a matter of tendency, larger companies, especially if they are you know if they work across sectors, um, will have a historical awareness of of standards, technical standards, and will have used them in the past, will have contributed to their development in the past. Whereas startups, um, 
you know, may, may, maybe have much, much weaker awareness of those issues. If, if you sort of start a business, standards isn't necessarily your first, you know, the first uh, um, point on your agenda. Um, and uh, at the same time, it's clear that thinking about standards is, is key for business success. If you think about, you know, market access internationally, so there's, there is a lot to be gained for, for startups to think about these issues from an early stage. I think our conversations and, and roundtable discussions also highlighted some of the innovation-related um, aspects of, of standardization. So the, the knowledge sharing aspect, for example, was something that, that startup participants that are already involved in standards development um, highlighted you know, as something that's particularly valuable to them. Um, because they, you know, some, to some extent more so than, than for established companies who have other channels for accessing you know, knowledge sharing and, and knowledge about best practices. So it's both the, the governance side and the, and, and the knowledge sharing side that I think came out quite, quite strongly. Of course, on the governance side, regulators, you know, we engaged with regulators and, and, and there, were very interesting, there were very interesting differences there in terms of some regulators having a long history of working with standards, engaging with standards and, and, and others much less so. Um, uh, and across, you know, there's a wide range of regulators as we know, almost all regulators will need to think about AI. Um, mm -hmm. And so for those who are less familiar with standards, you know, the, the, you know we hope that, that you know, that's a group where the standards hub might add particular value in, in understanding the field. Stuart, do you have a perspective on the, and how this could affect different um, sectors, different perspectives? Absolutely, I very much agree into what um, what Florian has just uh, just articulated. I, I, I think um, in terms of the, the the perspective of vertical standards, for example, I, I think there's there's thematic areas where you could really see um, the need for an understanding of this very quickly. So safety critical applications, um, so healthcare, autonomous systems, autonomous vehicles, those type of applications where just helping support and, and and explain the complexity um of standards in the landscape particularly from an sme's perspective is where the, the hub can provide some real value i think and and there's very much a focus on what we're trying to achieve so uh, i do agree i think there'll, there'll be themes and there'll be areas where that that you can see the traction being quicker and we can provide that support and progress um through the mechanisms of the the hub and, and just for those of you online, if any of you got any questions, please submit them and we'll try and cover those as well. I mean, one of the perspectives that I'd like to mention is the fact that, you know, as we go through this, I mean, generally in areas of technology, they are um, not so used to regulation historically or certification or testing. Probably the only exception I can think of off my top of my head is cybersecurity, which is you know, heavily involved around regulation and particularly um, certification. As time goes on, we will go from that sector which doesn't have much of it, um, an insight into certification, testing, and regulation. But equally, from a different perspective, you have you know sectors that do like transport and built environment or um, medical devices and healthcare, which are very much built into a standards and certification and testing approach, and kind of bringing all those together, where you have people who don't don't know necessarily the certification testing and people who don't know the technology all coming into, into one go. Um, so in, so in just um, in terms of as time goes on, where do you think some of the things that we'll be developing could have most of the impact into the market? Where, where's your perspective on some of the other areas we can really have, make, make some change? Uh, Stuart? So from, from my perspective, I think it will be the expediation of, uh, of the adoption of, of standards, um, the, the, the way that we can help support innovation. Um, and I, I, I think some of the areas that you've already articulated, Tim, are, are ones where it's more well understood and defined. Um, regulation is integral to the ways of working, but I, but I think um, Technology is advancing so quickly, and the adoption of AI will will be widespread across many industries. That that there are some that are fairly new to understanding of the landscape of standards and regulation, and I think that's where significant impact will be derived more quickly. Um, because I think this will build a real community that can 
can support, can disseminate knowledge around standards, how they should be adopted, best used, how that can help um, support innovation, um, the training and the resource and the education that can be provided, and what and the aspect of, of research and development as well, which is a key pillar of the standards. So by, I think this builds a community that feeds into future standards development. And I think we possibly don't even know, know the areas that will will most benefit from this right now because of technology advancement and the way AI will be adopted. And I think there, there are areas that will really benefit very quickly from, from having that collective community, both nationally and internationally. I think that's, that's a good point in terms of how these things roll out. And we will undoubtedly, the mix of activities will change depending on where the real need is out there. And I think by bringing together different people with different perspectives and the research, we can really sort of push ideas from different places as well. Um, is there anything else you want to sort of bring in on that particular point, Florian? And um, perhaps just to add sort of the, I think one, you know, one area where I think the hub will also be in a position to make a strong contribution is the, um, is the sort of the ecosystem perspective. Um, clearly, you know, if you look at particular verticals, particular areas, AI adoption is more advanced than in others. And so, you know, that will partly inform our activities. But what's what's quite you know what's what's a strong characteristic of AI in in general is 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 that it's really a general purpose technology um, in in many senses and so in in standardization as well as in governance and regulation more broadly there is this you know latent question about to what extent should measures take a horizontal form. Um, versus a vertical form, you know, so regulation, we see the EUI, the, the EU, EU's proposed AI Act takes a horizontal form. Um, and if you look at standards being developed, you know, many of them currently take a horizontal form, but there are also clearly vertical standards that are already being developed for connected autonomous vehicles, for example. And so there's a general challenge in the AI space of making sense of that duality between horizontal approaches and vertical approaches. And um, I think that the hub will, you know, will be in a strong position to make a contribution to help stakeholders make that those connections. And you know, some stakeholders are focused in the nature due to the nature of their organization, or they, you know, are focused on the verticals and maybe less aware of what's happening horizontally, and vice versa. We've got, you know, the horizontal regulators who may be less aware of vertical issues. Um, but I think everyone agrees that you know the, the overall principle and guiding objective is not to reinvent the wheel to reduce duplication, and so to to ensure that there's coherence around horizontal approaches and vertical approaches. I think that that's one area that, that will be a strong focus in general. And I think one thing that's come up today and I've heard before is the fact that, you know, the regulation is coming through, but there's already a body of regulation and standards around things like um, equalities, so, so removing bias, um, cybersecurity and privacy, and, you know, so is that which also needs to be built, built out as well. Um, Fortunately, we seem to be coming up for the end of our time. I just wanted to, if there's anything, sort of potentially give Stuart the last words, anything else you want to sort of just add as the final points, and then we can finish off this section. Uh, yeah, that just, just that it's a great opportunity as a collective. Um, obviously, at the moment, it's ATI, BSI, and MPL that are, that are the founding partners of the, the hub, but this really is an inclusive hub environment. And it's it's just looking forward to um, the wider input of the community um, to to really create that 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 really really common ground of understanding of the challenges around standards and just really create that 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 hub of activity for want of a better word which which really will support and develop um, innovation around the understanding of standards and regulation and I think it's just a very exciting time to be involved in it. Definitely. Thank you very much. And if those in the audience, if you um, haven't done already, please sign up to um, AI Standards Hub data, and we will uh, hopefully speak to you about it again soon. Thank you very much, Florian. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. David, do I hand back to you now? Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Florian. Um, <clears throat> team um, AI Standards Hub. Um, it's going to be a great partnership so far. We've really learned a lot uh, working together. Um, for those who uh, have been with us um, earlier, um, we had a few technical challenges in trying to connect uh, Anna, Anna Freelander um, 
through her um, audio, I'm praying and hoping Anna is with us. Anna, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Fantastic. Oh, Fantastic. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Isn't that a wow? I am Apologies. so glad you've managed to join us. Uh, we tried to kind of reshuffle the, the agenda around a little bit. So I'm going to hand the floor to you, Anna, and hopefully you can um, talk us through your, your topic. I, I, did I get Anch.ai correct? You can say Anch AI or Ank AI. It's the Egyptian symbol for life and female energy. So it's AI for life. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Anna, no thank worries. you. Over to you. Thank you. So I am Anna Fellander, founder of Ank AI. I am super thrilled to be here. You hear my voice and, and that's good enough. I want to talk about how to release the true value of AI, uh, actually by ethical AI governance. So um, next slide, please. So innovations humans can trust. So uh, my goal is that this symbol, uh, and AI, will be an ethical filter on a all AI solutions going uh, forward in the future. But let us go back a bit. Um, before I was a chief economist at Swedbank, that's Sweden's largest retail bank, I spent 10 years um, doing macroeconomic forecasting and scenario analysis at the Ministry of Finance and the Prime Minister's office during the financial crisis. And there I got fascinated by which um, what could not be measured and what was happening under the surface. So as the chief economist at Swedbank, Bank, I did research and implemented tools for measuring the positive externalities from digitalization that was happening under the surface. And I I um, did productivity measures um, uh, on the consumer surplus and the willingness to pay. But in 2016, when data-driven technologies and AI um, emerged, uh, I recognized a shift. Uh, so from these positive externalities that I, I get more out of it than I'm actually paying to the opposite. So I opt in, I give away my data, and I do get um, a lot of efficiency and speed, but I also uh, get a digital pollution out of that. So I got an affiliate, uh, affiliation at the Royal Institute of Technology, and I initiated uh, my multidisciplinary research group, and we created an ethical risk assessment methodology and the the beauty of it was that the approach was unique we said let us categorize these dark cloud of digital pollution um, and let us see what the root causes are in an organization so what we did is that we got um, funding from the swedish uh, state vinova so we tested and vetted this methodology in a sandbox environment with policy regulators, academics, multidisciplinary, private public sector, startup, civil society. And 2018, I founded Ank AI. And now this is the framework uh, with its 200 and questionnaires uh, in different surveys are no, now launched at a platform for screening, assessing, mitigating, reporting and auditing AI ethical performance. Next slide, please. Yet, uh, during my time at the Royal Institute of Technology, we um, wanted to explore if there were research evidence that could prove if artificial intelligence was an enabler or a disenabler for achieving the SDGs. 
So what we did, there are 17 SDG goals. There are 169 targets. And next slide, please. We divided them, or they are divided, into... Now you missed the slide. The other slide, please, before. And the other one before. So there's a slide missed here. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, doesn't matter. I can tell you uh, all about it. So <laughs> you can go back to the other slide. Technology is not on my side. Uh, doesn't matter. Let's talk about the 70 goals and 169 targets. They are divided into society, economy, and environment. So what we found was 79% of, of the 169 targets, 134 targets was proven being an enabler for achieving the SDGs. 59 targets was proven to be a disenabler. So when it comes to these three um, buckets of society, economy, and environment, for example, uh, AI as an enabler, that would be society uh, number one, goal number one, no poverty, and goal number four, education, equality education. Uh, when it comes to the economy, uh, what would be an enabler was uh, shown number eight, decent work and economic growth. This is no surprise that AI would, we talked about the general purpose technology, of course, it would be an, an spurring productivity um, and economic growth. And then we would have, for example, in the environment, that would be the goal of life on life, where we act on land, where we actually can, through AI, make more uh, or better decisions on how to reduce uh, carbon, uh, carbon oxygen uh, footprints and to be more efficient and reduce all spill along the value chain. So we, we can see that AI for sustainability um, is a fantastic way to save the world. Yet, if you want to go, because uh, I have a fantastic, beautiful slide on the result of the, the research where you actually can show, uh, where you can see uh, the balance on every 169 targets, whether it's an enabler or a disenabler. Anyway, going to the dark side um, of uh, the, the targets that would be a disenabler of achieving the goals. Um, there are, for example, um, inequalities uh, that would lead to hampering growth. We know that it will be very capital biased, and uh, hence the productivity uh, growth. Uh, yet, what we now I'm shifting because I, I encourage you all to to read this research that was published in Nature Communications. And we got a lot of attention, uh, but the my part of the research here was to look at the, as a macroeconomist, at the, at the uh, econ uh, economy part of the three um, sectors of the, of the goals. And going back then to the, the multidisciplinary research, we saw that as AI um, adoption in our organizations accelerates and, and should be embraced by all organizations in order to be relevant, um, the, the technology poses ungoverned uh, risks. So we see that this dark cloud of pollution, we categorize that in privacy intrusion, discrimination, lost autonomy, disinformation, social exclusion, and harm to safety. We see that those categories of risks 
they were actually happen happening unintentionally across sectors and industry. So, for example, the the UK government, uh, you would all know about the recent uh, charge of cheaters in, in uh, language test for newly arrived, uh, amplifying bias. There's also in financial services, uh, historical patterns g rejecting female uh, credit, even though they have the same financial situation as a man who would get accepted due to the historic pattern. Same goes with, with re recruitment and also um, facial recognitions that are let loose with no oversight. So the root causes within an organization, we categorize to four, immature data and AI. That would be um, um, when the, the AI hasn't been trained enough. So for example, in the Starbucks example where the AI nudged 6,000 calories on a young cohort because the algorithm learned without oversight and transparency that the, the profit smogins were higher on sugar products than on, than on uh, coffee. Um, so immature AI and data could also be that the, the data set is insufficient, which create, creates um, bias as well. And then we have, have data um, bias, where the data is not reflecting the reality or the preferred reality. Uh, and then we have the bias of the creator, where the coder um, actually has no skill set on how to code the ethical principles of uh, the organization, uh, or doesn't know or grasp how it could be scaled uh, and um, uh, and be be uh, discriminating. Then we have misuse and overuse of AI, um, and this could be when, for example, a drone. I, I've heard you talk about this. Could um, be exploring a good cause of uh, the um, attack of insects on nature, but instead it could be used to explore whether there will be burglary opportunities in, in a, um, houses in, in the forest, for example. Um, next slide, please. So we all know that AI is, um, is self-scaling, self-learning with low explainability and transparency. Yet what we found is that the root cause is often due to that AI operates in organizational silos without an integrated ethical, a, a business and legal perspective integrated. So for example, there are critical business decisions that are taken in a tech silo. So if you would have an AI with a uh, with a fairness tool in a in the tech silo saying let us have a so we, there's a trade off between fairness and accuracy and we would have the discriminatory groups with the, the gender and they would make the decision unaware of what discrimination law would would apply to that specific um, fairness metrics. Also, that decision would, would be made without knowing the business area knowledge about the context of where the solution is used or misused. Next slide, please. So by doing um, orchestration between these three silos, the business team, the legal team, and the tech team, our platform manage to align and visualize these critical decisions. For example, how smart can a car or a house or a city become without being privacy intrusive? When does a recommendation engine do unethical nudging. So how do you make sure 
that existing and the upcoming that we talked about earlier as well, the upcoming regulation on AI, and the organization's specific ethical considerations or ethical principles and values are translated and integrated into code and data. So that's how we started this um, risk assessment methodology on ethical AI governance. And the beauty is that we've coll collected a lot of data, both from the, the, the years we spent in, in sandbox environment, but also we worked as a semi-research semi hub and semi consultant agency with some of the um, faces of the platform uh, digitalized. So we would start by having uh, these 200 questions that were tagged to maybe 15 different features, uh, like where you are in your AI life cycle, what is the vulnerability in the requirements, what's the root causes, who in an organization would be accountable for that and what is the risk exposure and how could you how could you mitigate it and the way that we developed our own fairness tools we said okay there are there are tech teams out there doing their best to do the required explainability um, for the tech silo, they do um, the interpretability and the traceability and the monitoring of it, and they do the data bias filter and they do the fairness model and they actually visualize the trade off. But the problem is that they do it in a silo and it's not translated and communicated and aligned with the legal team and or the business team. So next slide, please. So working with all these uh, organizations along since 2016, what we see now um, is that the, the expected AI regulation will, regulation will require massive reporting. And the way the high risks uh, AI has to be assessed is either it could be a really administrative burden or it could be a way to release the, the real true power of AI. If you go to the next slide, slide please. So the regulatory risks uh, in the upcoming EU regulation that you could, you know, take a pill and, and do a quickie fix, but in the long or in the medium, <laughs> in the medium time, or actually today, you can be complying to these ethical, uh, to this regulation, but still have your unique business risks. So say that you are um, in financial industry, either you're going to be regulated, but then a chatbot is not regulated. Um, but we know that a chatbot can be discriminatory in a couple of minutes. We've seen that. But the, the framework goes beyond, beyond this regulatory compliance. With that said, it's not the red tape on the on the um, it's not a red tape on the tech silo. It's the other way around. It creates an ethical filter so we can do it in the pace we want because Margareta, Margareta Verstegi, she said, well, we're going to compete against China and US with, with AI innovations uh, that are uh, keeping European citizens um, human rights. Um, but once you once you detected the regulatory risks and the unregulatory risks, this is where you can truly create the the competitive market uh, positions that will be your edge going forward as social concern is increasing there's a there is a wide concern uh, on sea levels um sea level uh, executives that they they know about 80 uh, percent will they know that they have to regulate and control for ai risks 
they, they're concerned and they want to do something about it. Yet there's only um, around 10% of the, their customers in the survey that believe that they can that they actually can take accountability for this so as this regulation is getting in more and more around the corner the social concern is increasing and will make uh, the opt-in to the the organizations that are truly uh, responsible and take accountability for how their organization is using their clients and the citizens data on their preference and behavior in a responsible manner. Next slide, please. So we talked about a lot of sandbox today. We talked about um, the standards and the, the reason um, the reason we can call this platform a GitHub for, for AI governance is we, we have truly founded a risk assessment methodology. You can read that on our webpage as well. That is, um, that is actually helping organizations to be able to comply to upcoming EU regulations but also to create a governance structure that creates a frictionless highway for responsible and trustworthy AI. So the alignment, the cross-organizational alignment that we started to realize in the beginning that this was the problem, that there, was, there were different languages. Um, so, the full control of AI risk will be a, a risk key indicators to all audit board committees going forward. So it's not only upcoming EU regulation, it is the ESG, it's taxonomy, it's all type of social, updated social responsibility. Um, but also, as I said, market acceptance uh, for, for, for your AI. But the speed and efficiency is actually really critical because the way that organizations are operating in silos make um, the audit firms go in and have maybe eight weeks of audits. So this is actually creating speed and efficiency. Next slide, please. Um, this uh, next slide, slide please. Um, okay, so I the the the, um, the platform actually screens and assess for AI risks. I'm going to end here because you you have to create your your organizational um, um, orchestration here. I'm going to end, and I'm going to uh, give you some key takeaways here. And the key takeaways are that AI is now ungoverned, even though there are AI for sustainability, it is not the same as sustainable AI, because you could have an AI that would help um, women and children in crisis uh, war conflicts to help them to get to comfort and shelter. Yet, the solution could actually be misused by um, the um, the other side of of uh, the the war uh, th that could actually misuse the data and and get them in even into war situations. So we need to embrace all AI that would lead to achieving the SDGs, but. AI for sustainability is not the same as sustainable AI. So for sustainable business models, every AI needs an ethical filter. So EU regulation is just around the corner and we need to get ready with cross-functional governance in order to have this EU regulation actually as an enabler and a uh, accelerator for responsible AI. Thank you. 
Anna, thank you so much. I'm so glad we managed to uh, connect. Um, a bit of a canter through a really fascinating topic, but thank you so much for connecting and we'll try and pick up again uh, offline. I'm going to move swiftly on back to the agenda uh, for the next session, which is around standards, which will be chaired by Milan Patel. Milan is chair of Art One, one of our BSI strategic committees in AI. And Milan is um, sits within the Microsoft um, standardization community. Milan, I'm going to hand the control to you. Thank you very much, David. Um, so uh, let's get started today. Uh, thank you for all who are attending. Um, uh, I would like to introduce my colleagues in this session um, as well. Um, and also, uh, establish the order of play um, in in this session. So we have with us um, Sophia uh, Ignatidou from uh, the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office. And Sophia is a group manager for technology policy. Um, Sophia is going to be talking about AI and data protection and how uh, standard certification insurance uh, helps with uh, data protection in, in the realm of artificial intelligence use. David McNeish is from the CDEI, the Center of Data Ethics and Innovation, and is a senior technology advisor um, there. And uh, he'll be talking to us about the role of uh, technical standards in AI assurance. And David um, uh, Kakao um, gave my introduction, um, but I'll be uh, um, providing some uh, um, points about uh, what kind of standards are being developed at the moment, and especially those that help around trust and assurance. So um, earlier today, we heard a lot about um, standards um, at, uh, required for, for enabling uh, responsible use of AI, but also the idea that um, organizations need to demonstrate their responsible approach to um, uh, their use or development of artificial intelligence. Um, and we've also heard, uh, you know, for example, from the, uh, the session on the, uh, the, the AI Standards Hub, um, the idea that standards are often used by uh, organizations as bodies of knowledge or, or a reference for, for good practices. So within um, the ISOAC Joint Technical Committee for Information Technologies, Subcommittee 42, which is the Committee for Artificial Intelligence, um, we are working towards um, a whole fleet of standards, um, which uh, of course is an ongoing program of development um, in various aspects to, to effectively provide those bodies of knowledge, um, foundational uh, standards to uh, um, establish language um, and to establish fundamental concepts around artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, we've recently published the governance implications of the use of artificial intelligence in organizations, and that was led by um, an editor who um, was from our committee in the BSI. Um, so, so that was... Uh, certainly a good piece of leadership that, that we had um, within the international standards work. There are guidance um, and, and good practices around risk management, trustworthiness, um, unwanted bias, transparency, explainability, what it means uh, to, to have controllability of AI systems, um, and then the AI management system, which um, really is the, the, the key to this uh, demonstrating um, accountability and a responsible approach to um, uh, the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, in order to support that, um, we're, we're creating a new body of work, um, a, a standard on impact assessments of uh, AI systems. And so a key component of demonstrating responsible use is uh, factoring into account the impact of the system on on the organization stakeholders. There's of course uh, um, considerations around data and data quality and a whole series of uh, data quality management standards and um, uh, 
quality models for, for artificial intelligence systems, which uh, extend um, existing software engineering uh, practices. So the whole idea of developing these standards is to provide a better understanding of what uh, the, the, the technologies and techniques are to help uh, enable trust in organizations and, and also help enable uh, the responsible development and use of trustworthy AI systems and, and for organizations to um, demonstrate accountability and transparency in, in their use of AI. Okay, I went one slide ahead. So diving into what um, is a management system standard and in particular, what does that mean for artificial intelligence? Um, it, it's effectively a, a, a set of management um, uh, processes uh, uh, that uh, effectively allow you to um, implement these uh, processes to, to um, demonstrate a risk-based approach to uh, um, uh, how the organization um, takes a responsible approach to artificial intelligence, um, but also demonstrates a continuously improving set of processes um, around the uh, organization's approach to responsible AI. So through this, um, the ability is uh, there for, to demonstrate accountability. Um, what responsible means to your own organization, that is something that is uh, uh, flexible within the, uh, the, the management system and it's defined by the context of your organization, which is one of the requirements within uh, the management system clauses. So you define what your organization is, what its role is, its objectives, um, and its uh, um, uh, obligations to its stakeholders and, and, and compliance with the uh, uh, legislation, and uh, etc. cetera. Um, in addition to that, within the management system, uh, there is a necessity to get buy-in from leadership um, there's the planning, which involves uh, the whole uh, uh, process of doing risk management, so risk assessment, risk identification, and risk treatment. But in addition to that, for artificial intelligence, we're also considering the need to do um, uh, impact assessments as well uh, on, on, on the organization stakeholders. There's the uh, need to demonstrate that you factored in the, the, the type of support necessary, whether that's from a human resources perspective or, or you know, the, the, the resources required to support the responsible use and development of uh, artificial intelligence systems. And then showing that you are monitoring the operation and, and, and um, effectively uh, taking steps to improve the management system processes within, within the organization. As part of this uh, document, we also have a baseline set of controls um, in the annex, and those uh, effectively are technical and organizational measures um, that can be applied to not only the organization, but also to the system as well. Um, and so from that perspective, uh, you're, you're taking measures to, to mitigate risks from an organizational perspective, but also to address um, the, uh, the, the trustworthy aspects of the, uh, the AI system, um, you know, demonstrating that you are considering uh, the need to be transparent, um, explainable, and, and you've done uh, what you need to do regarding um, uh, mitigation of unwanted bias. Um, and I'll move on in the essence of time. Um, what we have here is just a demonstration of how a management system standard uh, exists within the ecosystem of uh, uh, governance, compliance and risk. Um, and within the, the pyramid in, in the center, we have the management system standard, its requirements and, and guidance. Um, uh, as a foundation of that, um, you can build on top of that um, uh, through additional guidance standards 
um, sector specific requirements um, or even additional control sets that can be defined um, in, in other standards. And as a result of using those uh, standards, you can build organizational policies and implement the management system processes within the organization. Um, and as a result, you, you implement a, a, a number of uh, controls or, or, or measures to, to mitigate risk. Feeding into the implementation of those management processes are um, the idea of doing good risk management. Um, and we have a standard um, that, that provides guidance on how to do that. And then also um, the governance aspects. So ensuring that, uh, um, as we heard before, um, uh, in the responsible AI uh, uh, session, the idea of uh, organizational culture um, and uh, processes um, to support responsible use of AI um, is something that um, we can have, we've got guidance on in, in, in the government's implications of the use of AI. Um, so all of this can lead to um, conformity assessment and certification and, and ultimately to demonstrate accountability, to demonstrate that you've uh, um, done your duty of care to your stakeholders and effectively enable trust not only between organisations but also to consumers as well. In terms of uh, assurance um, and certification using the AI management system, um, the uh, um, the various various models are being thought about in terms of not just taking the, the the traditional management system certification approach, but also considering it as a joint management system product certification type approach, um, whereby you can have certification of uh, the management system requirements um, within the uh, the main body of uh, ISO IC forty two thousand one. But then taking the controls as, as a means of uh, developing a um, uh, product certification scheme um, and, and uh, applying that against the, uh, the actual AI systems itself. Um, and then on the right hand side, um, the idea of using the AI management system as a horizontal means of um, providing assurance. Um, horizontal measures. Uh, that, that apply at, uh, to the organization, but also a responsible approach to developing the AI systems themselves as well, um, but also a responsible approach to using AI systems. Um, and this would effectively help enable trust in the organization developing or using AI systems. It's also paramount when uh, that, that you have trust in the organization um, when you have systems that are being continuously updated, whether it's because of patching to, to um, uh, address an evolving threat landscape from a security perspective, or if it's uh, the continuous learning of a, of a machine learning system. And um, the idea is to use 42001 as uh, uh, to underpin sector specific and product certification. So you can build on top of that um, sector or application specific standards that, that can be used then to take a more vertical um, approach to assurance, um, but also factor in sector or product specific requirements and regulations in, in various sectors, say medical devices, automotive, financial, there of course, um, existing regulations um, that apply in, in, in numerous industries and, and laws around discrimination, as we've heard before, um, that also need to be applied and, and, and thus um, uh, taking a vertical approach that way you can, you can uh, uh, provide a more, say, product assurance perspective. So with that, um, we're going to move to David to, to discuss the role of technical standards and AI assurance um, further. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Milan. And perhaps, Milan, if I could ask you to move the slides on for me, if that's all right. Um, so, good afternoon. I was about to say good morning. It's definitely not morning. Good afternoon. Um, my name is David Manish. Um, I work for the uh, UK Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation. Uh, and I'm just going to sort of take a step back from what Milan's just spoken about. Um, you're probably going to hear some repetition or at least reaffirming some of the um, things that Milan's talked about in, in terms of a specific example. But I'm going to take a step back and look at um, the, the general role of technical standards uh, with AI assurance and the interaction between the two. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so just, just briefly, just an introduction to who CDEI are. Um, I'm sure many of you know already, but uh, for those who don't, CD, CDEI, Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, is a government expert body uh, who enable, uh, work to enable the trustworthy use of data and AI. So that's kind of our, our, our goal, really. Uh, who are we? Well, we're a multidisciplinary team of specialists and we're supported by an advisory board of world leading experts. Um, and particularly in this area, because we have various different areas of work, but uh, a large chunk of our work um, is involved in the area of AI assurance and, and touches on uh, AI technical standards as well for assurance. Um, and most recently, the thing to, to highlight, which uh, provides the foundation for what I'm going to talk about now, is the AI assurance roadmap that CDI published recently, uh, which set out a roadmap of how the UK can become a global leader in the emerging AI assurance uh, industry. Next slide, please, Matt. But before we get into the detail, it's perhaps worth asking the basic question of well, what is assurance? And I'm sure many of you uh, listening probably, probably know the answer to this one, um, but just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, first of all, it's worth reminding ourselves that assurance is not unique to AI. Uh, it's already practiced across multiple sectors um, and in multiple different use cases of different technologies, whether that be say critical injury, injuries to industries, uh, financial auditing, uh, cybersecurity, and, and so on. And Milan's already touched on some of this already. But the goal of assurance is about justified trust. So if, um, uh, if we can go back to that other um, that Venn diagram at Milan, uh, there's, there's two sort of components to justify trust. On the one side, you've got trustworthiness. So this is about um, making sure that the system that you are assuring is worthy of your trust. It, it does what it says it should do. It's robust and, and so on. Uh, you can measure it against all the criteria that you're interested in. And then on the other side, you've got uh, you know, the, the challenge of communicating that trustworthiness to the people who need to trust it so they can put their confidence in it. And just by trust or assurance is, is the combination of those two. Because what we want to avoid with assurance is uh, the two extremes of trust without trustworthiness. So trusting systems that are actually not trustworthy in that context or trustworthiness without trust. So having a trustworthy system where we don't have public or user confidence in that system and then we have an opportunity cost. And the, the danger here with those, those two extremes is that we have either an opportunity cost or, or a risk or a risk of harm uh, potentially that, that arises. So what we're aiming for here is building uh, confidence and justified trust in AI systems. Next slide, please. Go on. Next, it's worth um, highlighting, you know, who is actually involved in AI assurance um, before we dig into the role of standards. So, you know, this is a one way of viewing the AI assurance ecosystem, and it's just highlighting that there are lots of different people and organisations who play a role within the AI um, assurance ecosystem, and each of them have different roles uh, and different responsibilities uh, and different requirements from assurance. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them will interact with standards, but in slightly different ways, either contributing to or deploying those standards um, in practice. And from our, our uh, sort of ongoing uh, stakeholder engagement in this area, it is becoming clear that there is seems to be a, current, a, very, uh, a fairly low level of awareness across this ecosystem of the role that standards can play within the AI assurance system. Um, and really, the, the take home message here is that we are in a window of opportunity where the AI assurance ecosystem is, is currently fairly immature. Uh, and therefore, we have an opportunity to influence how it develops 
um, and how we can support the wider goals of AI governance in the coming years. Next slide, please, Matt. So this brings us back to something I mentioned at the start, which is the AI Assurance Roadmap. So following the, the UK's national AI strategy, the UK government published um, something called the AI Assurance Roadmap, which some of you may be aware of. Um, and this basically sets out the steps that are required to build a world leading AI assurance ecosystem. Next slide, please. Matt. And as you can tell, uh, as you can see on the slide, you know, one of these key steps is standards. The development and adoption of standards is an essential step in this roadmap towards an effective AI assurance ecosystem. Next slide, please. So it's also worth taking a step back as well and looking at, well, what's the context here? Because, you know, if we're talking about standards, they sit within the context perhaps of AI assurance, in, in, in at least uh, from this perspective. But AI assurance sits within the context of wider AI governance. So you just need to sort of think about sort of what roles each of these uh, levers and components of the system are playing. Um, so AI assurance plays a crucial role for monitoring regulatory compliance. But it also can play a role in terms of monitoring compliance with norms and principles of responsible innovation that go beyond regulatory compliance as well. So it's worth sort of holding those two things in our minds. And it consists of three components within the sort of governance system. We need an authority um, who sets criteria, you know, rules or principles, at which systems or processes, in this case AI systems and AI management processes or development processes, risk management processes, and so on, uh, as so these can be checked against those criteria using assurance services. So it's worth just, just bearing in mind those, those three components of authority, the rules and principles, and then the assurance services, which um, test against those rules and principles. Next slide, please, Matt. So when we focus in on standards then, it's worth just sort of thinking about, well, what does this mean in, in reality? So in the context of, of technical standards for AI assurance, what this usually means is a standards development organization like ISO or IEEE or whatever, uh, who develop consensus-based standards, which can then be used to inform those assurance uh, methods and techniques, for example, audits, conformity assessments with certification, and, and so on. And all of this, the purpose of this is to, you know, provide that assurance user with that justified trust in the AI system uh, in focus that we talked about earlier. Next slide, please. Again, it's worth sort of, um, uh, this is fairly, fairly basic, I know, and I apologies if I'm uh, teaching some people to suck eggs, but it's worth thinking about sort of, well, what are the different types of standards that we're talking about here, and what, what is their relative role, uh, respective role, sorry, within AI assurance? So although the general goal of technical standards it tends to be the same, uh, there, is, there are several different types um, of uh, standards and, and each of them can support assurance in different ways. So one way of thinking about technical standards and their role in assurance is to split them into four types. So we've got you know, foundational standards, which you know, build um, common understanding around definitions and so on. We've got process standards that Milan was talking about earlier, which is all about sort of sharing good practice or defining and sharing good practice around um, management processes um, and so on, governance processes as well. We've got measurement standards, so talking about you know, how do you actually measure, quantitatively measure uh, some of the, the criteria that we're, we're interested in. And then you've got the performance standards that set the specific thresholds specific to that um, sector or use case um, to, to um, determine whether the threshold is acceptable uh, or the system is acceptable or not. And it's worth just thinking about how the combination of these different types of standards can all be used to inform assurance. Um, but it's also worth thinking about uh, different sort of lenses on standards. So uh, Milan mentioned earlier the, the difference between sort of product focused standards and process focused standards. So both can be used in the context of assurance. And again, another um, sort of dichotomy, perhaps, that, that, um, that Milan mentioned earlier is that the difference between horizontally focused standards and vertically focused standards. So those standards that can be used across multiple sectors and those that are applied within a sector. And we'll touch on that here in a little bit more detail in a moment. And next slide, please. 
So as we explore the, the potential role of technical standards within assurance and AI assurance in particular, it's useful to explore how they're used within, within existing assurance markets. And this table on the screen just provides a few examples of, of how it, some existing standards are used uh, to support uh, three different types of assurance techniques, so risk assessment, uh, compliance audits, and impact assessments here. Um, and also in this table, we've highlighted uh, a number of corresponding AI-specific standards development activities that are going on. And Milan mentioned some of these earlier, actually. Um, you know, some of these can be certified against, some of them, some of them can't. So the way in which you would apply them within assurance, the context of assurance may, may differ. But one thing that's worth noting is the widespread use of standards for assuring process management. And this, this widespread use of process standards um, suggests that they may play an equally foundational role within the AI assurance market as well. And this is, this is particularly important for AI assurance, given that the complex and socio-technical nature of the risks that are posed by AI. So the take home message here is that, you know, various different standards are used within assurance, but it's worth noting the widespread use of process standards, management process standards, and perhaps this indicates um, some sort of first initial steps uh, that could be taken within the AI assurance ecosystem. Uh, next slide, please. And coming back to that point about the difference between horizontal approaches and vertical approaches that Milan talks about and I've talked about earlier in um, this, this uh, presentation. You know, as, as you all know, AI is a general purpose technology. Um, and as it's applied across different contexts, we need to consider the norms and the standards relevant to those sectors. And that includes the application of, of specific uh, technical standards. So as set out in the, the roadmap that I mentioned earlier, the, the, the drivers for assurance of AI systems will vary between these sectors. So, for example, if you take you know, a, a highly regulated safety grid uh, industry and you compare it to a low risk use case, which is subject to perhaps lower or, or less stringent regulation, the way in which we apply standards and uh, wider assurance is going to differ quite radically. So therefore, the, the utility and the impact of technical standards for supporting AI assurance is likely to look different across sectors and across use cases. And the implications for standards is that we need to strike the right balance between vertical and horizontal governance approaches, and in this case, vertical and horizontal standards. So we need to balance uh, a balance of horizontal standards to support baseline objectives across sectors. So things like accountability, transparency, robustness, principles and rules that may, may apply across sectors. But then we also need to complement those horizontal approaches with vertical standards that help to realize these, these, these principles in practice and address sector-specific risks. You know, you know uh, this, doing this within the transport sector uh, may look very different to applying AI systems within the medical domain, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, Alan. So, just uh, that was a very quick canter through um, some sort of basics around the sort of interaction between standards um, and uh, assurance, uh, AI assurance. So, just a few key uh, key points as, uh, as a sort of take home messages there. So, assurance, what's all about is all about justified trust, building justified trust and confidence in AI based systems. Um, and technical standards play a critical role in assurance by defining the criteria that we can test against uh, within assurance. And it's worth noting that, you know, there's not just one type of standard that, that's relevant within assurance. There are various types of technical standards that can support assurance in different ways. And a lesson that we can pull from existing uh, assurance ecosystems and assurance markets is the widespread use of process standards, and particularly you know, management process standards, uh, some of which Milan mentioned earlier, which can play a pivotal role within, within those existing ecosystems and may potentially play a pivotal role within the AI assurance ecosystem. And finally, it's worth just uh, reminding ourselves of that balance or the need for balance between horizontal and vertical approaches to governance, and therefore horizontal and vertical standards uh, within the AI assurance ecosystem. 
Um, if you want to get in touch, uh, I think our email address is on the next uh, slide. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and thank you for this opportunity. Hi. Yeah, hi. I'm going to try to control these slides, but if I can't, uh, oh, I think I did it. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, um, my name is Sophia. Like Milan mentioned, I represent the ICO, the UK's Data Protection Authority. And I think it's really useful to really start and uh, talk a bit about our remit, which is just to understand uh, our regulatory perspective. So the ICO is responsible for upholding individuals' uh, rights and freedoms in relation to the processing of their personal data. That means that we do protect information rights, but not only. And uh, that means that data protection is engaged whenever organizations process personal data. So you can see on the slide, it is relevant in relation to the training phase of an algorithmic system all the way to the deployment phase. And uh, the nature of a remit, which is basically oversee the conditions uh, under which the processing of people's personal data takes place, and its scope means that our work is really, really context specific. So for example, uh, for example re uh, fairness related to concepts uh, such as necessity and proportionality, um, have to be evaluated on the basis of the specific context uh, in which an AI system is being deployed or developed. So they cannot be, fairness cannot be assessed in abstract. Um, so that is, I, th I think that's really something really important to bear in mind while talking about standards. Uh, so this is really important because similar processing of personal data in completely different contexts uh, will have vastly different results. Uh, for example, using facial recognition technology to identify an individual will have different implications if it's being used in a law enforcement context or it, if it's being used to unlock uh, someone's mobile phone, essentially. So another point to remember is that the ICO is a horizontal regulator. So that means that the regulation we oversee, it's applicable across various sectors from healthcare to financial services or, or local government. So that means we, we are overseeing both the private and the public sector. Um, and uh, because a substantial portion of AI application, applications and systems will impact individuals, uh, and that means at some point in the process, so training or deployment, the system will uh, engage with people's personal data. I think data protection has a key role to play in terms of creating a pro-innovation AI ecosystem that ensures resilience of infrastructure and models, uh, protects individuals, and, and nurtures trust among the population. Uh, so I'm going to try to move to the next slide. Oh, yeah. So um, it's not a coincidence that a number of AI-related questions that we have been touching on uh, here as well, uh, such as accountability, transparency, and fairness, are already, to a large extent, addressed in data protections on um, legal provisions. Uh, while those very same concepts, are, you know, fairness, accountability, transparency, relate to three of our, the regime's foundational principles that you can see on the slide that really kind of like indicates that key data risks um, surfaced long before the current AI spring that we're witnessing. So they were identified long before the current, uh, current era. And lastly but not least, uh, one of the strengths of data protection is that it is based and aims to protect internationally recognized principles and rights. I mean, that's rights is kind of like our preferred approach rather than ethics as a regulator. Uh, so certain ISO standards have been used to support uh, ICO assurance function already uh, in terms of conducting our audits and uh, hosting workshops with AI-driven organizations. And more specifically, we have utilized more, uh, the ISO uh, 27001 20, standard on auditing or the 27011 on information security management within telecommunications organizations. So. Uh, there is, there is, we have identified that we're using standards ourselves. Uh, but in terms of assurance, we we really support the development of certification schemes and encourage organizations that want to demonstrate compliance with the GDPR to apply to them. Uh, because uh, data protection certification actually constitutes a key accountability mechanism that the IS, uh, I, ICO is required by law to encourage. That's written in the actual legislation. And just to clarify, these schemes are being developed by external organizations 
uh, in partnership with the UK Accreditation Service, so they're not developed by us. Uh, so the the certification bodies then audit compliance with the standards specified in the specific scheme. Um, the ICO is basically required to review and approve the specific data protection criteria of each specific certification scheme. Uh, I'm going to just show quickly the process. That's more or less kind of like the different stages of certification. I'm not going to get into the details of that. We don't have time. Um, and we have uh, recently approved and published criteria for three new uh, data protection certification schemes, not AI specific, but it, it, is, it, it is the start of this process. Uh, so the criteria of, of a certification scheme will be approved by us and, and can cover specific, a specific issue, or it can be more general. Uh, and we anticipate that different certification schemes will be designed to address different areas of compliance and developed by different organizations. Um, and I think it's important to, uh, to also state that um, any ICO approved certification scheme will be taken into consideration in the context of our audits. So when we kind of like audit a specific AI driven organization or processing activity, uh, we will factor that into our thinking the same thing, way we factor the any kind of other certification like BSI um, uh, standards uh, compliance as well. That means that we consider uh, these uh, standard certifi certification as evidence uh, of control and this is viewed as good practice but in any case they don't replace ICO's own audit uh, work. That means we should not rely only on external accreditation or certification without wanting to see to seek our own assurances of compliance and um uh, how much time do i have sorry milan uh we've got a couple more minutes okay That's so yeah, um, the IS, the IS, sorry, I confused the ISO and the ICO. So the ICO uh, believes that um, certification based on regulator approved criteria and schemes um, uh, is a really useful area to explore, explore in terms of AI assurance. Uh, and it can be used uh, by public and, and uh, by, by the public themselves and, and um, procurers of AI systems um, to, um, to evaluate uh, data protection compliance. And I think uh, certification can play a key role, uh, in ter especially since we're moving into this place, this space where organizations will be procuring uh, systems uh, from third parties rather than uh, building them in-house. So this is a really open tool, a uh, useful tool. And uh, the, uh, the ICO already supports uh, the work of the BSI. Uh, we participate in the AI committee uh, that uh, Milan is chairing. And I think um, the committee will, will benefit from the expertise of, of UK regulators across the board. Um, and I just wanted to just mention a couple of like initiatives, the groups that uh, the I, uh, ICO has initiated or is participating in. Um, uh, and you can see on the slide the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, which is a forum that we uh, created with uh, three other UK regulators. This is the FCA, uh, Ofcom and CMA. And indeed, uh, standards and auditing uh, are part of the work that we're, uh, like we're exploring at this moment in time. We have recently published uh, two discussion papers, one on the, the landscape of auditing algorithmic systems and the other paper on algorithmic harms and benefits. Uh, so, uh, different approaches to uh, AI assurance is, is, are definitely at the focus of our work and will continue to, uh, to kind of like need our attention and uh, I think the UK regulators uh, are really focused in actually like helping uh, our industry uh, to kind of like um, build a really trustworthy AI ecosystem in the long term, especially since that's kind of like at the core of the UK government's uh, agenda. And I'm going to hand back to you, Milan, because I think we're running out of time. Well, thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank you both, David and Sophia, for, for those perspectives from the, uh, the, the assurance roadmap uh, and from a regulator's perspective. Um, there have been questions in the uh, uh, chat, but I've been trying my best to answer those. Um, they're mostly um, uh, targeted towards me and then and the, the management system specific to itself. Um, but I was wondering if there's any type of further questions or if we need to move on. 
We need to move on, Milan, I'm afraid. Okay. No Milan, Milan, Sophia and David, thank you so much indeed. It was um, a canter through, but brilliantly done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Um, so bringing us back on track, um, we come to the, the last but very much not least um, keynote presentation of the day. Um, the UK's National AI Strategy was published in September 2021, which uh, sets out a 10-year plan to enable Britain to be a global leader in AI. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Lizzie Greenhow, who's the Deputy Director for Regulation and AI at DCMS, as our closing keynote speaker. Welcome, Lizzie. Thank you very much for joining us, and I apologise, we're a couple of minutes late. Um, Lizzie oversees the Office of AI, which is the uh, joint unit between Bayes and DCMS, responsible for overseeing the implementation of the National AI Strategy. And I think she's going to tell us a little bit about it. Lizzie, thank you very much indeed, and over to you. Great. Um, thanks very much. And um, yeah, it's really um, good to be here. Um, I think I've got some slides that may pop up on the screen. Uh, well, I will I will kick off. Ah, here we go. And let's see if I've even got control of them just yet. Yes, I do. OK, fantastic. The tech's working, which is a great start. So, yeah, it's really um, good to be here. Um, as um, mentioned, I oversee the Office for AI, and I actually also oversee the digital regulation team, which is responsible for government's overall strategy for governing digital tech. So I think I've got a real uh, interest in today's conference for kind of multiple um, reasons. Um, I guess I thought it might make sense to kind of start with the journey of why we are where we are today um, regarding the UK's uh, thriving AI ecosystem. And it's perhaps just worth um, saying that we've really got kind of quite a lot to celebrate here across a number of different metrics. We really are a kind of global leader um, behind um, only the USA and China. And why is that? Um, well, a range of different reasons. We've got a really vibrant and healthy private sector scene of startups um, with significant investment. We've got really strong um, investment in our academic research, and we've got a strong and well-established uh, and globally respected civil society community. How did we get here? Um, well, uh, I guess I'll kind of, we often think of the start of our journey as being in 2017, um, when Dame Wendy Hall and Jerome Pacenti did a review around growing the AI industry in the UK. Um, in, um, we then, this was followed by um, the AI sector deal in 2018, a near £1 billion commitment between government, industry and academia to deliver the recommendations in the review. Um, we next had the AI Council, which is an external advisory body that supports government on its AI strategy, publish the uh, roadmap, um, which set out a number of recommendations for government um, and prompted the UK government to publish the National AI Strategy, um, which set out our kind of 10 year plan uh, for how we'd really capitalise on the benefits um, of AI. And as mentioned, that was published last September. Um, and finally, just a flag, this isn't out the door yet, um, but we look forward to publishing um, the AI Action Plan as a, um, a follow-up uh, to the AI strategy and to kind of chart some of the progress we've made there. Um, I guess it's just worth saying that, um, of course, AI policy is, uh, you know, is, it, this is quite a new area still, um, but it's definitely worth making clear that we're not kind of operating in a policy vacuum and we're building across um, a lot of wider government activity um, to boost innovation and drive growth across the UK economy, which is a kind of real priority for our ministers. Um, I'm not going to read out all the different initiatives happening across government, but it's perhaps worth saying, um, highlighting a few. So clearly we've got big synergies with the um, work on data policy and uh, the national data strategy, which very much looks at how we unlock the value of data. Um, 
Uh, ambitions are complemented by uh, the innovation strategy and the Treasury's plan for growth. Um, and of course, we're also very keen that what we're doing in the AI space aligns with our kind of broader uh, digital strategy um, and our regulatory approach. Um, and, and I guess the kind of aggregate impact of all of these initiatives is that we really hope we are putting the UK at the forefront of industries of the future um, and that we are taking advantage of these major global trends um, to kind of put the UK on the, the, the front foot um, and to kind of drive prosperity um, across the whole of the country. So that was the kind of broader government context. Um, I thought I might say now a little bit more about the national AI strategy. Um, the drivers for which are probably kind of fairly self-explanatory, it was it's in recognition that AI is obviously having a huge impact across our economy and our society, uh, and it's raising kind of big economic and societal uh, questions. Um, I mentioned already that the UK is a kind of global front runner on AI, but we really recognise that we cannot be complacent on this and we want to make sure we kind of, um, we, we see AI as a kind of key uh, opportunity for strategic advantage. So the AI strategy um, set out a kind of 10 year plan uh, for how we'd kind of maximise uh, the benefits that AI brings while also mitigating the risks. Um, it, to kind of develop this strategy, which I should say, and I can say this because I wasn't leading the team at the time, uh, it's really landed very well um, with stakeholders across the UK, but also kind of has got global attention. Um, I think this is a kind of credit to how the team went about developing it. So they engaged hugely with industry, academia, civil society, um, the Alan Turing Institute supported a survey. And, and so they really drew on a diverse range of uh, voices um, and through this set out an ambitious and inclusive strategy um, which is structured around three key pillars. One is investing in and planning for the long-term needs of the AI ecosystem to continue our leadership as a science and AI superpower. The second is supporting the transition to an AI-enabled economy, capturing the benefits of innovation in the UK and ensuring AI benefits all sectors and regions. And the third is um, ensuring the UK gets the national and international governance of AI technologies right to encourage innovation investment and to protect the public and our fundamental values. Um, so, um, the on the so I just wanted to flag that. Um, so since the strategy, um, we, we've actually already made um, good progress on a number of our commitments. So, for example, launching a consultation on copyright and uh, patents legislation. Um, and additionally, we have made a number of announcements around AI skills. So um, in October last year, the Chancellor, for example, announced the creation of 2,000 additional scholarships uh, for students uh, studying on AI conversion courses and to support more underrepresented groups to enter uh, the UK AI talent pipeline. Um, so I guess I'm um, j just to flag that this is a really kind of high priority for government and a really kind of active area where uh, there is lots of work going on. Um, and I mentioned already the AI action plan, but that will provide a kind of good progress update. Um, but I thought today, given the audience, it might be useful to focus on AI governance um, a little more, which was the third pillar of the strategy. Um, you've already heard, um, I think, uh, about some of our work around assurance, um, uh, but I thought I'd say a little bit more in particular about the kind of AI white paper, uh, which will look at how we govern AI. Um, so I guess kind of I might just say kind of first of all when we think about the question of how we govern AI and um, it's perhaps just really important to say we're not just thinking about regulation uh, alone um, and uh, some of the early steps we've set out to establish a pro-innovation approach to governing AI um, include our work around um, establishing an algorithmic transparency standard. Um, you've just heard from the CDI about their roadmap to an effective AI assurance uh, ecosystem. Um, and I believe you've already heard about the Standards Hub um, that we announced with Alan Turing, um, which is supported by the BSI and MPL. 
Um, and we see um, this kind of wider work to establish a thriving UK uh, AI assurance ecosystem uh, and to make sure we're at the kind of forefront of shaping the debate around technical standards as really critical uh, to that effective governance approach. Um, but we do think that regulation also has a role to play and um, I, we will be setting out government's approach on this at the, um, towards the end of the year uh, through the white paper. Um, so, um, why do we think uh, uh, we need to look at the question of how we regulate AI? Um, ah, hang on. I won't skip to that just yet. Um, so, our, our view is that um, it's really important that we kind of make sure our regulatory approach um, keeps pace with some of the kind of big uh, fundamental implications of AI. We, we think it's really critical uh, that regulation can actually play a role in driving innovation and offering businesses confidence as well as um, boosting uh, public trust. So we see this as really kind of a, a fundamental uh, pillar of how we support our AI ecosystem to continue to thrive. Um, and I can say a little bit more about our kind of emerging thinking about how we um, how we might want to kind of regulate AI and perhaps through the follow up uh, questions. Um, needless to say, it's kind of uh, tricky, but but very important. Um, so I guess the final thing that I might therefore end on um, before we move to um, some of the questions is just um, the kind of wider international context. Um, now, obviously, AI uh, and the companies that we work with are hugely uh, global uh, and often operate across borders uh, by default. Um, and we really do see uh, international discussions around AI governance as being absolutely kind of essential to shape. So um, what are we doing in this space? Um, a whole range of things, but just to highlight a few. We are a founding member of the Global Partnership on AI, which is the first multilateral forum on AI, uh, and we're a co-chair of the Data Working Group. Um, we've invested a million pounds uh, research through GPay um, to support uh, the voices of a range of different countries being heard. We're working with the US to grow our research program on AI R&D, recently signing a statement of intent. Um, we play an active role in a range of different forums, including Council of Europe, UNESCO and OECD. In fact, um, the UK has just been elected as a bureau member in the Council of Europe, uh, where we'll be looking um, at uh, developing a kind of legal, um, we'll be looking at elaborating a legal instrument on the development, design and application of AI. Um, which will build on the Council of Europe standards on human rights, democracy and the rule of law. Um, and then finally, we have a kind of huge amount of um, work in the international uh, standards um, multilateral fora. Um, and this builds on uh, initiatives such as the AI Standards Hub, uh, which we think uh, offers us a really important role to kind of shape some of those discussions. Um, and all of this is complemented by kind of ongoing bilateral engagement, but I will save you from that. So um, in conclusion, uh, I guess I guess hopefully um, today you've got a bit of a flavor around um, how, how important the UK views the AI ecosystem and how we are doing, um, how we're keeping up, ensuring we kind of capitalize on the amazing uh, ecosystem we have to date. Uh, but what more we think we can do to kind of really deliver on our ambitions. Um, and yet, yeah, just to flag that we will be really, really keen to hear from the BSI on our kind of ongoing uh, work, uh, and we'll be really keen to get your views on this, uh, on how we get the kind of governance of AI right. Right, I will close there. Uh, thank you very much, and happy to take any questions. Lizzie, thank you very much indeed. That was very, very insightful and very helpful. Um, you can be reassured that BSI will be providing you with our thoughts and, and guidance as we go through this uh, this process. Um, have you got time for a couple of questions? Yes, I can do a couple, David. Thanks. I will, I will fire a couple at you. I know you touched a little bit on um, governing AI effectively, but I just 
wanted just to perhaps ask you to expand a little bit on the, the steps the UK is taking to consider how we govern AI effectively. Your, your kind of initial thoughts on that would be useful. Yeah, sure thing. And look, this is a kind of really live area of work, but I'm happy to kind of share our emerging thinking. I guess I guess the starting point is that it's kind of really important to, to recognise that the UK has a kind of world leading regulatory regime, a history of innovation friendly approaches to regulation. And this has been key to why our AI, AI ecosystem is the success it is to date. Um, but um, as I said, we're kind of not complacent about this, and we know that um, some of the uh, challenges and risks associated with AI, um, some of our existing approaches to regulation may not be entirely sufficient. And that's why we think there is a need um, to look at how we update our approach. Um, so I guess the other thing I might just say to start is um, it's not right to say AI is totally unregulated uh, at the moment. Um, you've already got a range of existing legislation such as quality law, data protection rules, which do apply to AI. And indeed, some of our regulators, such as the ICO, who you just heard from, are taking steps to kind of update what AI means uh, for the sectors or, or issues that they look at. So we're not starting from a blank slate, but as I mentioned, we do see that there are kind of distinct new challenges, which is right, why it's right that we kind of look at, at what changes we might need uh, to improve our governance approach. Um, and indeed, this is actually something we hear a lot from stakeholders. So yes, we hear it from civil society groups, but we also hear it from businesses um, saying they would kind of welcome greater clarity, that it can sometimes feel a bit ambiguous how existing regulation applies, um, or kind of where they think multiple regulators might be looking at the same issue. Um, so there's kind of lots of appetite for government to kind of set out um, its approach on AI to kind of bring that uh, clarity. Um, and I guess here our ambitions really are that we want to very much establish a framework that doesn't, uh, that kind of supports and drives innovation, but we do also want to make sure we are protecting the public and, and, and making sure they can kind of trust AI products and applications. So where, where are we, what are we thinking this might look like? Um, so um, I think the first thing to say is we really want to make sure our approach is tailored to context and it's proportionate to the actual impact on individuals and groups in particular contexts. So we really want to make sure anything we're doing in this space reflects the kind of reality of the circumstances in which AI is being deployed. But we do also want to make sure our approach is coherent so we avoid unnecessary complexity or confusion for businesses and the public. Um, so we are looking at whether we might need some kind of cross-cutting set of principles um, which guide how we approach common issues relating to AI such as safety. Um, and as part of this we therefore will also really need to look at how we make sure there are effective mechanisms in place to ensure coordination across the regulatory landscape. Um, the ICO has already mentioned the DRCF today, the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, and there are a range of other fora, um, but we'll look at whether there's a need to kind of improve coordination in any way, given quite how cross-cutting uh, AI is. Um, and then I guess final thing to say um, when we look at how we develop our uh, approach here is that we very much recognise the cross-border nature of AI, and so thinking through uh, how we both design an approach that is suitable and uh, fit for the UK and its ambitions are around um, for the AI ecosystem, but we also recognise how critical it will be to kind of work with uh, like-minded partners across the international sphere so we can kind of cooperate and work together on key issues. Um, but yes, this is kind of, um, we're still in the early days and we will really value uh, BSI's kind of wisdom as we further develop our thinking. Thank you, Lizzie. You, you'd forgive me um, for bringing this, this back to standards, given I'm representing the UK's National Standards Body. I'll ask two questions together, if I may. One is, um, why do you believe standards are useful for governing AI? And what is your approach to technical standards for AI? There's kind of two questions lumped together there, I guess. 
Sure. So um, I should say that it's not just specific to AI. Um, through the government's plan for digital regulation, we made really clear that we see standards as a kind of key component of our governance toolkit. Um, we think uh, industry-led technical standards um, can really complement uh, the objectives of, of regulation. And furthermore, um, because the UK government kind of favours a kind of proportionate approach that's fairly nimble and agile, our default is to look at kind of non-regulatory options before we reach for some of those um, more interventionist, perhaps legislative solutions. Um, and so in the AI space, um, we absolutely think digital, uh, te digital technical standards can play a role here. Um, we think they can set out good practice um, that can help ensure that products, processes, services uh, work as we expect them to, i.e. safely and efficiently. Um, and while these are often industry led, um, we do also recognize that published standards could also feature, could also be designated by legislation uh, and so can help support uh, compliance. Um, we think, um, I mean, I guess I'd just point to here, this is kind of exactly why the UK government has uh, kind of invested and supported the AI standards hub, um, precisely because we, we do see standards as a really kind of critical way in which we support effective uh, governance of um, AI. Um, and on, uh, on kind of what the government's approach uh, is on standards more generally, I guess I've already kind of touched on how we see standards as part of a kind of innovative governance approach, but I guess a couple of other things to kind of flag here is perhaps unsurprisingly, we, we really think that kind of these need to be multi-stakeholder driven. Um, so at uh, G7 in Carbus Bay, uh, there was a leaders communique which supported inclusive multi-stakeholder approaches to standards. Um, and of course, we absolutely think that this needs to be a kind of uh, a global discussion and work that we do in partnership uh, with, with uh, others across the uh, international sphere. Um, there's a huge range of reasons why we think standards are important. I, I kind of mentioned governance, but I should also say we see it as key to trade, R&D, uh, supporting a healthy business environment and more. Um, but yes, I might just kind of conclude by saying we really see the work of the BSI as kind of really uh, critical and kind of fundamental and, and, and key to the success of our AI ecosystem. So we will be very much keen to get your views on our work going forward. Lizzie, d delighted to hear and um, very pleased to be supporting the, the AI Standards Hub work. And thank you, Lizzie, very insightful. And thank you very much for joining us. It's very, very much appreciated. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks for having me. Bye, all. Thank Bye, you. David. Bye. Um, well, I'll hand back to Tim, I think, just for some closing comments. Thank you, David. I just wanted to very quickly um, bring the event to a close by thanking our speakers, George, Steph, Daniel, David, Maria, Sue, Sam, Ivana, Sanjay, Detlef, Juan, Phil, Anna, Stuart, Florian, Milan, Sophia, David, and of course, Lizzie just now. I also want to thank um, all our BSI colleagues for all the hard work it's taken to get today together. Um, BSI will be sending a follow-on email after the conference with the link to the recording of the presentations uh, used today. At the end of the conference, you are taken automatically to a feedback survey to complete. This will also be sent again in the follow-on email if you happen to miss it. Um, I know we've also flagged it up today, but if you're interested, we have many upcoming um, webinars. One on privacy is a full-day event on the um, 7th of June, which is free to, free to attend. As are our ones on digital health on the 8th of June and the cybersecurity webinar on the 15th of June. Please go to the BSI website to sign up and hopefully the links will also be shared in the chat function. Thank you very much all for attending and goodbye.